Ice counters are a mechanic that are only interacted with by six cards in the game. And while counter mechanics are inherently kind of bad, because they require face-up cards in the field to do anything, and face-up cards in Yu-Gi-Oh don't last very long, ice counters themselves are kind of unique in the fact that they don't really have a unifying theme in what they actually do. In the very first wave of ice counter monsters, they released Cold Enchanter and Ice Master in 2008, alongside powerful single monsters like Goyo Guardian and Stardust Dragon. Although the power level of these two ice counter monsters are nowhere near as strong as a lot of the other stuff that was released in their same pack. Cold Enchanter is a level 4 monster with 1600 attack and has a non once per turn effect where you can discard one card from your hand in order to place an ice counter on a face up monster on the field. And then Cold Enchanter gains 300 attack for each ice counter on the field. So if you use the effect a single time and place an ice counter on itself, it can go up to 1900 attack, which is definitely not worth the minus 1 in card advantage. One of the few unique things about Cold Enchanter is the fact that it allows you to theoretically discard an infinite amount of cards from your hand in case you need to do that for whatever kind of infinite combo, as there aren't a lot of cards that have non once per turn effects like this anymore. Although the Ice Counters didn't really do anything except provide this one attack boost, and they didn't really start doing anything else until later cards were introduced, which wouldn't happen until four years later. Next up we have Ice Master. According to Yugipedia Trivia, Ice Master is probably the future version of Cold Enchanter, and is a level 8 monster with 2500 attack which has the effect where it can spell summon itself from your hand by tributing to water monsters. Then once per turn it can place an ice counter on a face up monster for free, and it has a final effect where it can tribute itself in order to destroy all monsters that have ice counters on them. So if you use its effect to place one ice counter on one of your opponent's monsters, you can tribute this card in order to destroy it, which is definitely not worth the amount of resources required in order to bring it out. Because while the card can special summon itself from your hand, you need two specific attributes of monsters in the field in order to accomplish this. The card was given some support 13 years later in 2021 with the release of Crystal Girl, which does actually allow you to search out Ice Master and give it an attribute fodder on the field a lot easier so that you can bring out Ice Master without losing too much card advantage. Although you still have the problem of not being able to put out ice counters very efficiently, and there's the problem that the card has to tribute itself in order to gain the effect. If the card simply just allowed you to destroy all monsters with ice counters once per turn without tributing itself, it still wouldn't be very good. So having to remove this monster from your field on a spell speed 1 effect for this kind of effect just makes it laughably bad. In 2012, they released 4 more cards with ice counter support. First up we have Snow Dragon, a level 4 monster with 1400 attack which has the effect that if it's destroyed by battle or card effect, you can place 1 ice counter on each face up monster on the field, including your own monsters. This could provide a huge attack boost for Cold Enchanter, but the card itself fundamentally doesn't do anything with ice counters either, it just provides a mediocre way of maybe placing a whole bunch of ice counters in the field, if there's a whole bunch of monsters in the field to carry them. Next up we have Snowman Creator. This is a level 4 monster with 1600 attack that has an effect where, when it's summoned, you can place a number of ice counters on your opponent's monsters, equal to the number of water monsters you control. And then additionally, if you place 3 more ice counters with the effect, you can destroy any one card your opponent controls. Now, the thing to note about Snowman Creator is that the effect happens on normal or special summon, so if you're able to cheap this card into the field, you do have a way to get a lot of ice counters in the field potentially, and you might be able to destroy one card. Although you would need to have two other water monsters on your side of the field first if you want to activate the destruction effect, which is a lot harder to get off than you would think. You have to remember that a lot of these effects have to be compared to the mass amount of disruption that exists in modern Yu-Gi-Oh! But even back in 2012, the game was too fast for the slow acclimation of ice counters, and using up a resource to bring out Snowman Creator to destroy one card maybe, was usually just better spent on doing something else. Technically, the effect of being able to destroy one card and place a lot of ice counters is not half bad. It's just the ice counters themselves don't really do anything, and it's just slightly too hard to pull off the destruction effect. If it only required you to place two ice counters to get a destruction effect, it would still be a little bit too slow. However, if it only required one ice counter to be placed to use the effect, it might actually be a really good staple to be honest. Since the card itself is a water monster, so it's always going to be able to provide at least one ice counter for its effect. Although if the card just required there to be three or more ice counters in the field total when it was summoned, instead of having to place all the ice counters itself, that would also make it a lot more usable. The idea behind this effect is not half bad, it's just a little bit too difficult to pull off. Definitely one of the better ice counter cards. Next up we have Snow Dust Giant. This is a rank 4 Xyz monster which requires two level 4 water monsters as its materials. And this card has two effects. One of them allows it to place ice counters on any number of face-up monsters in the field equal to the amount of water monsters you reveal from your hand. And then it has a passive effect which actually grants the ice counters some form of effect, where non-water monsters on the field lose 200 attack for each ice counter on the field. 
So if you're playing an Ice Counter deck, Snowdust Giant is probably one of the cards you want to get out as soon as possible, because it's the only one that actually has detrimental effects to your opponent's monsters based on the amount of Ice Counters out, instead of previously where they just provided an attack boost for Cold Enchanter, or maybe allowed you to destroy them with Ice Master. An interesting thing to note about Snowdust Giant's effect is that it reduces the attack of monsters based on the amount of Ice Counters in the field total. It doesn't actually matter if a monster has an ice counter on it or not. So you can just put all the ice counters on Snowdust Giant itself in order to debuff an entire opponent's field, assuming they don't have any water monsters, which is actually a good way to go about handling counters. The best archetypes that handle counters inside of them usually let you hold on to the counters yourself so that you have more control over them or have incredibly detrimental effects if they're placed on your opponent. And while an attack boost isn't the best kind of effect to have, Snowdust Giant is easily the best ice counter card so far. And finally, we have Snow Dust Dragon. This is a level 8 monster with 2800 attack, which can special summon itself from your hand by removing 4 ice counters from anywhere on the field. And it also provides another negative benefit to ice counters, where other monsters that have ice counters on them cannot attack or change their battle positions. So, if you take all the ice counter cards which actually give effects to ice counters, what they do is provide Cold Enchanter 300 attack for each, cause non water monsters to lose 200 attack for each, and cause each creature that has one to not be able to attack or change their battle position. And also, with Ice Master, makes it so you can destroy monsters that have ice counters on them. So you can see that half of the effects with giving some kind of benefit to ice counters incentivize having them on your own cards. While the ice counters themselves seem to be incentivized around being on your opponent's cards, since Snowman Creator can only place them on your opponent's cards. And Cold Enchanter, Ice Master, Snow Dragon, and Snow Dust Giant can place them on monsters on both players' side of the field. So, Snow Dust Dragon kind of creates a dichotomy of the ice counters, where it technically has a beneficial effect for you in order to debuff monsters with ice counters, but it kind of also restricts your ability to make use of them with Snow Dust Giant and Cold Enchanter, since if you place a whole bunch of ice counters on Snow Dust Giant, it will no longer be able to attack if Snow Dust Dragon hits the field. Although, Snow Dust Dragon does require you to remove four ice counters from anywhere on the field to bring it out. So you could just remove the counters from your own monsters and leave them on your opponents if a whole bunch of them were placed on everything with a snow dragon getting destroyed for example. Which is to say, counters are kind of counterintuitive with each other, where some of the cards gain benefits from them being on the field, where they're best left on your own monsters, and others provide detriments to creatures that have the ice counters on them, where you want to have them on your opponent's monsters. And none of these effects are really worth the headache of juggling around all the ice counters in the first place. You see, these six cards are the only cards in the game that interact with ice counters, and they don't even really combo well with each other. Out of them, you could probably just play Snowdust Giant in some kind of water-based deck and just ignore all the other ice counter support. Since Snowdust Giant can provide a pretty hefty AoE attack decrease to your opponent's cards, which could actually be useful. And Snowman Creator might allow you to pop choice cards if you want to special summon it easily, and you control a lot of water monsters. All the other ones, though, are kind of mediocre in what they're able to do with ice counters and aren't super worth considering. And as far as ice counters go, that's kind of it. They haven't released any new ice counter support since 2012. None of the ice counter cards really saw any competitive play, and it's basically just a failure of mechanic. That was kind of abandoned like a lot of the other counter systems, where only a handful of them have seen any kind of competitive play. Like the Endymion archetype with spell counters, or even Cosmic Slicer Zerol, since it's able to create a lockdown with Alien Kid or Planet Pollutant Virus, and stops monsters with 8 counters on them from activating their effects. So, what could they do to ice counters in order to make them more competitive? Well, ice counters themselves are so inherently clunky and anti-synergistic that they would just have to create new cards and interact with them, or just choose one of the old cards and base an entire archetype around that one alone. At least Snowdust Giant can kind of ignore its archetype and just handle ice counters by itself. But if they had more cards similar to Snowbound Creator, where they get to place ice counters and then destroy things, and then maybe actually granted some kind of effects to those ice counters, that might make them a little bit better. In order to make things more interesting for people who've already seen all these videos, I've decided to add some bonus content in the form of some mini failed cards that are probably too small for their own videos which I'll put in after every other video. And to start off, we have Zingaki Magician and turning ranks into levels. This magician with a hard to pronounce name is a pendulum effect, which allows you to target one Xyz monster you control and allows you to treat its rank as if it were a level until the end of the turn. Now, seeing as getting an Xyz monster in the field already requires an investment of at least two cards in most cases, having to then convert it into a level for an Xyz summon of another card 
it's just going to make you go minus two in card advantage in most cases. So while it may be useful in incredibly new circumstances, like Xyz monsters get extra effects if they have Xyz materials underneath them, this isn't really an effect that many people are really clamoring for. And in fact, the only reason this card has the effect is specifically because it's trying to relate to an anime moment, where the main character was trying to combine two of its monsters together without a fusion summon, so they converted its rank into a level so they can go into Odd Eye's Raging Dragon. There's even a Duel Link skill that tries to recreate this anime moment in a very convoluted paragraph of text that basically sets the stage for the XC summon to happen, and also has the effect to use a level 7 XC's monster as a level 7 monster for an XC summon. So they literally created a brand new mechanic just to use once to reference an anime moment and never again. Milling refers to effects that send cards to the top of a player's deck to the graveyard. This is a concept borrowed from Magic the Gathering and has its name from the first notable card to have this kind of ability, the Millstone. Like many other concepts and other TCGs at the time, milling was something that Yu-Gi-Oh! incorporated really early on, to varying degrees of success. In this video, we'll be going over all the notable mill decks in Yu-Gi-Oh! and the history of the mechanic in general. The main idea behind the original mill decks from Magic was to make use of the deck out win condition, in which if your opponent has to draw a card while they have no cards in their deck, they lose the game. This is a rule which Yu-Gi-Oh! borrowed without change and it's been part of the game's core since day one. The first card to become associated with these kinds of deck out strategies would be Morphing Jar. This is a low level monster which makes both players discard their hands and draw five whenever it's foot face up. Morphing Jar is much more than just a mill enabler, because it can also swing around advantage massively in both players' favors. In mill though, this card takes a huge chunk out of your opponent's deck, and if used while they have less than five cards in there, wins you the game on the spot. This card was released in the OCG Booster 5 series, all the way back in 1999, and it also would bring Needleworm. This is another flip monster which makes your opponent send the top 5 cards of the deck to the graveyard when flip face up. These two would go on to form the backbone of the deck destruction, a popular deck archetype during the early OCG meta. With 3 copies of both Jar and Worm, as well as there being very little counterplay to flip effects at the time, this was actually a quite formidable strategy back then. A huge perk this deck had was a great matchup against Exodia, which was a pretty consistent deck due to having every limb at 3, as well as powerful draw spells like Graceful Charity. Since there wasn't any good way to recover pieces from the graveyard yet, deck destruction could secure early wins by getting the 3 copies of a part there. A few months down the line, this deck would get 2 extra jars added to its arsenal. The first being Cyber Jar, which when flipped destroys all monsters of the field and makes both players reveal the top 5 cards of the decks, special summon all level 4 lower monsters to the field, and then add the remaining cards to their hand. This card not only deck thin your opponent for 5 like the other ones, it could also summon more of the jars in face down defense position. All of this while being mass field removal and fill up your hand too. The next one was Morphing Jar number 2, which when flipped shuffles all monsters in the field into the deck, and then each player has to send cards from the top of their deck to the graveyard until they find as many monsters that were shuffled, and then they special summon all excavated level 4 lower monsters. Though number 2 was the only one who didn't guarantee at least a mill 5, it also did not have a limit in how much it could mill. The only reason why these full power mill decks didn't erase Exodia from the meta completely was that they got Backup Soldier, a trap that can recover up to three normal monsters back from the graveyard. With that said, discarding all their heads remained a valid win con. The power of deck destruction was such that even though cards to blink flip effects had been released in the meantime, like Noble Meta Crossout and Ceasefire, the deck still had to get severely hit by the OCG banlist, which put both Morphin Jar number two and Cyber Jar at one. Even after that, this strategy becomes stronger than ever before with Makura the Destructor coming out. The pre errata version of the card would allow you to activate trap cards from your hand the turn it was sent to the graveyard, which paired well with the pre errata exchange of the spirit, which swaps both players' graveyards in their decks if you have 15 or more cards there. The idea was to use Morphine Jar or Card Destruction to trigger Makura, then draw onto more cards and fill your graveyard up until you had exchanged the spirit life. At this point, you'd usually be leaving your opponent with 5 cards in deck, which would mean another trigger of Jar would finish them off. This was a very competent strategy in Japan, which could achieve its OTK extremely quickly if you drew well enough. This would be the last hurrah for deck destruction over there, as not long after it ravaged the metagame, Konami would release a nuke ban list, which would limit several cards crucial to it, including Upstart, Reckless, Makura, Card D, and even Jar itself. For comparison, we never really got this schism in the TCG. Due to how our releases worked, when we ended up getting them, both Cyber Jar and Morphin Jar were already limited. Not only that, but the deck's good matchup versus Exodia didn't matter, as that wasn't a viable deck for us due to similar hits. Still, despite having its main combo pieces put to one, players would eventually be shown that a deck destruction strategy could still succeed in the meta. In the 2005 World Championship, a deck focused around getting the most value out of your two available jars would be one of the breakouts of the event. The main goal of the strategy was to reuse the jars through the books and shallow grave, before eventually finishing your opponent off with serial spell plus card destruction combo. 
Though it wasn't taken very seriously in much of the western side of the world, this deckout list managed to win the Mexican Nationals of that year, and then go all the way to second place in Worlds. This deck would eventually become known as Empty Jar, and though people would try to recreate the success in other formats, it never quite managed to get as far as it did at this time. However, this remains a valid strategy in GOAT, one of the most popular retro Yu-Gi-Oh formats where it's been used to a decent amount of success. The Jar cards would still see tons of play throughout the years, and Morphine Jar even remains limited to this day. But they were mostly played as huge haymakers, and not as actual win cons like in the previous instances. The Yu-Gi-Oh meta would progress from this point forwards, and though there were many powerful cards which incidentally milled, like Don Zalug and Vampire Lord, that would never be the main selling point of those cards. Burn would be the most popular alternate win condition, due to their numerous enablers being around. These decks benefited more from Floodgates since they could better maneuver a slow game, and even got to play powerful game enders such as Ring of Destruction and Magic Cylinder. Mill decks also had the disadvantage of filling up your opponent's graveyard. Though you could take out crucial limited cards out of the pitcher, like Heavy Storm, you were even more likely to fill your opponent's graveyard with monsters, which could then be brought back, or used to fuel the summon conditions of the Chaos monsters, which were a huge part of the meta. From this point onwards, there'd be little relevancy to mill decks for a long while, and though there was some support for the deck around, the strategy simply wasn't worth trying outside of trying to abuse the jars. From this point onwards, graveyard synergies would only become more and more common, making sending cards from your opponent's stack to the graveyard even more of a liability. Card Trooper became a staple as soon as it was released, a card which milled 3 from your deck every turn. We also would get cards like Treeborn Frog, which is a plus 1 every turn while it's in the graveyard, and you can draw no back row. This would eventually culminate in the release of the Light Swarms, the first archetype based entirely around milling, but only it's your own deck. Most of the Light Sworn monsters can send cards on top of your controller's deck to the graveyard during the end phase, which helped turn on many of the cards in their engine and outside of it. This is where the notion of the graveyard is the second hand would begin to emerge. And as we progress into the Synchro era, there is no shortage of decks which wanted these free mills. At this point, a lot of decks were splashing cards like Raikou just to get that shot at triggering a graveyard effect for free. Still, it was just around this era where we'd see a way to deck an opponent out come into the metagame in Max C. This hand trap is supposed to try and stop the opponent by making you draw a card every time they special summon a monster. The notable thing is that you are forced to draw. So, if the opponent can somehow special summon enough times, you can force them to draw until they have nothing left in the deck. This was usually accomplished through not once per turn effects like Colossal Fighter and Level Leader, and though it very rarely happened, it was a risk you had to be aware of when Maxine. It wasn't until 2013 where we'd see an actual strategy based entirely around this all-win condition again, and that was with the Gishki FTK. In short terms, this was a deck which would use draw power such as Royal Magical Library, Trade In, and Upstart Goblin to assemble a loop with Gishki Minogus, who shuffles back cards from the graveyard into the deck when it's summoned. The end game with this loop was to reuse cards like Dark World Dealings, which would make both players draw, until your opponent decked out. This strategy did not see that much representation because it was hard to play and took a really long time to execute, usually taking over 30 minutes for a single turn if the combo went through. The issues with this deck were more or less the same that modern attempts at Empty Jar does, and that they perfectly illustrate why this kind of deckout strategy can never be that impressive. Since the loop involves both you and your opponent drawing through your decks, that means the opponent will have to play through every single hand trap they've got. Back in the day, you were limited to just Effect Veiler and UD Crow, but these were often more than enough to put a stop to the FTK. This quirk of the deck even led to a notable player citing a singular copy of Necromane King as a silver bullet against the deck back in the day. Necromane ends your opponent's turn if it's sent to the graveyard by opponent's card effect during their turn, which is exactly what Dark World Dealings and Card Destruction did. The existence of this loop even led to Mine August being limited for years afterwards. This FDK is entirely legal these days and doesn't cause any trouble, though, due to the immense variety of hand traps we have in the meta nowadays. Even if they do manage to get their combo started, odds are it won't be able to play through the copies of Ash Blossom and Joy Spring, or even worse, Droll and Lockbird. That's the same reason people say Morphine Jar can come back to 3 in today's metagame, and also why we'd never see a deckout strategy like these two be competitive ever again. From here, this win con became more of a novelty than anything else, only being the main feature of extremely casual strategies. As a few examples, we've had Ghost Trick Skeleton, which can banish cards from the top of your opponent's deck face down, up to the number of Ghost Tricks you control. Though banishing cards face down is good, milling so little and at such a glacial pace means it'd probably be faster to try to win by attacking with its 1200 body several times instead. There's Inferno Tempest, which can banish all the monsters from your opponent's deck and graveyard, but it leaves them with all their resources on hand and field, and usually is going to require a 3 card combo between a 0 attack monster, a kaiju, and Tempest itself. We've also had Mayakashi, a zombie archetype which can chain special summon several times in a single turn, through its not once per turn Daki and Soul Absorbing Bone Tower to mill your opponent out. This was probably one of the best deck out strategies around, 
though it still relied on somewhat inconsistent combos that dies to a single interaction. While this sort of deck continued to flounder in the TCG, around 2017 we'd get Duel Links, an alternate format which includes skills and greatly limited card pulls. With a 20 card main deck, as well as power levels matching 2002 Yu-Gi-Oh, we had none of the good staples, this was the perfect environment for a mill deck to thrive in. It was called Taya Mill because it used the Taya skill Dual Standby, which made both players start out with 5 cards in hand instead of the usual 4. Many cards that were completely useless in the TCG made the core of the strategy, such as Warm Worm, which mills your opponent for 3 when it's destroyed, and Hero Shadow Scout, which makes your opponent draw 3 on flip. These two couple with battle traps such as a Faint Plan, and the game's extremely limited means of removal for both monsters and back row, provided the perfect environment for a stall deck like this to thrive. This was one of the most hated strategies on the ladder for a while, which even led to Duel Links having Hero on the ban list for years. In 2019 we'd get a card which would make a rise the same kind of vitriol in the TCG. It encouraged the same kind of stall playstyle, though it was probably hated magnitudes more than the aforementioned mill strategy. And that was Mystic Mine. This is a field spell which mixes with a player which controls more monsters, currently cannot activate monster effects or attack. And if both players have the same number of monsters out, it destroys itself during the end phase. Mine was played either as a dedicated strategy or as a going second option in decks. As its own deck, the strategy was just to sit on the floodgate with zero monsters out and have something like Field Barrier to make sure it wouldn't destroy itself ever. From there, you would just burn them to death with Cauldron of the Old Man. However, the card was even more obnoxious when splashed into other strategies. By just playing a play set of mines into other decks, you get access to a great going second option against monster heavy strategies. After activating mine, there'd be two outcomes. Either you'd bait a spell trap negate, or you'd lock your opponent out of doing anything until they drew an out. The thing is that, since you were likely playing a deck which your opponent wouldn't normally side back or removal against, there likely wasn't an out. If that was the case, you could just pass back and forth between each player until your opponent decked out. This interaction warped deck building around it while mine was around and there was never a good answer to it. Many decks had to fill in at least one piece of back removal in the main somewhere as to not risk being decked out by mine, even if the card would be subpar against every other matchup, just in case someone was maining mine. Many who did not want to make this concession would end up having to forfeit many game one ofs when they got hit by the card, lest they'd waste half the time of the round passing until they decked out. In this sense, Mystic Mine was the perfect floodgate to support a deck out strategy, since most of the time what you drew didn't matter. Some decks which go beyond this and bank it all in Mystic Mind going second by preparing an out to your opponent's out. This was something that Sprite did last year, since they'd go for mine and then use Beat Cop from the Underworld to tribute itself and put a counter that protected mine from destruction. This was really effective against Tier Elements, who had been recently playing a single copy of Galaxy Cyclone, which can destroy face up spells by banishing it from the graveyard. Mystic Mind was one of the most hated cards in the game due to the degenerate playstyle enabled, up until it was finally banned after three years of legality. However, though Mind was the only viable avenue for a deck out in a really long time, as it passed away, we'd see quite a few modern decks which were more than capable of doing so. The first of these would be Runic. The archetype spells all have two effects, where they can either be used to impact the field somehow and then banish cards from the top of your opponent's deck, or special summon one of their extra deck monsters. However, you would have to skip the next battle phase after activating either of these effects. The Runic Engine is pretty good at generating advantage since their field spell effectively replaces every Runic card you use with a random draw. And their spells have quite useful and varied effects, such as popping back row or negating monsters. The idea behind Runic cards is that since you don't get a battle phase, banishing cards on top of your opponent's deck until they deck out becomes your win condition. This gets around the main issue with Mill in modern times, as while there are a few cards that get their effects off when banished, the vast majority of decks don't have them. In this, Runic have a bit of a niche in the spirit of the original mill decks, in that you're taking away important resources from your opponent's deck, which they probably won't be able to gain access to again. With this said, though some people did play Runic as a primary stall and deck out strategy, it was mainly used as an engine for other decks such as Naturia and Sprite. While the Runic version of these strategies do retain the ability to deck your opponent out if they need to, they usually just amass advantage and they can spend a turn without activating Runic cards and then go for game that way. However, things went a bit differently in Master Duel due to being a best of one and having access to options like Card of Demise at 3 at some point. The stun variant ran amok on the ladder up until it had to be addressed with many hits on the ban list. The next deck capable of milling you out in recent memory was Tier Lament Ashizu, more specifically the Ashizu half. Agito or Kelbeck make both players mill 5 cards when sent from the hand or deck to the graveyard. Or in Agito's case, 10 if you got Exchange of the Spirit in there, the same card that was used for the mill OTK 20 years ago. With that being said, Exchange was very rarely an inclusion in the deck, as being able to mill 5 from Trigger of Agito and Kelbeck was more than enough. Usually, you'd often be activating these cards during your opponent's turn as well. The then tier 0 deck could beat pretty much any other that came in their way. 
only struggling if they had access to a really strong floodgate like Dimension Shifter or Abyss Dweller. Despite Tyr not having a very good out to towers like the Arrival, or even an Avermax with Destruction and Protection, the deck still had a very good matchup against decks that made these. And that's because, in the case that your opponent made something you couldn't out, you could just loop Agito and Kelbeck every turn by putting them back into the deck with Mudora or Keldo, up until your opponent had no cards left in their deck. These cards did all get sent to the graveyard, where it might turn on an opponent's revival spell, or even give them a small plus. But the advantage the tier player would get by getting bodies and searches with the tier limit cards would be insurmountable, and they could just stall out until deck out. This is why no other deck could ever beat tiers when it came to the grind game, and this ability to use and reuse resources was also why the mirror matches could end up taking so much time. At the very least, it is something we no longer have to worry about for the most part with the deck being so crippled by the ban list. The last deck which plays into this deck destruction deal is Kashtira. Their level 4 monster, Kashtira Riseheart, banishes the top 3 cards of your opponent's deck face down as part of its effect. This is relevant because of Kashtira Shangra Ira, which can lock your opponent out of using a zone on the board every time a card they possess is banished face down. This would be their only way to lock zones during their first turn, if not for number 89, Diabolus the Mind Hacker, an older card whose effects only became relevant as of late. Basically, Diabolus looks at your opponent's extra deck and banishes a card from their face down. And when a card is banished face down, it can make your opponent banish cards from the top of their deck equal to the number of their banished face down cards they have. And this triggers Shangri Ira twice. Of the mainline Kishtira lines involving using both Riseheart and Diabolus to lock three of your opponent's zones, and as a side effect, this will end up banishing eight of their cards face down, seven of them from the main and one from the extra. However, during your opponent's turn, since many of the Kishtira cards are able to banish your opponent's cards as interaction, you're able to trigger Diabolus again. And this time, it's going to be getting an even bigger chunk of their deck. This is the best way to mill an opponent, as cards which are banished face down are almost impossible to recover outside of the one whose deck does this, Cash Tira. If the game ever goes down to a grind, the Cash player can trigger Riseheart, Chilamet's Cash Tira, and Diabolus in just the right way to deck your opponent out. Though the actual deck out doesn't come up much, losing important one ofs due to the first turn setup is currently one of the most annoying parts of dealing with Cash Tira in the current metagame. This is where deck out strategies stand in Yu Gi Oh! for now. With both Kashtira and Runic being top tier decks at the time of writing, deck outs might not be as uncommon as they once were, but they're still very rarely seen and not the main strategy behind these archetypes. What these two have in common is that they're often decking you out in addition to gaining advantage with their cards, rather than focusing on that specific effect over everything else. The fact that both of these strategies banish cards instead of send them to the graveyard is also huge, as your opponent is very rarely getting an advantage out of them. Even so, Runic can sometimes have a bad time against Despia and Kashtira because their cards are banished face up, and both these cards can plus off and interact with having their cards banished. The main disadvantage historically with mill decks has been that putting resources near opponent's graveyard was bad even from the first few years of the game, and that the win con wasn't as reliable as burnt. The solution to letting the opponent utilize those resources was to be able to kill them extremely quickly, preferably in one turn, which led to the mild success of both Empty Jar and Gishki FTK. However, as we've discussed before, this kind of strategy is completely non-viable due to the overabundance of hand traps roaming around. Konami's experiment with mill decks have been far and few between, with Runic being really recent, and this aspect of cash being seemingly unintended. This is probably because the players tend to hate going up against these play styles. Since not only does it solve the game, it also adds an extra sense of luck into a match by adding the possibility of losing one ofs in your deck that you might need. That's the main reason why Pure Runic is so hated in Master Duel, and one of the reasons why Diabolus is one card everybody wants banned at the moment. As for the future mill decks, it's unclear if Konami will make any other archetypes which support it soon. But Runic, at least, is probably staying around for a while, as they've just had some new support announced in the OCG. Still, Cyber Jar and Morphin Jar remain limited, and though they might not be as relevant now, their place in Forbidden Limitless shows how impactful and feared the original deck destruction in used 2009, to be. Konami released a main deck monster support for extra deck monsters, which required you to go into the extra deck monster first before you could summon the main deck monster using a trap card. So, for those of you who don't know much about game theory or just how competitive Yu-Gi-Oh works, all of that is just terrible. You see, one of the benefits of the Yu-Gi-Oh card game is the extra deck. The extra deck is this wonderful place where you don't need to search the cards out. You just simply need to meet the conditions for those cards to get on the field. And they basically just exist outside the game. And because of just how good this is, if an extra deck monster has an effect which is even slightly useful, it's just going to be infinitely more valuable than if it was attached to a main deck monster because of just how much easier it is to bring them out. However, in Yu-Gi-Oh, most extra deck monsters just straight up have better effects than main deck monsters, so they just double up on being really good. And that's kind of why modern Yu-Gi-Oh revolves around extra deck monsters, and why whenever Konami releases a new extra deck monster type, it's such a big deal. 
So, one of the problems with main deck boss monsters is the fact that you have to search them out in order to use them. And if they have specific requirements, then it's even harder to bring them out because of all of the resources required in order to get those specific materials. Take Neo's Wise Man for example. This card is infamous for being an absolutely terrible boss monster, because it requires two high-level monsters with exact names on the field, as well as searching the card out itself in the deck in order to special summon it from your hand. The amount of resources required in order to bring out Neos Wise Man is such an investment that the card itself would have to be ridiculously good in order to be worth that effort. And Neos Wise Man is just okay. It's not bad, the card is immune to destruction effects and inflicts damage to your opponent's life points after a battle regardless of the outcome of that battle, but it's not good enough to justify its summoning conditions. If, however, Neo's Wise Man was simply an extra deck monster, then it wouldn't be bad at all, and instead just be a normal choice, which would have to be better than all the other mediocre cards that you could possibly bring out. In fact, they did create an extra deck monster version of it eventually, Elemental Hero Neo's Kluger, and it is in fact much better. Trap cards have this inherent downside, where you need to set them for a turn, and then wait until your next turn in order to use them. Now obviously, this doesn't sound like a big deal, but it's actually slow enough to completely kill the viability of tons of cards. Because during your turn, when you're going through all of your combos, in order to complete your combos you need to be able to activate them immediately. Because the whole act of just waiting until the next turn does enough to slow down a lot of effects where trap cards need to be really good in order to be worth playing. The best example of that are cards like Jar of Greed and Call of the Haunted. Jar of Greed simply allows you to draw one card and doesn't really see any competitive play. The card Upstart Goblin allows you to draw one card, but at the cost of giving your opponent 1,000 life points, and that card is so good that it's currently limited to one copy. Call of the Haunted allows you to special summon any monster from your graveyard and is not once per turn. So if you have three copies of Call of the Haunted, you can use all three of them on the same turn. World Legacy Secession allows you to special summon one monster from your graveyard, but only to a zone that a link monster is pointing to, and also has a hard once per turn. World Legacy Succession sees competitive play, and Call of the Haunted sees absolutely no competitive play in the modern meta. So, what happens when you take something good like extra deck monsters, and then apply the detriments of main deck boss monsters, alongside the detriments of a trap card which is required to summon them? What you get is an archetype which, surprisingly, saw some competitive success because one of the cards is slightly overpowered. You see, the way the Assault Mode monsters work is they're all main deck boss monsters, which have a material requirement of a specific extra deck monster, and the only way to bring them out is to tribute that synchro monster with a specific trap card, Assault Mode Activate. However, the Assault Mode main deck monster needs to be in your deck, which turns every single Assault Mode monster into a Garnet, which just adds an extra layer of unplayability to them where they're already a bricky mess to begin with based on just how they're designed. And the Assault Mode monsters themselves are basically upgraded versions of the original Synchro monsters. There doesn't seem to be a rhyme or reason on which Synchro monsters were chosen to get Assault Mode versions, but I have to assume it has something to do with the anime. The best Assault Mode monster though is definitely Stardust Dragon Assault Mode. This card requires you to tribute Stardust Dragon with Assault Mode Activate in order to special summon it from the deck. Stardust Dragon is a level 8 synchro monster with generic materials that has the effect where, if a card effect is activated which destroys a card on the field, Stardust Dragon can trim it itself in order to negate and destroy that card. Then it can special summon itself during the end phase. So, Stardust Dragon saw competitive play back in the synchro era because it was a nice way to stop destruction effects, which was a very common form of removal during the synchro era, before they went crazy with non-targeting banish and bounce effects. So what can an upgraded version of Stardust Dragon do? What Stardust Dragon Assault Mode does is have the effect where if any card or effect is activated, you can tribute this card in order to negate the activation and destroy that card. Then during the end phase, this card special summons itself from the graveyard. So basically, the upgraded version of Stardust Dragon's effect, which allows you to stop destruction effects, is to just be a full-on Omni Negate. And Omni Negates are basically the name of the game in modern Yu-Gi-Oh! So of course a full Omni Negate was good in the early days of Yu-Gi-Oh! as well. And one of the downsides to Stardust Dragon was that it only had 2500 attack for a boss monster, which was pretty easy to beat over. You could take out Stardust Dragon with just a single Blackwing Gale the Whirlwind. And all of these Assault Mode monsters have 500 more attack than their single monster counterparts, which means Stardust Dragon Assault Mode had 3000 attack, and actually does a good job of getting over one of the detriments to Stardust Dragon, where it was pretty easy to beat over by battle. 
Stardust Dragon Assault Mode is much tougher to get over. Another trait all the Assault Mode monsters share is that when they're destroyed on the field, they float into their specific Synchro Monster from the graveyard. So if Stardust Dragon Assault Mode is destroyed by Battle or Card Effect, you get to Special Summon Stardust Dragon from your graveyard. Assuming Stardust Dragon was Special Summon properly, of course. And also assuming it doesn't miss timing, because for some reason all of the Assault Mode monsters have a when effect for their floating effect, instead of just if. So, how did Assault Mode decks accomplish getting both a Synchro Monster on the field, keeping that Assault Mode monster in the deck, and then of course searching out Assault Mode Activate in order to use the effect to actually bring out the Assault Mode monster? Well, they had a pretty decent searcher in the form of Assault Beast, which has a hand effect to just discard the card in order to add Assault Mode Activate from your deck to your hand. This was kind of unprecedented for monsters at the time. Nearly all level 4 or lower monsters at search required you to summon the card first, or activate its floating effect in order to search. Very few of them could actually just use their effects from the hand. And in fact, Assault Beast has decent attack too for a level 4 monster, with basically the maximum at 1900. And since it's Beast Warrior type, it can be searched out with Fire Formation Tenki, which wouldn't be released until 4 years later after the first wave of Assault Mode cards. Although, the good support kind of ends with Assault Beast. They also had a card called Assault Teleport, which allowed you to shuffle an Assault Mode monster from your hand back into your deck to draw two cards. The whole purpose of this card exists so that you can reset the Garnet without losing advantage, which also means the card is dead in hand unless you have an Assault Mode monster. There is also Arcane Apprentice, which can search out Assault Mode Activate from your deck if it's sent to the graveyard as a Synchro Material. Seeing as it's a level 2 tuner that can't Special Summon itself in any way, that's not a very good way to search out Assault Mode Activate. At least not until Crystron Halky Fibrax was released over 10 years later. There's also a level 3 monster called Nightwing Sorceress, which allows you to activate Assault Mode Activate the turn it's set, which shows that they knew the Assault Mode Activate was limited by its trap status, because they have a support card in order to allow you to not be hindered by its requirement. There's also a couple of other niche cards which didn't really help bring out the Synchro Monster or deal with the inherent flaws of the archetype, but that was basically the original launch of Assault Modes. They were a little bit too clunky to actually see play, but Stardust Dragon Assault Mode had a really good Omni Negate effect, which could possibly see play in the future, which would happen in 2013. In 2013, the Dragon Rulers were released, as well as Fire Formation Tenki, which allowed Assault Mode players to finally have a way to search out Assault Beast. With Fire Formation Tenki and Assault Beast being able to search out Assault Mode Activate, it became a lot more consistent, and the Dragon Rulers were a series of monsters that were just super good at getting level 7 monsters on the field. So all they had to do was have a level 1 tuner and they could go into Stardust Dragon. And since early Yu-Gi-Oh lacked Omni Negate boss monsters, a couple of Dragon Ruler decks would supplement a Stardust Dragon Assault Mode engine, and actually found some success with it. They would use the Dragon Ruler's insane advantage in order to bring out Stardust Dragon, and then they would use the newly released Fire Formation Tenki in order to search out Assault Beast, which would then allow them to search out Assault Mode Activate, and then they could use Assault Beast in the graveyard as a material for Redox Dragon Ruler the Boulders later. Although, the Dragon Rulers themselves were incredibly broken, and the Stardust Dragon Assault Mode engine wasn't very popular, but it definitely did see some success nonetheless, even if it was heavily carried by just how good the Dragon Rulers were themselves, seeing as three of them are still forbidden on the ban list to this day. Then, after Dragon Rulers were severely limited by the first ban list that came out after their introduction, they could no longer supplement the Assault Mode Activate engine and kind of dropped it, in favor of just anything else. Then, in 2019, Assault Mode cards randomly got some new support. The new support release was a new Assault Mode monster, two main deck monsters, as well as a new spell and trap card. Psy Reflector is a level 1 tuner, which basically solves all the problems Assault Mode decks had in the past by itself. When it's summoned, it allows you to add an Assault Mode Activate from your deck to your hand. Or, it allows you to add a card which specifically lists Assault Mode Activate in its text from your deck to your hand, except another copy of itself. Then it has an additional effect, where you can reveal an Assault Mode Activate in your hand in order to target a monster in your graveyard, which specifically lists Assault Mode Activate in its text, in order to special summon it. Then you can choose to increase its level by 1 to 4. So, here's how you use it. Basically, you use Psy Reflector in order to search out Assault Beast from your deck. Then you use Assault Beast in order to search out Assault Mode Activate, which puts Assault Mode Activate in your hand and Assault Beast in the graveyard. Then you use Psy Reflector in order to special summon Assault Beast, and then increase its level by whichever the single monsters you need to go into, which is usually by 3. That way you can go into Stardust Dragon. 
Then, since Cyreflector is a tuner, you just perform the Synchro Summon and you have Stardust Dragon Assault Mode on your next turn when you're able to activate Assault Mode Activate. So, Cyreflector became a one-card Assault Mode monster, and it pretty much lifts the entire archetype on its back now. But did this get Assault Mode monsters to see competitive play? The answer to that question may surprise you, considering I'm making a series about failed cards and mechanics. Of course, that answer to the question is no, but it's definitely an appreciated card in the casual scene for players who want to be able to use Assault Mode monsters, and Duel Links for its one-card synchro potential. They also released Assault Sentinel, which allows you to tribute the card in order to special summon Psy Reflector from your deck, essentially, to make it more consistent, and can also be searched out with Fire Formation Tenki, which just makes the whole thing more consistent. It also allows you to change the type and attributes of monsters on the field to better supplement some of the more specific synchro monsters in the Assault Mode archetype, like Arcanite Magician or Hyper Psychic Blaster, who require specific types of monsters as their non-tuner materials. The spell card Assault Mode Zero is basically a spell card version of Assault Mode Activate, except it only special summons the Assault Mode monster from your hand instead of your deck, which makes the effect kind of worse. Although its graveyard effect is decent, where it allows you to banish the card from your graveyard in order to set Assault Mode Activate directly from your hand or deck. Then it allows it to be activated this turn. So the card would be a lot more useful if its hand and graveyard effects were swapped around. And then there's the trap card Assault Reboot, which is like a form change for Assault Mode cards, where you contribute an Assault Mode monster in order to special summon a different named Assault Mode monster from your deck, ignoring its summoning conditions which is basically the best way to special summon the new Assault Mode card they released, TG Halberd Cannon Assault Mode, as this card requires a hard-to-bring-out level 12 Synchro Monster as its Synchro Material, but actually has a pretty decent effect on the field, where once per turn you can negate one of your opponent's summons and then banish all of your opponent's special summon monsters. So if you're able to get TG Halberd Cannon Assault Mode and Stardust Dragon Assault Mode on your side of the field, you have a pretty good lockdown on your opponent. And the new Support card definitely makes bringing these two cards out a lot easier. It's just not easy enough through the plethora of hand traps that exist in the modern meta. If the modern Assault Mode support was released back in 2009, with the original wave of Assault Mode monsters, then we might have had a different history of Yu-Gi-Oh, where Assault Mode cards were running rampant in the metagame and destroying everything with their infinite negates of Stardust Dragon Assault Mode. So, why did the Assault Mode monsters fail? Well, I kind of explained that already in the very beginning of the video. It's a series of main deck boss monsters which require an extra deck monster to hit the field and be tributed with a specific trap card, which just requires a lot of resources in order to set all of that up. And the archetype did not do enough in order to support any of that from happening. Not until years later when they released crucial support like Fire Formation Tenki and Psy Reflector. However, Duel Links has an incredibly lower power level version of the game compared to the modern TCG, which could be comparable to early Synchro Yu-Gi-Oh!, and they even have Psy Reflector in that game. However, they don't have any of the good Assault Mode monsters except TG Halberd Cannon Assault Mode. And TG Halberd Cannon Assault Mode is only good if they have Assault Reboot in the game, which they decided to selectively leave out as well. So without power cards like Stardust Dragon Assault Mode, or even Colossal Fighter Assault Mode, which is the third best Assault Mode monster, then the fact that they have Psy Reflector means they basically just use the card for one card synchro summons without bothering to use Assault Mode monsters at all. However, if they just added Stardust Dragon Assault Mode, Colossal Fighter Assault Mode, or even Assault Reboot, then Assault Mode cards might actually start seeing some competitive play over there. Because Assault Reboot would allow easy access to TG Halberd Cannon Assault Mode, which is kind of broken in Duel Links. And Colossal Fighter Assault Mode, which allows you to send two warrior monsters from your deck to the graveyard on its summoned, and lowers the attack of all of your opponent's monsters by 100 times the amount of warriors in your graveyard, plus of course floats into Colossal Fighter on its death, which is also a pretty beefy beat stick in Duel Links. I think they could probably release Colossal Fighter Assault Mode and it wouldn't be much of a problem. Although I totally get why they're not releasing Stardust Dragon Assault Mode, as it was good enough to actually see play in the actual TCG, despite the drawbacks of being part of the Assault Mode archetype. Curse of Fiend is a normal spell card which has the effect to change the battle positions of all monsters in the field and also forces them to stay in that battle position until the end of the turn. However, what's unique about this card is the fact that it's a normal spell card which can only be activated during the standby phase. Normally, the standby phase is reserved exclusively for paying the cost of cards, or for spell speed to or higher effects, since you're not allowed to activate spell speed 1 effects during the standby phase unless it's through a trigger. However, Curse of Fiend is unique in that it does technically have a trigger, i.e. only usable during the standby phase, but it's the only normal spell card that works that way, without it being face up on the field the whole time like in the case of Swords of Revealing Light, 
which is also a normal spell card which is able to stay in the field for multiple turns and has triggers that happen at different phases outside of the main phases. So, because Curse of Fiend is so unique in having a trigger on a spell speed 1 card, it has special rulings that are not written anywhere that you just kind of have to know in order to make the card work correctly. Because in order to get Curse of Fiend to actually function, it has to be face down on the field during the standby phase for it to be able to be usable, Otherwise, the card doesn't know that its trigger has occurred if it's in your hand. Although, why it knows that the trigger occurs while it's face down the field and not in your hand is a complete mystery that I wasn't able to get any confirmation on. And it's not written down anywhere, and as far as I know, there's never been an official ruling on the card either. If you played any of the official simulators though, games designed by Konami themselves, they all have Curse of Fiend working by putting it face down, and then activated during the standby phase of the next turn, basically like a trap card. One has to wonder why it's not just a trap card then, if it works this way, and that's probably why they never use this mechanic again on any other card, because they could just make it into a trap card instead. In today's episode of Failed Cards and Mechanics, we'll be going over life point gain cards, explaining why they don't really see play, why they occasionally see competitive play, and also going over specific examples. When it comes to playing Yu-Gi-Oh, being able to win the game is the number one priority of your deck. In order to win the game, you want to either get your opponent's life points to zero, make your opponent lose every single card in their deck, either through a card effect or with just Victory Dragon, being able to win the game without ever having to do a game at all. So disregarding the Victory Dragon win condition, if your deck doesn't try to accomplish getting your opponent's life points to zero, milling their deck, or winning through an alternative win condition, then your deck's not going to be successful. So while there are cards in the game which inflict damage to your opponent's life points, like Chain Strike and Magical Explosion, which are able to do so to great effect, there are also cards which allow you to gain life points, like Golden Ladybug or Supremacy Berry, which can't really be used to good effect. You see, the whole reason Chain Strike and Magical Explosion see play is because they can allow you to get your opponent's life points to zero and you can build an entire deck around trying to get them to really high numbers of dealing damage. Chain Strike deals 400 damage times the chain length of the card is activated after. So if you're able to get a high chain link by just drawing a whole bunch of cards with stuff like Jar of Greed or Accumulated Fortune, while also activating other burn cards, you have a viable way in which this is trying to get your opponent's life points to zero while maintaining card advantage. Magical Explosion allows you to deal 200 points of damage to your opponent for each spell card in your graveyard. So if you're able to get 15 spell cards in your graveyard and then use Life Equalizer, you can burn your opponent for 3,000 points of damage in order to reduce their life points to zero. However, if you activate Supremacy Berry in order to gain 2,000 life points, you're not really moving the game state towards being able to win with that. All you're doing is losing card advantage to gain a little bit more life points, and you only need one life point remaining in order to win. When Solemn Judgment first came out, it didn't really see widespread competitive play. Even though it's one of the best trap cards ever released in the game, and is one of the few trap cards which continues to see competitive play in the modern era, where almost no one plays trap cards that you can't activate from your hand. And part of the reason it didn't see a lot of play at first was because it requires you to pay half your life points, which was thought of as just too harsh of a cost, for only the effect of being able to negate pretty much one of anything your opponent happens to do, except a monster effect. Solemn Judgment can negate a spell, trap, or monster summon, which is so incredibly useful that all those effects are good, and being able to get one key combo piece can win you the game. However, older Yu-Gi-Oh was more slower pace. Usually you'd win the duel by slowly attacking your opponent's life points over the course of a couple of turns, and being able to OTK your opponent was not common. Nowadays, if you can't OTK your opponent in one turn, then your deck is doing something wrong. So when you could actually survive over the course of a couple of turns, having to pay half your life points just to trade one for one seems like way too much of a cost, for such a minor benefit, when they had powerful cards in the game which could trade for way more. So it kind of makes sense why it rarely saw play, but it still did see play nonetheless, as life points were just seen as more a valuable resource back then. Even then, they still didn't really play life point gain cards, except for emergency provisions which was played for other reasons. I will say though, alternative formats where people play in legacy eras absolutely play triple copies of Solemn Judgment. They take modern deck building and apply it to previous eras, and have way better decks than ever existed in those time periods, just because they have years to know that paying half your life points to stop one thing is actually super good. Even if your life points kind of are more important in those legacy formats. 
You see, the thing with your life points is that it should be used as a resource in order to help you defeat your opponent, and not something you really need to try and increase. There are very few instances where gaining life points are necessary in order to further the game state. There are a couple of archetypes where they have a gimmick to gain life points in order to accomplish things, like Arrow Mages, but gaining life points is kind of necessary in order to activate their effects, and not really the whole point of that archetype. Let's take a look at Gren Maju, for example. This was a meta deck which banished a whole bunch of cards really easily, which means they could make use of the card Soul Absorption. Soul Absorption allows you to gain 500 life points for each card that gets banished, and just resolving Pot of Desires would net you 5,000 life points with Soul Absorption. They could also banish 15 cards from their extra deck with Eater of Billions, and another 8 with Gizmek Orochi, so with just a single Soul Absorption, Grand Maju decks could easily gain over 20,000 life points by just doing their plays like normal. However, when Grand Maju was running around in the meta, no one played the card. It was probably one of the easiest ways to just gain a whole bunch of life points ever. Way more than even a row mages can do, and that's part of their whole gimmick. And it only saw play in one or two topping side decks as a niche option to play against Mystic Mind Burn decks, because if you just gain 7,500 life points with an Eater of Millions banish, they can't really burn through that. Although it was never played in the main deck, and wasn't even a popular side deck option against Mystic Mind Burn in the decks that could play it. During the World Tournaments, they actually regularly banned Mystic Walk and Rainbow Life because of their availability to gain life points, and the potential for infinite loops. Mystic Walk allows you to tribute one monster to gain life points equal to its attack or defense. Since it's a quick play spell card, you can use it in response to your opponent trying to negate one of your monster's effects on the field in order to dodge that negate and let it go off. Or just use it during yours or your opponent's turn in order to win through time rules where whoever has the most life points wins. And Rainbow Life has a combo with Colossal Fighter that allows you to gain an infinite amount of life points. Although these cards don't really see play outside of world tournaments, and them constantly being banned is more of a just-in-case procedure rather than because of their actual problems. In Yu-Gi-Oh! Duel Links, there have been a couple of times in which life point gain cards have been competitively viable. Back in the original version of the skill 3 Star Demotion, you could use it once per turn in order to pay 2000 life points to reduce the level of all monsters in your hand by 3, which meant you could normal summon level 7 monsters without a tribute. Now, skills in Duel Links add a dimension to the game that doesn't really exist in normal Yu-Gi-Oh! Because as long as you meet the requirements of that skill, you can use it whenever you want, without having to search for a card from your deck. And because you can always count on being able to use a skill, in order to make sure you could use it again on your next turn, since the starting life point value is only 4,000, was by playing life point gain cards like Supremacy Berry. Supremacy Berry allows you to gain 2,000 life points if your life points are lower than your opponent's, or else take 1,000 damage if your life points are higher than your opponent's. So the card would never really see play in the TCG, because the only thing it does is gain you life points without being part of an archetype that can take advantage of its ability, and it doesn't gain enough life points, like Soul Absorption. Although this does allow you to activate 3 star demotion again, so it absolutely saw all kinds of competitive play because the original version of that skill was one of the strongest in that game's history. Although that wasn't the only time pure life point gain cards were being played to great advantage in Duel Links. There's another skill called Extra Extra, which you could activate each time you lost 2000 life points, where during your next draw phase you would draw an additional copy of whatever card you just drew. And this skill was not once per duel. so it heavily incentivized constantly gaining life points, because you could directly turn each 2,000 points of damage into a plus one in card advantage. So Golden Ladybug was actually a key component of that deck, because it would cause you to gain 500 life points every turn, and you could sometimes make additional copies of it with the skill, which could result in you having four or more copies of Golden Ladybug in your hand, giving you 2,000 plus life points every turn. The deck would also make use of the Field Spell card, Temple of the Mind's Eye, so that you can never take more than 1,000 battle damage from any one attack, and the Continuous Spell card, Backup Squad, which could allow you to draw another card for every 1,000 points of battle damage you took. And the way you would win was by basically just milling out your opponent, with a copy or two of Hero Shadow Scout and Warm Worm. The deck directly benefited from being able to gain life points, because you would gain advantage every time you lost 2,000, so it was in your best interest to just keep having more life points than your opponent could damage down and you would just keep drawing into ways in order to stop your opponent from taking you out, thanks to stall cards. So this skill was eventually nerfed so that you could only use it once per duel, which was much more reasonable and completely stopped this life point gain deck. 
So it seems Duel Links had some success with pure life point gain decks, or just plain pure life point gain cards for their full purpose of gaining life points, because you could use those with skills, in order to use those life points. This isn't really possible in normal Yu-Gi-Oh. If you want to stall out your opponent, it's much easier to just use something like Mystic Mine, or one of the plethora of stall cards available to the final countdown decks, where they don't even care about getting life points. Because getting life points in of itself doesn't advance the game state, unless you have some way to make use of those life points to advance the game state. That's better than everything else that can just do it already, which doesn't require you to pay life point gain cards. However, just like with extra extra decks and duel links, there is always the option of just gaining life points so that you can mill out your opponent. That could be seen as a win condition, just gain so much life points that your opponent can't possibly damage you enough before they run out of cards in their deck. And there's even cards which can help you accomplish this goal, like side effects, where your opponent gets to choose one to three cards to draw, and then you gain 2,000 life points for each card they choose to draw. So if your opponent draws three cards, then you gain 6,000 life points, which means your opponent's just that much closer to milling out their deck. You could even use cards like Graceful Tear, which allows you to gain 2,000 life points at the cost of giving one card in your hand to your opponent. So, if you give your opponent a copy of Pot of Desires, they'll be very tempted to play that card and mill 12 cards from their own deck, which is one of the largest mills you can accomplish with a two-card combo. Although that relies on your opponent actually playing that Pot of Desires, and side effects is only useful if your opponent chooses to draw all three cards. So, they're probably not the best examples in the world, but definitely cards that allow you to gain life points while also helping mill your opponent. It's a deck I experimented with in the past, which I would definitely never call competitive, but it definitely could steal games occasionally from meta decks on the online scene. The thing is though, even those two cards are not enough life points. It's too easy for your opponent to just deal more than 8,000 points of damage in one turn, and side effects actually gives you a lot of life points from one card at 6,000. If you wanted to play an actual competitive life point gain deck, where you're just trying to out-survive your opponent's damage, you would need a way to gain over 10,000 life points every turn without losing very much card advantage, which currently isn't viable. So I guess the video should be about how life point gain effects are too minuscule for the TCG, and they don't allow you to gain enough to be worth playing, outside of a whole bunch of edge cases, like Mystic Walk being used to win in time, or Soul Absorption being used as a niche side deck option against Mystic Mind Burn. So personally, I'd like to see more incredibly bombastic life point gain cards, so that it could be a legitimate thing you can try out. It would probably be terrible to play against, since you can't really play a life point gain deck without it being a control stall deck, but as shown with Extra Extra, and even cards like Backup Squad, which basically allow you to convert high life point values into extra cards from your deck, or even Ancient Leaf, which allows you to draw two cards if you have more than 9,000 life points, there is cards which allow you to make use of high life points. They're just not good enough. And current life point gain cards don't outpace the amount of damage a meta deck is able to put on the board pretty easily. So unless an archetype directly allows you to gain life points as part of a gimmick, they're just not super useful effects to have, because they don't directly advance the game state, unless you're playing a deck that specifically uses high life point values to your advantage. Which, there aren't any competitive meta decks that do so and the few in Duel Links which could, were definitely nerfed because they were not intended to. Venom Counters are a mechanic that's only listed on 8 cards in the game. They were part of a small Venom archetype which is most famous for their boss monster being incredibly hard to destroy, and having one of the best forms of protection that a boss monster can possibly have, where it's simultaneously immune to all card effects and untargetable. So, what exactly do Venom Counters do? Well, on their own, Venom Counters don't do anything. There are five cards in the game which are able to place Venom counters on other cards, and in four of them, there is no actual text in their cards that explains what the Venom counter does, other than the fact that it just places a Venom counter in one of your opponent's monsters. So it really allows the Venom counters to actually do something, was with their field spell card called Venom Swamp. Venom Swamp also places Venom counters on cards, and has the effect where, during each player's end phase, you place one Venom counter on every single phase of card in the field, except Venom monsters. Then it has the effect where monsters that have venom counters on them lose 500 attack for every venom counter. And if their attack is brought to zero by the effect of Venom Swamp giving value to the venom counters, then the cards are destroyed. So the intended synergy was to use Venom Swamp in order to slowly lower the attack of all of your opponent's monsters until eventually they were destroyed where their attacks became zero, or until their attack became low enough for you to attack over their monsters. 
And because they thought this mechanic was going to be such a banger of an ability, they made sure all the main deck monsters that avoided Venom Swamp's effects were just absolutely terrible. The three main deck monsters that are able to both avoid the negative effects of Venom Swamp and place Venom counters on your opponent's monsters are Venom Boa, Venom Serpent, and Venom Snake. Venom Snake is a level 3 monster with only 1200 attack, and its effect is that once per turn it can place a Venom counter in one of your opponent's monsters, but it can't attack the turn it activates this effect. Venom Serpent has the same effect, except it has 200 less attack, and can attack the turn it places a Venom counter. And then finally, Venom Boa has the effect to place two Venom counters on one of your opponent's monsters, and also cannot attack the turn it activates its effect. And since Venom Boa was level 5, it's much harder to bring out, and also has incredibly low attack at only 1600. So the intended reason on why all of these cards have such low attack points is because their effects directly lower the attack of your opponent's monsters through the effects of Venom Swamp. And they thought this effect was going to be so powerful that they had to restrict the monsters from being able to attack the turn after they place those super valuable Venom counters on your opponent's monsters, as they are lowering their attack by 500 for each. Plus, your opponent's going to lose another 500 during the end phase when Venom Swamp activates. They also have a spell card called Venom Shot, which allows you to send a reptile-type monster from your deck to the graveyard in order to place two Venom counters on one of your opponent's face-up monsters. And Ambush Fangs, a battle trap which allows you to negate an attack on one of your Venom monsters, end the battle phase, then place one Venom counter on the monster that attacked. So both of these effects are actually not half bad. Being able to send a monster from your deck to the graveyard in order to place two Venom counters is pretty good. Being able to end the entire battle phase and place a counter is technically good. It seems the intended synergy of all of these cards was just to stall out and slowly lower the attack of your opponent's monsters. So, where exactly is the problem in all of this? Well, any deck that requires your opponent to have counters on them is inherently limited in the fact that it requires your opponent to have monsters on their side of the field face up, and for those monsters to actually live for an extended period of time to take advantage of it. It is all too easy for your opponent to ruin your strategy of accumulating counters on their monsters by just using those monsters with counters as materials in order to go into other plays. Especially today with how easy it is to get any monster on your side of the field off of the field and just go into generic link monsters. So, at best, your opponent is only going to have a monster with counters on it for one turn. And you have to immediately take advantage of those counters if you want any kind of benefit from them. Kind of like how Predaplant monsters have a somewhat successful counter system, where one of their boss monsters, Predaplant Dragostopalia, has a quick effect where you can place one Predator counter in one of your opponent's face-up monsters, and then has the effect where a monster that has this counter has its effects negated. So, it places a counter in one of your opponent's monsters to permanently shut down their effects. And it's able to do it as a quick effect, so it's basically a negate that just has a counter attached to it. But outside of cards like Predaplant Dragostopalia, cards which accumulate counters on your opponent's monsters generally don't work out very well unless they're able to make use of them immediately. If you're trying to accumulate a whole bunch of counters on your opponent's monsters in order to slowly kill them through the effects of Venom Swamp, your opponent can counter the strategy by just going into new monsters every turn and just attacking over your very low attack Venom Snake monsters with their brand new monsters that won't have any Venom counters on them. The Venom Snakes are so incredibly vulnerable to just any kind of monsters that their negative effects that prevent them from attacking is almost ironic in how bad it is, because they only get to live long enough to place a counter on them a single time, and their effects are bounced around the notion they're going to live for a long time, constantly accumulating Venom counters on your opponent's monsters. And since the only thing Venom counters do is floodgate attack points, Pretty much all other strategies are free to go in unimpeded. Venoms do have a single counter trap called Snake Deity's Command that does allow them to negate the effects of a spell card, but that's their only form of disruption. I think one of the many reasons they thought Venom counters would be too strong was because of their boss monster, Venominaga, the deity of poisonous snakes. This monster can only be summoned by the effect of Rise of the Snake Deity, and Rise of the Snake Deity is a trap card which can only be activated when you have Venomina and the King of Poisonous Snakes destroyed on your side of the field. So, you have to get a specific level 8 monster on your side of the field, make sure it's only destroyed by a card effect, as it doesn't trigger by battle, make sure you have a specific normal trap card set before all of this happens, and wait a turn before you're able to actually activate that trap card, and then you're able to summon Venomi Naga from your hand or deck. So its summoning requirements are actually incredibly hard to pull off, and what you get for going through all this effort is a boss monster, which gains 500 attack for each reptile in your grave, is immune to card effects and can't be targeted, and if it's destroyed by battle, you can actually special summon itself from the graveyard by banishing another reptile-type monster. And if this card inflicts battle damage to your opponent, it gets to place a Hyper Venom counter on itself, where if it accumulates three, you instantly win the duel. So, if you take Venom support in the context that it was meant to be played around Venominaga, the deity of poisonous snakes, 
you have this basically immune boss monster that is very hard to get rid of and comes back even if it's destroyed by battle. So of course you'd be able to stall it long enough for your opponent to accumulate venom counters through Venom Swamp. The problem is that Venomi Naga is so hard to bring out that a way to consistently use the card is to just not play her in a Venom deck at all. And if you play Venoms without their boss monster, then they just kind of fall flat for how incredibly weak they are because they're balanced around their boss monster hitting the field. So you have a combination of a boss monster that's too hard to bring out and a deck that doesn't do a good job of bringing it out natively. So if you wanted to play a Venom deck and focus on the actual Venom counters themselves, the only real strategy you have is Venom Burn. This is a card that also interacts with Venom counters and it's actually pretty good. You see, Venom Burn has the effect where you can select one monster on the field with Venom counters, remove all the Venom counters from that card, and then inflict 700 points of damage to your opponent for each Venom counter removed. So if you wanted to burn your opponent for over 8,000 points of damage, you would need to remove 12 Venom counters. And since Venom Swamp places a counter on every monster during each end phase, you can accomplish this after six turns of just stalling out. And the best way to stall it with Venom Swamp in Venom Burn is, funnily enough, by just playing zero attack high defense monsters or zero attack immune monsters and not actually using any of the Venom monsters at all. You see, Venom Swamp only destroys monsters if they're brought to zero attack with the effect. But if the monster already has zero attack, then they won't be destroyed and can accumulate Venom counters endlessly. So if you just have a card like Metal Reflect Slime, which is an easy to summon 3000 defense monster with zero attack, and just a whole bunch of spells and traps in order to stall out your opponent or negate their effects, you just have to wait six turns to have enough Venom counters in order to burn your opponent with one Venom burn. Or if you have Arcana Force Zero the Fool, a monster that can't be destroyed by battle and has zero attack, you can do the same thing. Or you can just have a combination of a whole bunch of cards like these two. High defense monsters that are easy to bring out with zero attack. Or just monsters that have some kind of protection with zero attack. And since all you have to do is just wait around a bit for Venom Swamp, which destroys all your opponent's monsters eventually, this is the only way to actually make use of Venom counters. Thanks to Venom Burn actually doing a pretty significant amount of damage per Venom counter removed. And this is because you're accumulating Venom counters on your own monsters which is not how the archetype was meant to be played. The obvious intended synergy of the Venom counters is placing them on your opponent's monsters. That way you can attack over them with your Venom monsters, who have low attack because they're able to lower the attack of your opponent's monsters through the effect of Venom Swamp. But actually, the most successful counter-based decks have always been ones that only place counters on their own monster cards, because it's much easier to control your own field than it is relying on your opponent having a predetermined game state. And even the Venom Burn strategy was never competitive, but was definitely the best way to actually play Venom counters if you were trying to use them in any form of a successful way. Now, here's the funny thing about Venom counters and Venom Swamp. Konami has actually printed more Venom support over the years in a series of very good fusion monsters, but they completely ignore any of the mechanics of the previous Venom monsters and have absolutely nothing to do with them, other than the fact that they're technically immune to the effects of Venom Swamp because they have Venom in their name. So it really goes to show just how hard they drop this archetype when they use the archetype's name without any regard for previous support. So why did Venom counters fail? They relied on your opponent having monsters that would stay around long enough to accumulate Venom counters, the Venom counters didn't actually do enough to stop your opponent, and the actual main deck monsters were too underpowered to take advantage of their gimmick. Plus, just the main things that are inherently bad about all counter mechanics, where all the counters go away if the card is just flipped face down or removed from the field temporarily. Extra linking is a mechanic in Yu-Gi-Oh, which occurs when you have to link a monster from your extra monster zone, co-linked all the way to the other extra monster zone, which means link monsters having the arrows pointing directly at each other. And the only way to actually summon a link monster to the opposite extra monster zone is through the extra linking mechanic. However, for a mechanic that has a specific name and even a keyword, there is only one card in the game which references this mechanic, and that card is currently banned. So there is no legal cards in the game that rewards you for performing an extra link. And in fact, Konami is incredibly afraid of extra linking. Did you know there are no link three or lower monsters which have two upward diagonal pointing arrows? This is because if they released a link two monster that had two diagonal upward pointing arrows, you could perform an extra link with only three monsters. So every link three monster that has these two problematic arrows has a clause in them that says you cannot summon monsters to zones that this card points to. And the cards that do have these two problematic arrows without any summoning drawbacks are exactly one Link 4 that basically banishes any card summoned to its zones anyway, or a Link 5 that is the only one with no restrictions. 
where at that point, Konami decided that if you can get to a Link 5 monster, then you can extra link if you want to. So because of extra linking as a mechanic, there is a complete design blank when it comes to these two arrows. So it makes sense that Konami never actually wanted to reward people for performing an extra link, because it does inherently already reward you by locking your opponent out of being able to use link monsters at all. Ever since its introduction to Yu-Gi-Oh! GX, Crystal Beasts have been a fan favorite archetype, joining the likes of heroes, cyber dragons, and even frogs. But unlike those archetypes, Crystal Beast has never had an opportunity to shine within the competitive metagame, which is why they're the topic of today's video, discussing what's held them back for so long and whether or not their latest support could make them a meta-viable deck. The Crystal Beast monsters are an archetype of monsters whose main gimmick is that whenever they're destroyed by battle, card effect, or other means, instead of sending them to the graveyard, you place them face up in your spell and trap card zone as a continuous spell card. Then, as continuous spells, these Crystal Beast monsters can provide you with a number of benefits. Whether that's a strong effect like with Crystal Beast Rainbow Dragon, free cards that you can summon out with Crystal Beast Ruby Carbuncle, or even just increase the impact of your archetypal spells and traps. All of this is done with the express purpose of summoning out an ultimate crystal monster, an archetype of Rainbow Dragon variants that usually need the Crystal Beast monsters to be used in order to fulfill their summoning conditions. Initially, Rainbow Dragon was the only ultimate crystal monster in the game. But this eventually expanded to include Rainbow Dark Dragon, Rainbow Over Dragon, and Ultimate Crystal Rainbow Dragon Overdrive. Speaking of Rainbow Dark Dragon, Crystal Beasts also have a sister archetype, the Advanced Crystal Beasts. These cards are still technically Crystal Beast monsters, even become continuous spells in the same way, but the Advanced Crystal Beasts revolve specifically around Advanced Dark, a field spell which makes all your Crystal Beast monsters dark so you can actually summon out Rainbow Dark Dragon. So what's the idea behind the Crystal Beasts? In the past, the general idea behind the whole archetype is that you wanted to fill up as many of your spell and trap card zones as possible with as many different Crystal Beast names so that you can reap the most benefits. Because the more Crystal Beast monsters you had in your spell and trap card zone, the more you could benefit from your overpowered spell and trap cards. Rare Value is an archetypal pot of greed, Crystal Abundance is Soul Charge, and Crystal Raigeki and Crystal Conclave serve as great ways to interrupt your opponent. And eventually, if you got enough Crystal Beast monsters in your spell and trap card zone, you can unlock every benefit of Rainbow Ruins, the main Crystal Beast field spell. A battle trick that's also a spell and trap negate that also draws you free cards that also lets you summon out your Crystal Beast monsters from your spell and trap card zone. Then, after swarming the field and filling the grave with enough of your Crystal Beasts, you can then special summon out Rainbow Dragon, a big beater with an impressive 4000 attack that's capable of wiping the entire field with a single effect. However, for a long while, this game plan just didn't do enough to justify playing Crystal Beasts. For starters, Rainbow Dragon is a terrible payoff for the deck, because while it has two great effects, one to wipe the field and the other one to make it gain a ton of attack, you can't activate those effects on the turn that it's special summoned. So after you've spent all the effort putting seven Crystal Beast monsters with different names on your field or graveyard, your best payoff is a 4000 attack beat stick that might as well be a vanilla, since you have to wait an entire turn to be able to use its effects. But the thing is, you were never really summoning Rainbow Dragon anyways because in order to bring it out, you need seven Crystal Beast cards of different names, either on the field or in the graveyard. But out of the original seven Crystal Beast monsters ever released, five of them had terrible effects as monsters that didn't help the deck further its game plan at all, with only Sapphire Pegasus and Ruby Carbuncle having relevant effects. What's worse is that as continuous spells, the original seven Crystal Beasts actually do nothing on their own, and just fill up your spell and trap card zones with virtually no effect, in a similar way to the original Toon World. So even with the absolutely absurd number of busted spell and trap cards the archetype has available to it, it was doomed to be unplayable because most of the actual Crystal Beast monsters were basically just vanillas, both as monsters and as continuous spell cards, which meant you didn't even want to play a big density of Crystal Beast monsters. And this also weakened your Crystal Beast spell and trap cards, since a lot of them require a certain number of Crystal Beasts to be in your spell and trap card zone to be useful, it meant that summoning out Rainbow Dragon would be almost impossible. As a result of this failed playstyle, however, there have been a number of attempts to reinvent Crystal Beasts throughout the years. Rainbow Dark Dragon, for example, attempted to give Crystal Beasts a new payoff with an immediately usable effect, but it was really awkward to use since none of the actual Crystal Beast monsters are dark monsters, so you had to play Advanced Dark if you wanted to summon it. However, with the recently released Structure deck, as well as the deck's most recent support, Crystal Beasts have gone from almost unplayable to a solid rogue option that's capable of taking games against Flunderee, Sprite, and even the Tier 0 tier limits. So let's look at notable cards in the deck and how this strategy has evolved from what it once was to what it is today and discuss why certain Crystal Beast cards have succeeded in making the deck great and why others have failed and how even some of the worst Crystal Beast cards have managed to see use. Let's start off with Rainbow Dragon, Crystal Beast's original boss monster. Rainbow Dragon isn't technically a Crystal Beast card, but is an ultimate crystal monster with its own built-in summoning condition, letting you bring it out to the field if there are seven Crystal Beast monsters of different names on the field or in the graveyard and it can't be summoned in other ways. 
This is an incredibly demanding summoning condition, especially in a deck like Crystal Beast where a lot of the deck's monsters don't have ways of bringing themselves or others to the field, and as a result it's incredibly difficult to swarm the field engraver with enough Crystal Beast in order to bring out Rainbow Dragon. But if you actually manage to summon Rainbow Dragon, you get a 4000 attack beat stick with two really strong effects. Its first effect lets you send Crystal Beast monsters you control to the graveyard at quick effect speed to increase the attack of Rainbow Dragon by 1000 for every Crystal Beast monster you send, which would make Rainbow Dragon an excellent tool for OTKing. And that's not all, because Rainbow Dragon's second effect is even better, allowing you to banish every Crystal Beast monster from your graveyard to shuffle back the entire field into the deck. Now, this includes your own field as well as Rainbow Dragon itself, but this form of non-destruction, non-targeted board wipe is excellent, and a big reason why a card like Zeus sees competitive play. However, while these effects are directly strong, Rainbow Dragon also comes with a heavy restriction which prevents any of its effects from being used on the turn that it's special summoned. This restriction basically removes all Rainbow Dragon's potential utility, and turns it from a hard to bring out but potentially strong payoff into just a high attack beat stick, which meant that it was never worth the effort to bring out. And even when Rainbow Neos was seen competitive play, a fusion monster that requires an ultimate crystal monster as a material, Rainbow Dark Dragon was often the choice of ultimate crystal monster simply because its summoning condition despite being difficult to fulfill, was at least a bit more feasible than Rainbow Dragon. So, because Rainbow Dragon is hard to summon out and has a terrible restriction which kills its playability, you would expect a more modern Crystal Beast deck to have moved away from it and not played at all. However, the modern Crystal Beast support has changed Rainbow Dragon's role, because now, instead of being a bad payoff for an archetype that would rarely summon it, it's now a really integral engine piece that Crystal Beasts now want to play, even if there's no chance of it being summoned. And that's because of two specific cards, Awakening of the Crystal Ultimates and Crystal Beast Rainbow Dragon. Awakening of the Crystal Ultimates needs you to reveal an ultimate crystal monster in your hand if you want to get access to either of its effects. This sounds like a lot to ask because it requires you to play Rainbow Dragon and have it in hand in order to use it, but it's worth the hoops that you jump through because both of its effects are absolutely absurd. If you choose to use the first effect, you can take a Rainbow Bridge card and either add it to your hand or send it to the graveyard. Meanwhile, if you activate its second effect, you get to special summon out any Crystal Beast monster from your hand, deck, graveyard, or spell and trap card zone. And if you happen to control Ultimate Crystal Monster, you actually get to use both. This is unlikely to happen, as even the latest Ultimate Crystal Monsters are hard to summon, but it is a neat little bonus to keep in mind. Its second effect is a great way of swarming the field with your Crystal Beast, since it's pretty much just an emergency teleport for the archetype, and is particularly strong since it lets you use the effect of the Crystal Beast monsters you summon, allowing you to place a free Crystal Beast to your spell and trap card zone with Pegasus, or if your zone's already full, you can use the summon effect of Ruby Carbuncle to swarm the field with a ton of bodies. And because its effect is so good at helping you swarm the field, it gives Crystal Bees much easier access to the extra deck, and is a big part of the reason as to why the deck has a ton of rank 4s and link plays available to them. And its first effect is also astonishing too, because of the sheer variety of options it gives you since you have three incredibly strong targets for it. Rainbow Bridge to get access to your other crystal spells and traps, Rainbow Bridge of the Heart for the same reason and for the free normal summon, or you can choose to send Rainbow Bridge of Salvation to the graveyard. But in order to even activate Awakening, you do still need a way to get Rainbow Dragon to hand so you can reveal it. And the best way of doing that is with another piece of the deck's modern support, Crystal Beast Rainbow Dragon. This version of Rainbow Dragon is not an ultimate crystal monster, so you can't reveal it off of Awakening, but to make up for that, it has a really strong trio of effects. The first is the same as any other Crystal Beast monster, where if it would be destroyed, you can place it in your spell and trap card zone and the second lets you summon it out from your hand whenever an attack is declared involving a Crystal Beast monster. But it's the third effect that really revolutionized Crystal Beast, because unlike the other Crystal Beast monsters, Rainbow Dragon has an effect while it's a continuous spell, which allows you to banish it from your field to special summon any Crystal Beast monster from your deck with its effect negated, and then you must add an ultimate Crystal Monster from your deck to your hand. This effect is really important because like Awakening, it's another way of swarming the field with level 4 bodies that you can use to go into rank 4s, but because the search of ultimate Crystal Monsters is mandatory, you need to have a Rainbow Dragon in your deck to actually use it, so it forces you to play Rainbow Dragon anyways. But because of Awakening, having Rainbow Dragon in hand is now actually just a benefit, since the regular Rainbow Dragon can be used to activate one of your strongest cards. So even though Rainbow Dragon is a terrible payoff that the deck is never going to summon, Modern Support has managed to adapt the card's role in the deck to the point where it's now a really important card that you always want to have either in your hand or in the deck. So while in the past you could definitely call Rainbow Dragon a complete failure, it's actually become one of the most necessary pieces to the engine of the archetype. As well as the original Rainbow Dragon though, the way the original 7 Crystal Beast monsters have seen play has also changed since the deck's inception. Now unfortunately a lot of the original Crystal Beast monsters are still pretty bad, because most of the effects do nothing to aid your game plan and are situational at best. However, even despite this, 4 out of the original 7 Crystal Beast monsters have actually seen recent competitive play, with one of them even being used in tier limits. The most important of the original Crystal Beast monsters in the deck itself, however, is Crystal Beast Sapphire Pegasus. 
Pegasus has the same effect to become a continuous spell like the other Crystal Beast monsters, but its unique effect is actually really good. Because when it's summoned, you get to place any Crystal Beast monster from your hand, deck, or graveyard to your spell and trap card zone as a continuous spell. This effect has always been solid, but it's gotten even better in recent years. Because in the past, you had few good targets to place with Pegasus. Your best hope would be to place a copy of Ruby Carbuncle so you can bring it out and use its Soul Charge effect. Or to just place another copy of Sapphire Pegasus since you didn't really want to play the other Crystal Beast monsters. This didn't do too much for you, but at least let you fill up your spell and trap card zone so you could use your crystal spells and traps. But with the release of Crystal Beast Rainbow Dragon, Sapphire Pegasus' strength has increased exponentially. Because when the Crystal Beast version of Rainbow Dragon is a continuous spell, you get to use this effect to summon out any Crystal Beast monster from your deck and search Rainbow Dragon. This means that Sapphire Pegasus is now a 1 card rank 4, since you can banish Rainbow Dragon after putting into your spell and trap card zone with Pegasus, and then summon out a free level 4 body. This is amazing in the current format, for giving the deck access to cards like Abyss Dweller and Maguska. The other of the original 7 Crystal Beasts that have seen play are Ruby Carbuncle, Cobalt Eagle, and Emerald Tortoise. Ruby Carbuncle has always been a really great part of the deck. Because whenever it's special summoned, you get to special summon as many Crystal Beast cards as possible from your spell and trap card zones, which is why it's always been one of the best Crystal Beast monsters, since it's a great way of swarming the field if you manage to set up your spells and trap card zones with enough monsters. Ruby Carbuncle's role hasn't changed too much, but because there's so many different ways of placing Crystal Beast to your spells and trap card zones, and a ton of different ways to special summon Crystal Beast monsters, it's gotten a lot stronger by proxy. Cobalt Eagle has always been seen some amount of competitive play in Crystal Beast decks, because while its effect isn't the best, it's a good alternative target to summon with Crystal Beast Rainbow Dragon or Awakening because it's a level 4 monster that's Wind Attribute, so you can even summon it under a Barrier Statue. But the strangest of the four Crystal Beast monsters that see play is Crystal Beast Emerald Tortoise, because Emerald Tortoise's unique effect is actually terrible because all it does is change a monster that attacked this turn to defense position. This terrible effect is why it sees zero play in Crystal Beast decks. But even despite that, Emerald Tortoise was, and still is, sometimes used by the best deck of the format, Tier Limits. And that's because of another new piece of support that's become integral to Crystal Beast as a deck, and has even allowed it to see play as an engine. Rainbow Bridge of Salvation is one of the most powerful spell and trap cards Crystal Beasts have access to, even amongst the astonishingly strong spell and trap card lineup it already has. Its on-field effect isn't relevant because it requires two level 10 monsters on field of different types in order to be used. It's actually its graveyard effect which is why it's so strong. Because once per duel, while it's in the graveyard, you can banish Rainbow Bridge of Salvation to add a Crystal Beast monster and any field spell in the game from your deck to your hand. The reason why a deck like Tier Limits wanted to use this effect is because it gave them even more ways to access Primeval Planet Parallel Reno, their incredible field spell that gives them access to a free search, pop, and attack boost. And because they easily mill Salvation at some point during their turn with the effect of Tier Limits or Ishizu monsters, it meant that Salvation became a great way of accessing their field spell. There was just one problem though, because in order to search for a field spell, Salvation must be able to search a Crystal Beast monster as well, and the Crystal Beast monster of choice for Tier Limits was Crystal Beast Emerald Tortoise. Not because of its terrible effect, but because it's an Aqua-type monster. Which meant that instead of just being a dead card in hand or in the graveyard, you can instead use it as a free fusion material for something like Telemann Kid Kalos or Telemann's Kaleida Heart, which made both searches of Salvation actually matter. In Crystal Beast itself, however, Salvation is even stronger, and has completely changed the way Crystal Beasts play the game. Because not only is it a great consistency tool for the deck, which allows you easier access to Sapphire Pegasus, it also lets you search for the strongest generic field spells in the game. This means that instead of searching cards like Rainbow Ruins or Advanced Dark, you can instead search for cards like Necro Valley to shut down any kind of graveyard interaction to completely stop the Tier Limit deck. Or, if you're more worried about Fluent Dereze, could instead search Zombie World to stop them from being able to Tribute Summon. And even against Kashtira, you have Ecoldy Zone available to stop their Kashtira monsters before they have a chance to use their effects. And because it's so easy for Crystal Beast to be able to send Salvation to the graveyard, either with the effect of Awakening or using something like Foolish Burial Goods, it's allowed for the deck to lean into a more control-based playstyle where they can rely on a field spell backed up by a strong rank 4 to flag get your opponent out of the game, rather than just being Rainbow Dragon Turbo. And being a more control-based strategy is actually beneficial for the deck, as that means Crystal Beast get to take advantage of their incredibly powerful spell and trap card lineup. Of course, cards like Rainbow Bridge, Awakening, and Crystal Bonds do wonder for the deck's consistency and give the deck ways to search out its best cards. But even its trap card interruptions are incredibly strong. Crystal Conclave, for example, lets you bounce a Crystal Beast card you control and any card your opponent controls to the hand, letting it serve as an archetype compulse that's capable of dealing with your opponent's combo pieces and boss monsters. Another great trap card interruption the deck has available to it now is Crystal Miracle, an archetypal Omni Gate that protects your floodgates, field spells, and rank 4s from any kind of board breakers, and keeps you in control of the game while also letting you use its graveyard effect to recur even more advantage by placing a Crystal Beast card to your spell and trap card zone making it another good target for Foolish Burial Goods. This control-based playstyle is something that Crystal Beast decks in the past would lean into, occasionally being affectionately referred to as Conclave Control. 
This control-based playstyle has evolved since then, however, due to the number of options that have suddenly become available to the deck. It's honestly impressive how drastically Crystal Beasts have managed to improve since the introduction, as they went from a deck with laughably bad monsters that had little to no use, to even being able to take on Tier 0 tier limits. But in order to get to that point, the deck needed a lot of support, as well as a lot of creative minds behind it to push it to its limits. And instead of being limited by the scope of summoning Rainbow Dragon, or trying to fulfill the condition of Rainbow Ruins, these deck builders managed to make a really interesting or strong control deck that has even managed to see recent YCS tops. So it's not really fair to call Crystal Beast a failed deck. There are definitely a few cards in the Crystal Beast that you can point to and call a failure, such as the Advanced Crystal Beast being terrible cards, the Pendulum Monsters the deck has, or even how bad some of the original Crystal Beasts were. But the cards have a lot going for them as well, both as a deck and even as an engine in certain strategies that are desperate for their field spell. And their newly found ability to easily access rank 4s has made them a boon in the current format, since you can access some of the best monsters in the game to counter the current threats or the meta especially with how consistent the deck is. So now the deck's latently powerful spells and traps can be used to their full potential. And with the up and coming release of Golden Rule, an insanely strong spell card that is another e-teller for the deck that also lets you place two Crystal Beast monsters in your spell trap card zone, the deck is going to get even stronger. And as a result, it's likely that Crystal Beasts aren't going to fizzle out anytime soon, and in fact have proven themselves to be an adaptable, strong, and interesting rogue strategy that will likely still see play even after the two elements leave the meta. Unlike the Advanced Crystal Beast and Advanced Dark, which still have a long way to go before they can be considered viable. In today's video, we're going to be taking a look at some failed card mechanics in the form of some failed cards that never really saw competitive play. First, let's take a look at the card Mother Spider. Mother Spider is a level 6 dark insect type monster, which was released in the same set as Gateway of the Six, Jin, Releaser of Rituals, Archlord Christia, and Level Eater. Now, what does Mother Spider and these other four cards have in common? Well, they were absolutely game-breaking, and all had their moments to shine as centerpieces in competitive meta decks, or currently exist on the ban list for being way too strong. Oh, I'm sorry, that explains four of the cards, not Mother Spider. Mother Spider never saw any competitive play, as what this card does is if you only have insect-type monsters in your graveyard, you can send two face-up defense position monsters your opponent controls to the graveyard to special summon this card from your hand. Now, on surface level, this actually sounds pretty good. It's a plus one in card advantage, as it denies your opponent's two resources in order to special summon a decently high attack monster from your hand. Although, the devil is in the details. Its requirement to use this effect is to only have insect-type monsters in your graveyard, and your opponent needs to have face-up defense position monsters. And its conditions require at least one insect-type monster in your graveyard. You can't get around its condition by not having any monsters in your graveyard. You need to be able to ditch one there first before you can even think about activating its effect. And then you have the effect itself, which requires two of your opponent's monsters to be in defense position. Luckily, Mother Spider was released alongside a small spider sub archetype, which helped it put monsters in defense position with cards like Ground Spider, where if you control this 1500 defense monster in face up defense position, and your opponent normal or special summons a monster, you can change that monster to defense position. Or the field spell card Spiderweb, which basically gives all monsters the goblin attack force downside, where they're chained to defense position after attacking. And then Spider's Lair, which allows you to target an insect type monster you control, which can change monsters it battles to defense position if you decide to crash into something. Oh wait, Spider's Lair wasn't actually released until a year after Mother Spider came out. But they did also have Koaki Mera Beetle, which isn't a spider but is insect support, that was released alongside Mother Spider, which changes light and dark monsters to defense position when they're summoned. And you can see they tried really hard to have defense position support with the release of this card. However, all of the spider cards were just a little bit too incredibly weak. And for some reason they randomly released Spire's Lair a year later, which didn't really help them out very much. Although Mother Spider is just so full of potential, the effect is basically denying your opponent of two resources in order to special summon a card from your hand. It's removal that's conditional to its special summoning, which means it can't be negated. 2300 attack isn't half bad for being able to get rid of two of your opponent's cards. The problem is just something that plagues all cards that revolve around changing monsters to defense position as part of their core gimmick. It requires your opponent to have a game state that you can't control, and requires you to interact with your opponent's monsters in a way that doesn't destroy them, so that you can gain effects through cards like Mother Spider. You could play something like Earthquake to change all of your opponent's cards into defense position, 
Or you could use Raigeki to just get rid of all of them instead. Or Lightning Vortex, as Raigeki was banned at the time of Mother Spider's introduction. Or you could instead just try to get four Light Sworn monsters in your graveyard to blow up the entire field with Judgment Dragon, who was legal and definitely out in the metagame around the same time as Mother Spider's introduction. Basically, the problem with changing monsters to defense position is why go through the trouble of doing that when you can just destroy the cards instead? Or if you're going to play Floodgates whose sole purpose is to change monsters to defense position, like Koakimira Beetle or Ground Spider, why don't you just play something like Archlord Christia or one of the barrier statues to stop your opponent from summoning monsters in the first place? Defense position mechanics are kind of a lesser version of destruction or good floodgating, and is kind of a relic of the early days of Yu-Gi-Oh, which granted Mother Spider was still kind of in the early days. They came out in 2009 during the height of the Synchro era, which was only the first new summoning mechanic added to the game at that point, unless you count Gemini summoning. There's also the problem that Mother Spider requires the cards to be face up. Flipping monsters into face down defense position is honestly pretty good, even in the modern era. Cards like Book of Eclipse and Ultimate Conductor Tyranno have effects to flip all cards in the field face down and absolutely see competitive play. Because face down cards cannot be used as materials for extra deck plays besides fusion monsters, so it's a legitimate way to shut down something while also stopping it from attacking or activating its effects. Because face up monsters can still use their effects, so changing a card to face up defense position only stops them from attacking and not really anything else. If Mother Spider could trigger on face down defense position cards, it would be 10 times better. The fact that they have to be in face up defense position kind of assured it never saw any competitive play. Honestly, if it could target face down cards, I think it might have seen competitive play here or there. A short time after Mother Spider came out, they released a card called Reptilian Vaskii, which is kind of a power creep version of Mother Spider, which came out only three months after, which has the effect on a 2600 attack monster that you can tribute two face up monsters with zero attack from anywhere on the field to special summon this card from your hand, which allows you to use your own monsters or your opponents instead of only just your opponent's cards. And it doesn't have any restrictions about requiring reptiles in your grave, so it can be played in any deck. And even has a respectable effect once it hits the field, where once per turn you can destroy a face-up monster your opponent controls without any kind of restriction on types or targets or anything. It's basically everything Mother Spider wanted to be, and then some. And Reptilian Vashkii actually saw competitive play when Dragon Rulers came out, because it could summon itself off of your opponent's Dracosac tokens, and then just destroy Dracosac itself with its effect. Although even this new and improved Mother Spider didn't stay meta-relevant for very long, and kinda stopped seeing play immediately after the first band wave that hit Dragon Rollers. Although there is a little bit of hope for Mother Spider, it did see some play in Yu-Gi-Oh! Duel Links, a more speedy format of the game that allows you to have 20 cards in your deck. Now, don't get me wrong, Mother Spider wasn't part of any kind of dominant meta deck over there. It only saw play in part of a halfway competent deck that could sometimes win games. You see, Duel Links has his hand trap called Sphere Karibo, which never saw any competitive play in the TCG, but is an absolute staple in Duel Links that has constantly seen play ever since it came out in the first set over there. And all it does is allow you to change a monster who was attacking to defense position by discarding this card from your hand. So this is perfect. With a limited field of only three monsters, Sphere Karibo can stop one third of your opponent's attacks for the turn, which can sometimes be enough to allow you to survive until your next turn and even leaving one of your opponent's monsters on their side of the field in defense position. And I'm sure you can see the synergy it had with Mother Spider. Until you remember that Mother Spider only works with insect-type monsters in your graveyard, and Sphere Karibo is not, in fact, an insect, and enjoys a space in your graveyard after using its effect. So, even in Yu-Gi-Oh! Duel Links, where they have a meta-relevant card that's all about changing monsters in face-down defense position, it wasn't able to catch a break over there. Although, even without being able to use Sphere Karibo, you still can take liberal use of cards like Windstorm of Ed Aqua or Curse of Anubis to stall out a battle phase and flip your opponent's cards to face up defensive position, and then search out Mother Spider with Resonant Insect in order to get rid of your opponent's field, and then swing for game with the 2300 attack beater, which is half of your opponent's life points. Yu-Gi-Oh! Duel Links really is the place for cards like Mother Spider to shine. There are a lot of archetypes and cards that saw heavy use over there which never saw the light of day in the normal TCG. And Mother Spider is not one of them. However, it wasn't half bad if you heavily supplement its effects with good cards, whereas it couldn't compete at all in the TCG. 
So basically, you could have rogue success with Mother Spider during one format in Duel Links, and it never had any kind of rogue success in the TCG. Immunities as a mechanic is kind of going by the wayside. We hit an apex of monsters that were immune to card effects with things like Masterpiece, which only had conditional immunities, and then cards like Ultimate Falcon and Rongo Miniad, which had full immunities. However, towards 2020, Konami started shifting direction, and whenever they wanted a boss monster that was incredibly hard to out, instead of giving it full immunity to card effects, they would give it immunity to activated effects only. Cards like Psychic End Punisher, Underworld Goddess of the Closed World, Cyber Dark End Dragon, and even more recently, Behemoth the King of 100 Battles, simply have immunity to activated effects instead of just all effects. And the reason they've kind of made the shift is because immunities themselves can kind of be considered a felt mechanic. But not because it was bad, quite the contrary, because it was incredibly good. If you could somehow cheat Raid Raptor Ultimate Falcon onto the field, it was akin to a win condition in the olden days, before we had easy access to cards like Axis Skill Talker to beat over it. Because a monster with 3500 attack, which was immune to all card effects, was just simply impossible for some decks to ever out. So you either just had to have some kind of inherent out to the card in your deck already, or you just kind of lost as there was nothing you could do. And this is the same reasoning as to why they banned certain floodgates. Because if you just don't have the out in your deck, then there's nothing you could possibly do to the current board state. They kind of solved this problem by just creating extra deck cards that could destroy these immune cards a lot easier. But they also really liked the effects of cards being immune to card effects. So as a compromise, if they wanted a monster to be nearly unstoppable, they would simply make it so it's immune to activated effects and not all effects. This allows a little bit of leeway in ways to actually get rid of the cards, like how Mira J the Ice Blade Dragon's destruction effect is not an activated effect, it's a lingering effect, so it actually can destroy cards like Psychic and Punisher, but not Ultimate Falcon, who's just straight up immune to all card effects. In Yu-Gi-Oh, there are three standard ways of winning the duel. The most common well known is reducing your opponent's life points to zero, with the second being your opponent surrendering, and the third being a deck out. But as well as the game's main win conditions, there's also a number of alternative win conditions caused by card effects that we're going to explore today, and discuss why they never really took off, and the issues with alternative win conditions as a whole. In order to understand the downsides of alternative win conditions, it's important to realize why Yu-Gi-Oh! standard win conditions are so successful. With the main reason being that every deck in the game is capable of winning by at least one of these conditions. Reducing your opponent's life points to zero is the most common way that you'll see a duel won, and you can do this either with effect or battle damage. And because most decks in the game use monsters in some capacity, either as combo tools or as interruption, it's likely your deck has ways to deal damage. But there are rare decks out there that don't play monsters. A ton of Mystic Mind strategies refuse to play monsters at all, and instead are relying on battle damage, use other options to win. One variant of Mystic Mind uses Cauldron of the Old Man in order to gradually burn your opponent using effect damage, virtually achieving the same win condition as battle damage, just through a different means. But as a going second tool in a non-dedicated mind strategy, Mystic Mind's main win condition is deck out. A condition achieved where a player must draw without having cards in their deck. Assuming you go second, it's likely that your opponent has went through more cards in their deck, so if you activate Mystic Mind and they have no way to out it, you've essentially guaranteed to always have more cards in your deck and can just sit on that mind until your opponent runs out of cards in their deck. But you don't need a Mystic Mind to have a chance of winning by deck out, as during long and grueling games, one player is eventually going to run out of resources. And finally, the last normal win condition is when your opponent surrenders, something they can do at any point regardless of the game state, which is why a lot of match winners like Victory Dragon are pretty bad. What these three ways of winning have in common is that they're all easily achievable since the game has been built around at least one of these three win conditions always being a possibility no matter the state of the game. If you have a monster in your deck, you're going to be able to threaten your opponent's life points with the battle phase. And because deck sizes are limited to a maximum of 60 cards, one player at some point is going to run out of cards in their deck. And the way surrendering works allows either player the opportunity to concede the game and move on to the next one if they feel as if a situation is unwinnable or it will take too much time. In general, these three win conditions have been extremely successful since they form the basis of the entire game mechanics and influence card design as a result. Most decks throughout the game's history have won duels only using these particular win conditions, relying on their consistency and reliability to win games above a more gimmicky alternative. But that begs the question, why are alternative win conditions seen as less consistent and gimmicky? In theory, alternative win conditions are fun ways of changing up the mechanics of a duel for both you and your opponent. When a deck has a way of winning the game through unusual means, the dynamic of the game changes, as it forces your opponent to do whatever they can to prevent you from reaching a particular board state, becoming a game of cat and mouse. 
Certain alternative win conditions can even be used to catch your opponent off guard, and because the opponent's deck is likely built to counter decks going for standard win conditions, they may even fail to have an effective counter in their deck for your strategy, especially given the variance of alternative win conditions. In practice, however, alternative win conditions are often clunky and ill-suited towards competitive play, as actually achieving these win board states is an incredibly difficult task. Purposefully so, as most alternative win conditions have been designed to be difficult or slow to set up to prevent them from being used to FDK your opponent before they have a chance to play. As a result, most of, if not all of Yu-Gi-Oh's alternative win conditions require a very specific and peculiar action to occur, or need multiple turns in order to actually win the game. This makes them inherently awkward to use, as they often require a whole deck built to facilitate them, rather than something that's achieved naturally through normal gameplay like a standard win condition. Currently, most strategies built to facilitate alternative win conditions have to rely on brittle combo lines that are very weak to hand traps, or restricting the opponent with the use of floodgates to stop them from playing the game as much as possible. Exodia is the literal face of alternative win conditions, being the first card in the game which allowed you to win purely by a card effect. This effect was made iconic by the Yu-Gi-Oh! anime, which saw Yugi using Exodia to win what appeared to be an unwinnable duel by drawing the final piece on his last turn. Unfortunately, Exodia decks the TCG, OCG, and Master Duel play very differently to how it was used in the anime. Instead of using the Exodia pieces as secondary options to use just in case, most decks that play Exodia are trying to turbo the pieces to their hand as quickly as possible. This means that these decks are mainly built up of cards that allow them to either search or draw multiple times before your opponent has an opportunity to reduce your life points to zero. This has led to the creation of a number of different Exodia variants. Draw Spell Exodia, usually just known as Exodia, builds the deck exclusively by using draw spells and search cards to get the pieces as fast as possible. In the modern era, there are a number of supplementary engines you can use to play that achieve this goal. The Sky Striker engine, for example, allows you to abuse Engage not being once per turn, and the Bamboo Swords are an engine based around Broken Bamboo Sword and Golden Bamboo Sword to give your deck a free pot of greed. Although in the past, these archetypal engines were quite sparse and so the majority of Exodia decks are built around purely generic draw spells and searchers that are still around in these strategies to this day. Upstart Goblin and One Day Apiece, for example, are excellent choices for draw spells, since you can activate them at any point to keep running through your deck. In older and slower formats, Exodia decks also had access to a number of trap cards to help them draw spells. Reckless Greed and Jar of Greed were great ways to thin your deck during your opponent's turn. All wall cards like Threatening Roar and Wabaku protected your life points, if you even wanted to, as these variants also played Hope for Escape a card which allows you to draw one card for every 2,000 life point difference between you and your opponent, allowing you to realistically draw up to three or even four cards at a time. In 2012, this style of Exodia deck even managed to place top eight in the World Championship, which is incredibly impressive for a deck based solely around an alternative win condition, and technically makes Exodia the best alternative win condition in the game when based on results alone. This variant was fairly strong, especially for its era, as it was capable of playing around some of the best decks of the time like Insectors, a deck that was extremely popular for its ability to wipe fields. And Exodia didn't need to commit a card to the field in order to win, and any card it did commit, like a trap card, could just be flipped face up if your opponent tried to destroy it, meaning that it saw competitive success specifically because of the way it changed how a duel worked and actually fulfilled its goal as an effective win condition. The build essentially formed the blueprint for most modern Exodia strategies, such as Royal Magical Library Exodia, for example. This uses the aforementioned draw spells alongside Royal Magical Library, an effect monster that gains a spell counter each time it's activated, and you can remove three counters from it in order to draw a card. This effect isn't once per turn, and allows you to keep drawing cards, provided you can keep providing it with spells for spell counters. And because every spell in an Exodia strategy is based around replacing itself by drawing a card, your Royal Magical Library will always be supplied with spell counters, basically giving you an extra way of drawing cards for free and ensuring more consistency. There's also Treasure Panda Exodia, which again uses the same DNA as Draw Spell Exodia and Royal Magical Library Exodia, except with Treasure Panda as the star of the show. With Treasure Panda, you can banish any spell trap in your graveyard to summon a normal monster from your deck with the same level as the number of cards you banished. And it just so happens it's not once per turn, a common theme with Exodia strategies, which allows you to keep banishing spells from your graveyard to summon out four or five pieces. And with that, you can use them as link materials for something like Saryuja in order to draw more cards and add them back to your hand with Dark Factory of Mass Production. Treasure Panda also allows for the facilitation of another Exodia strategy, which brings all of the pieces to your field, but uses give and take to special summon true Exodia to your opponent's side of the field, resulting in an alternative loss condition for your opponent. Every one of these versions of Exodia can change the game in the same way. With minimal or low commitment to the field, you can still win the game based purely on your draw engine alone. And because this way of winning doesn't require a battle phase, 
it's possible to do it on your first turn and FDK your opponent, which is something that's more than possible in the modern era thanks to the new and supplementary engines. But it's the modern era which is also these variants' biggest issue. The end boards of decks in 2012 featured cards that Exodia could undercut, and Zectors could destroy boards with the use of Hornet, and Dino Rabbit was only really capable of negating a single spell or trap per turn with Logia. This, combined with the slow nature of the format back then, meant that Exodia had a real chance when going second, as it was likely that at least a part of their engine was going to resolve and get them to Exodia. Or in the case where it didn't, they could rely on surviving a couple of extra turns to draw what they need, even if they didn't have a card like Swiss Scarecrow to protect them with. The modern era, however, has been much less kind to Exodia. More end boards focus on the idea of negation, reaching more boss monsters that are more than capable of interacting with Exodia decks, and the speed of the modern game is much faster, so you get no second chances of dealing with your opponent if you can't FDK them with Exodia. Because of this, a lot of draw spell variants of Exodia and other alternative win conditions reliant on FDKing will not play hand traps or board breakers, virtually necessities for most modern decks as they need every single card in their engine to facilitate their win condition, and drawing a Ghost Ogre or Effect Veiler is going to be virtually useless to them when compared to something like a Broken Bamboo Sword. And this highlights one of the broader issues with alternative win conditions, in that because they change the game for themselves, as well as their opponent, they can also be caught off guard by decks that are just trying to win the game normally. Ash Blossom and Joy Spring and Infinite Impermanence are great examples of this. These two cards are capable of interrupting most decks since they both have so much utility, and as a result see competitive play in every single format. This is an issue for these FDK strategies, as whether you're playing Treasure Panda, Royal Module Library, or even Spellbook Exodia, these cards are still more than capable of putting a stop to your turn, and because they're so prevalent to the modern metagame, it's likely to happen too. Although there are some solutions to this issue. The topping 2012 Exodia list was mainly reliant on draw cards, but it also featured a number of cards included specifically to stop battle damage from being inflicted to the player, namely Swift Scarecrow and Wabaku. These cards are absent in more modern decks, the protection they provided is just too weak and slow for the current era, but the theory behind them is sound. So if there were a collection of cards that were capable of stopping your opponent from achieving a normal win condition, and strong enough for the modern era, you'd have more time to reach your win condition. This is the philosophy as to why a lot of alternative win conditions will choose to play floodgates and can be absolutely integral for certain win conditions which require multiple turns in order to resolve. While there are a lot of Exodia decks these floodgates to their advantage, the alternative win condition that best exemplifies their use is Final Countdown. A normal spell which requires you to pay 2000 life points to activate it, but if it resolves you win the duel after 20 turns have passed. Unlike a lot of other win conditions, Final Countdown must take multiple turns to actually resolve. In theory, this makes the card a terrible choice as it gives your opponent 20 turns to win the duel, which is a lot, especially since most duels in the modern era usually last under 5 turns due to the prevalence of OTK options. However, Final Countdown is arguably one of the best alternative win conditions in the game and is a key choice for Mystic Mind decks. In general, Mystic Mind has always been a great host for win conditions that don't need the battle phase. With a plethora of different win conditions that deviate from the norm, Burn with Cauldron of the Old Man, Deck Out with Runic, and of course Final Countdown Mystic Mind. The reason why it's a popular choice for these strange strategies is just how much Mystic Mind is capable of restricting your opponent's choices. Essentially, if a mine is able to stick to the field while your opponent controls a monster, they're potentially locked out of the game entirely. Your life points are protected since they can't attack you. They can't use monster effects to deal with your mine, nor can they use them to interrupt your win condition. This slows down games to a halt, and allows you multiple turns to fulfill your particular win condition, whether that's completing the destiny board, completing FA winners, or lasting through 20 turns of final countdown. And if your opponent doesn't have an out in their deck, like Cosmic Cyclone or MST, then they've basically lost the duel. There are some win conditions, however, that can't effectively use Mystic Mine, because their particular strategy requires monsters to be set up on the field. Venomi Naga and Exodius the Ultimate Forbidden Lord both require being committed to the field in the battle phase in order to actually win the duel with their win conditions, which means that Mystic Mine isn't really a suitable tool to facilitate them in the same way it does for Exodia in Final Countdown. But there are still a plethora of floodgates which can be used to slow the game down. Rivalry of the Warlords, Goes in Match, and There Can Be Only One are all great options in this case as they all restrict the field in a harsh manner. Rivalry only allows a single type of monster on the field. Goes in match only a single attribute, and there can be only one only allows you to control one monster of each type. Each of these cards is devastating against different kinds of strategies. While Rivalry is terrible versus Flu under Rees, there can be only one destroys it. And while there can be only one does nothing against super quants, Goes in match absolutely decimates them. Like Mystic Mine, these floodgates, when used against the correct deck, immensely slow the game down for both players, especially when paired with each other. This allows you to slowly build up your board to the correct board state to bring Venomi Naga and Exodius to the field, 
and allowed them to both attack multiple times over the course of several turns. Minobi Naga to gain Venom counters, and Exodius to send a piece of Exodia to the graveyard. However, there are two main reasons why alternative win conditions aren't the face of trap decks. The first being that while Floodgates are an absolute boon to all win condition strategies, they're not the best decks that can use them. Eldlich and Guru are both decks which are heavily reliant on Floodgates in the same manner as alternative win conditions would be. Skill Drain, Anti-Spell, and Summon Limit are all common tools in the arsenal of these strategies. The main difference, however, is that these particular engines are much stronger when compared to the main engine of an alternative win condition. The Subterror engine represents a free Omni Negate and a Hand Trap with Subterror Fiendness, and the Eldritch engine is comprised of high attack monsters and traps that are capable of interrupting your opponent through pops and graveyard banishes. They both even have ways to OTK with their engines, too. Meanwhile, the engines in most alternate win conditions don't do anything until they win. In the case where you end up drawing a Conquistador or a Scarlet Sanguine, you're holding a competent piece of an engine that can allow you to navigate your opponent's plays. But in the case where you're drawing a Spirit Message A, it doesn't really do anything to stop your opponent from playing the game. The second reason is due to how easy Floodgates are to out due to the way games are played in the TCG and the OCG. This is less of an issue in Master Duel, where games are best of one, so trap decks have an easier time since they don't have to worry about your opponent's side and back row hate. But games are best of three in the TCG and OCG. This means that while your Mystic Mine or Summon Limit may be capable of letting you resolve an FA winners during game one, it's likely that your opponent is going to have spell and trap removal on their side deck to bring in during games two and three. This is an issue for all Floodgate strategies. But in the case of decks like Eldlich and Guru, they both have ways to recover. Eldlich's traps all have graveyard effects which allow them to set another trap from your deck to replace themselves, and Phoenix's Omni Negate can just negate your opponent's evenly match. When your opponent's playing an alternative win condition, however, your engine doesn't really do anything. Effectively meaning that if your Floodgate is outed, it's basically game over. In essence, if you're using an alternative win condition as your engine instead of something else designed to win the game normally, it's likely you're just playing a worse deck. Final Countdown is a solid option for Mystic Mind decks, but because it takes 2,000 life points to activate it, it's explicitly worse than Cauldron of the Old Man, which can win with its burn damage in half the amount of time. But as strange as it may sound, for a lot of people, winning isn't the main goal behind playing an alternative win condition. This is because of how absurd some of the specifications for alternative win conditions can get. We already discussed how hard it can be to get out 5 specific cards within your hand, or how hard it can be to last 20 turns, but even those conditions seem easy when compared to some of the more bizarre alternative win conditions out there. These strange win conditions are almost universally regarded as terrible, but inspire certain duelists into trying to make them work anyway. The best example of this is no doubt Flying Elephant, which has the most unique win condition out of any card in the game. In order to begin resolving the condition, the opponent needs to attempt to destroy Flying Elephant with a card effect during their turn. And for one time during your opponent's turn, Flying Elephant will protect itself from that destruction. Then, during the opponent's end phase, if Flying Elephant is still in the field, you must apply its effect which unlocks the final part of its win condition, which basically states that during the next turn, if Flying Elephant manages to inflict damage with a direct attack, you win the duel. While Exodia, Final Countdown, and even Destiny Board represent somewhat realistic ways of winning, Flying Elephant is on the opposite end of the spectrum. Being a condition that's so specific to fulfill, you have to jump through a ton of hoops in order to achieve it, making it really impractical for competitive play. But that's precisely what attracts people to the card. It's less of a viable way of winning and more of a challenge to build a deck that can win with it, acting as a test of both creativity and skill, which Yu-Gi-Oh players have a lot of. As for as bad as Flying Elephant's effect is, you can build a deck that can win with its effect, with a large amount of setup, you can give your opponent a Yadro Invader with Geonator Transverser. Yadro Invader is a card with a mandatory effect. It activates when an opponent normal or special summons a monster, and Yadro will move itself one column closer to that monster, and then destroy every card within its own column. By giving Yadro to your opponent, you can use it to force your opponent to attempt to destroy Flying Elephant, since its effect is mandatory, and it can be paired with something like a Neko Main King to immediately make it the end phase so your opponent doesn't build up a board or remove your Flying Elephant from the field. Now, this obviously is not very practical. It's extremely weak to hand traps, requires multiple bricks to function, and falls apart in the face of any competent board when going second. But people still play these strategies for fun. And there's plenty of alt-win conditions, whose specific condition will change how you build your deck, making it so that every kind of win condition brings its own unique challenge, even if a lot of them share the same inherent downsides of being easily interruptible, like Ghost Trick Angel of Mischief. This card has the win condition that occurs when it has 10 or more materials attached to it. This particular win condition isn't absurd for Ghost Tricks to use in theory, especially since Angel of Mischief has an effect to attach a Ghost Trick card to it once per turn, pairing well with the fairly slow Ghost Trick strategy, especially with Ghost Trick Renovation. But there are also decks dedicated to Angel of Mischief, which uses the Utopia and Utopic monsters alongside rank up magic spells to constantly keep ranking up on a monster and transferring its materials before summoning out Angel of Mischief on top of it to win on their first turn. Another good example of this includes Jackpot 7. 
which has a win condition which, like Flying Elephant, can only be triggered by your opponent. When it's sent to the graveyard, specifically by an opponent's card effect, it gets banished, and if three Jackpot 7s are banished by this effect, you win the duel. And normally, this win condition would be difficult to achieve because it solely relies on your opponent milling it from your deck a total of three times. Even if your opponent is playing a mill strategy with something like Morphing Jar, they're likely going to stop milling cards once they see that first Jackpot 7 banished. But creative deck builders have found multiple ways in which they can force your opponent to mill the deck for them by giving them a monster. One of which is with the use of Sheen Spy, one of the worst cards in the game since all it does is give your opponent a free monster from your side of the field for the turn. By giving your opponent Dark Scorpion Burglars, you can summon out a bunch of low attack tokens with Hippo Carnival or Super Hippo Carnival and crash them all into Burglars. Burglars mandatory effect will trigger, which forces you to send a spell card from your deck to the graveyard. And because this is technically an opponent's effect, Jackpot 7 will banish itself, making it a perfect choice to send each time you crash a token. Some win conditions, however, are a lot more simple to set up, such as the only alternative win condition that's currently banned, Last Turn. Last Turn is a normal trap card with an effect that's a ruling's nightmare, but it basically states that you can activate it while your life points are a thousand or less, and when you do, you must select a monster on your side of the field. Then you must send every card in both players' hands in the field to the graveyard, other than your selected monster. Then your opponent gets special summon any monster from the deck in attack position, and then is forced to attack your monster. Whoever has a monster on the field by the end of the battle wins the duel, and any other circumstance results in a draw. Now, technically speaking, last turn is both an alternative win condition and an alternative loss condition, which is pretty bad as there's a chance your opponent will just summon out their highest attack boss monster from the deck and win the duel. In theory, this makes the card an unreliable win condition. But then that begs the question, why is it banned? Likely just because it's a ruling nightmare. But if the monster you choose at last turn prevents your opponent from special summoning, like say Jiaojin the Spiritualist, your opponent will be incapable of summoning a monster. This means that you'll win the duel via last turn's effect since your opponent won't control a monster, and there were actually some decks in 2004 that would purposefully lower the life points to try and trigger last will with Jiaojin face up on the field. All in all, alternative win conditions are a failed mechanic in the competitive sense. It's very rare that they see play in a meta or even a tier strategy because of how specific their conditions are. And even those that are played, like Final Countdown, are more of an option for these decks which have a wide array of better choices. But in terms of a mechanic which adds a fun, unique goal for deck building, the mechanic is actually fairly successful in changing how the game is played. With every alternative win condition being played differently depending on the goal that's being achieved, challenging deck builders to make these win conditions workable. With the way the modern metagame works though, it's unlikely that alternative win conditions as they are now are going to be stored with the meta anytime soon. But if a card which was released that had a win condition that was a lot less specific and more easily achievable, it's possible that it may be a good option for certain decks. It's probably a good thing for the moment that alt win conditions aren't seeing too much play though, since if there was an easily achievable win condition, it may just result in constantly getting FTK'd by it whenever you go second. Equip spells are one of the base types of cards in the games, where there's rules in the rulebook to explain how they function, so you don't have to explain it in every single card, but that you activate them by targeting something you control in order to equip them to. And they also have the rulings where they go to the graveyard if the thing they're attached to was no longer on the field or face up. And historically, equip cards have been one of the worst types of cards in the game, despite the fact that they're spell cards that can be activated immediately and generally fail at the main purpose that you think they might serve, i.e. boosting a monster's battle power or effectiveness in some way. There are two cards that really illustrate this point, Grid Rod and UA Power Jersey. Grid Rod is a card that can only be equipped to a Cybers monster, where it gives that monster 300 attack, makes it so once per turn it cannot be destroyed by battle, and gives it full immunity to all of your opponent's card effects. Additionally, it has an effect where if it's destroyed and sent to the graveyard, the Cybers monsters you control cannot be destroyed by battle or card effects until the end of the turn. Now, this equip card literally gives a monster the best form of protection you could possibly ask for. Full immunity to all card effects. There are some cards that see competitive play purely because they have the ability to be immune to card effects. Like Raid Raptor Ultimate Falcon or Psychic End Punisher, which has restrictions on how it gains its immunity. And Grid Rod just grants immunity to any Cybers monster it's equipped to, while also giving it other benefits like a small attack boost and protection against the biggest threat to immune monsters, i.e. being destroyed by battle, as it protects them from one such destruction per turn. And there's no downsides in the card either, and you don't have to pay maintenance costs, it doesn't negate the effects of the monster it's equipped to, it just straight up gives the monster the best kind of protection in the game. And this may not surprise anyone who's played Yu-Gi-Oh to hear this, but this card sees absolutely no competitive play and isn't even considered a halfway decent card. We also have another banger like UA Power Jersey. It can only be equipped to a UA monster and grants an additional 1000 attack and defense, which is a premium stat line to be granted from an equipped spell card, 
as Old Gold Staples like Axe of Despair had that sole effect of granting that kind of attack point value. It also doubles all battle damage your opponent takes, and if the monster is equipped to destroy the monster by battle, it can make a second attack during the battle phase. So, if you equip it to a monster like you a Mighty Slugger, which makes it so your opponent can't activate any cards or effects when it attacks, and then you boost its attack even further with just UA Playmaker, you can very easily attack over any of your opponent's monsters, then attack directly for 8200 points of damage. UA Power Jersey is an absolutely broken and overpowered buff style equip spell that allows you to push for a massive amount of damage, in an archetype that's all about battling and boosting up your cards in the battle phase in order to do things, and even has its own built-in negate to allow their effects to go through in the form of UA Perfect Ace. And just like Gridrod, it shouldn't surprise any longtime Yu-Gi-Oh players to hear that this card sees absolutely no competitive play, and isn't even considered a good card within its archetype. There are four cards in the game that allow you to generically search out any equip spell from your deck. Hidden Armory, which allows you to search any equip spell by sending the top card of your deck to the graveyard and giving up your normal summon. Armory Call, which allows you to search any equip spell from your deck and either add it to your hand or equip it to a monster on the field immediately. Gear Breed, which allows you to search any equip spell from your deck during your draw phase instead of doing your normal draw. And even Toolbox, which allows you to once per turn reveal two equip cards with different names from your deck and randomly add one of them to your hand, which is just a pure plus one in card advantage every turn. And there's even Violon Cube, which can search out any equip spell from your deck if it's used for the Synchro Summon of a Light Monster, which it has been used quite often in the past in order to search out key equip spells. And I can tell you for sure that there are no other base types of cards in the game that have this much generic searchable support. And none of these cards really see competitive play very often. If there was a card like Gear Breed for continuous spell cards, it would be absolutely broken. If there was a toolbox for field spell cards, that would be broken. If there was an armory call to just search out trap cards in the same way it starts out equip spells, that would also be really broken. And in fact, there is a card similar to this one with a whole bunch of restrictions called Trap Trick. So how can we have absolutely broken cards like Grid Rod and UA Power Jersey in the game, and yet not only does nobody use them, but nobody considers either of them a problem in the slightest? And how can we have so many cards that can generically search out any equip spell from your deck, which are also not seen as a problem in the slightest, as none of them are hit on the ban list in any way? That's because equip spells are so inherently flawed in their design that they need to do something ridiculously special in order to see any kind of competitive play. And the main purpose of buffing of a monster in some way is not special enough most of the time. You see, if we take a card like Gridrod and try to explain why it doesn't see competitive play, we have to first kind of explain how modern Yu-Gi-Oh works. Usually, with modern Yu-Gi-Oh, you have five cards in your opening hand. And of those, you need some of them to be hand traps in order to not absolutely get blown out by your opponent. Or you need some of those to be going second staples, or equalizers, as some people like to call them, in order to help equalize your opponent's board so you can actually get your plays through. So your hand is already occupied by a couple of staple cards. For this example, we'll say it's at least two of them. Then your other three cards, you have your actual combo pieces. And if you're trying to build an unbreakable board of monsters, you kind of want all of those cards to be able to independently do something amazing. Or if you have an archetype that is very synergistic with each other and needs other cards within its archetypes to do its plays, like Virtual Worlds for example, then you can't really afford to play anything else. But if you're in a special position where you're playing an archetype that doesn't really need many cards from its archetypes in order to accomplish its combos, and you already have an amount of hand traps and going second cards you want, in that case you could play equipped spell buff cards, that might just break your hand with unusable cards that could have been better spent on hand traps or more going second cards, or cards from your actual main combo. So unless your main combo specifically allows you to cheat out the use of spell cards, like Infernobles or Power Tool, then there's no real point in playing them when you could instead play more hand traps or just more cards from the archetype in order to get your plays actually going. Because a lot of strategies are stopped by your opponent's hand traps or equalizer cards. So you don't really have the luxury of playing cards that can buff your monsters, when you're fighting so hard to just get them on the field in the first place. And then, once you do have your monsters in the field, and you're in a stable position because you're able to stop your opponent from building an unbreakable board of monsters, and you finally have gotten some kind of a quote spell card on your monster, like maybe you got you a Mighty Slugger on the field and you could with you a Power Jersey, your opponent can just destroy the card by temporarily removing Mighty Slugger from the field with something like number 70, Malevolent Sin, or simply flipping it face down with something like Book of Moon, Flunder Rees of the Dreaming Town, or Ultimate Conductor Tyranno. You don't even have to destroy any of the monsters involved in these quip cards, because they'll destroy themselves if you use pretty much any form of temporary removal on the monster, or simply flip it face down. And that's not even mentioned the fact that the card is also vulnerable in the spell and trap card zone to things like Twin Twisters, Lightning Storm, or Nightmare Phoenix. Equip spells have a double weakness, the monster they're equipped to being removed in any way, 
even one that might not be a permanent removal of the monster from the field, and of course all spell and trap card removal. So because equip spell cards stop working if you so much as breathe on them with any form of disruption, you can kind of print whatever effects you want on them and nobody will use them, like they kinda did with U8 Power Jersey and Gridrock. However, even with all of these inherent design flaws with equipped spell cards, there are currently four of them that are banned, and there are even some equipped spell cards that see competitive play too. So, what exactly is the difference between the very few that actually see play, and the vast majority of them that never do? Well, it's pretty simple. The equipped spells that see play, see play precisely because they use the fact that they're equipped spell cards as a downside to the card, in order to have an immediate impact on the field. Cards like Snatch Steel just allow you to steal one of your opponent's monsters and is banned because it's a pure plus one in card advantage, and it being vulnerable to normal equip spell card shenanigans is part of its downside. Cards like Falling Down and Comic Hand have similar effects, but are more balanced because they require you to have other cards visible on the field in order for them to work, in addition to them being equip spell cards. Butterfly Dagger Alma is banned because it has the ability to infinitely come back to your hand if it's destroyed in the field, and has nothing to do with its effect to give a monster 300 attack. Premature Burial is banned because it can special summon monster from your graveyard on a non-once per turn effect, which is both easy to loop with self-bouncing cards like Zephros, and is actually a bit strong with all the generic equip spell searchers that I talked about earlier, although it's mainly banned because of the ability to be looped. In the same way the lesser powered version called DDR Different Dimension Reincarnation is actually used in a lot of combos, because it allows you to special summon a banished monster by discarding one card from your hand. Even though it's an actual minus one in card advantage to use, the fact that it can be looped because it's not a hard once per turn is why it's seen a whole bunch of play. And it doesn't actually have any benefits to the monster it's equipped to, as its equip spell status is used as a downside for the powerful effect of special summoning a monster. Which is kind of funny that some of the best equip spell cards in the game that see competitive play are only equip spell cards because it's such a downside of being an equip spell card. Speaking of cards that were designed around the detriment of being an equip spell card, we have Smoke Grenade of the Thief. This card only has an effect if it's destroyed by a card effect while equipped to a monster, where it allows you to look at your opponent's hand and discard one card from it. This is a very powerful effect, but it can only activate if it's destroyed by a card effect and not by its own procedure. So if the monster's equipped to is removed from the field temporarily and it destroys itself, that will not proc its effect. I'm pretty sure you can see a pattern where a lot of the best equip spell cards in the game only exist as equip spell cards because it's such a huge downside to the card's strong effect. However, there are some cards that have seen play as equipped spell cards for the purpose of being equipped spell cards that buff a monster. We have Mage Power and United We Stand. Both of these cards saw play in early Yu-Gi-Oh! because they have such a huge attack boost to a monster for one card, back in a format where having big beat sticks was actually viable. Although Yu-Gi-Oh! quickly moved into a more combo-heavy format, and those two cards fell out of favor rather quickly. And it's almost surprising to hear that some of them actually appeared on the ban list in some way, shape, or form, because they don't see any competitive play nowadays. There is, however, one card that still sees competitive play every now and then that does have the benefit of buffing the monsters it's equipped to, and that's the Moon Mirror Shield. This card, when equipped to a monster, makes it so that whenever it battles another monster, its attack and defense will always become 100 higher than whatever it's battling. And if this equipped card is sent from the field to the graveyard, you can pay 500 points to either put it on the top or bottom of your deck. And unlike Smug Grenade of the Thief, this effect can activate even if it's sent under its own procedure, i.e. the monster it's equipped to being breathed upon by any form of disruption. So Moon Mirror Shield allows you to attack over any monster essentially, and also allows you to protect a monster almost indefinitely from being destroyed by battle, will also allow you to recur the card every turn at the cost of getting up your normal draw by itself. So Moon Mirror Shield is actually really good, and usually played alongside stun decks that are trying to stop your opponent from being able to do anything in order to protect cards like Barrier Statues or Inspector Border. So it seems with Moon Mirror Shield, Konami has figured out the inherent problem with the quote spell cards that give buffs. They need to have some form of self-recursion in order to account for the downsides they incur. But they can't have too good of a recursion like Butterfly Dagger Elma did, otherwise they'll just be used for infinite loops. So when Konami designs archetypes built around equipped spell cards like the Noble Knights, they generally build all of the equipped spell cards with some kind of built-in recursion ability, to try and counteract just how inherently flawed the code spell cards are that are trying to be used as actual buffs. Although there is a modern archetype that uses equipped spell cards as their main gimmick and actually sees a ton of competitive play in all kinds of different decks. I think it's kind of ingenious how they're able to solve a lot of the problems inherent to equipped spell cards within its archetype. And that archetype, of course, is the Adventure Token engine. You see, the Adventure Token is a 2000 attack token, which upon being created by Rite of Armasir, allows you to search out a card that searches out all of its equip spell cards basically for free from your deck during each player's turn. And then the equip spell cards themselves, like Draco Back the Rideable Dragon, 
have effects where if they're sent to the graveyard in any way, you can equip them from your graveyard to an adventure token you control once per turn. And the reason it's such a genius idea to have them equipped to a token is because tokens both cannot be flipped face down at all and are thus immune to cards like Book of Moon and also just straight up disappear if they're removed from the field temporarily or just cannot be removed from the field temporarily in some ways as tokens are immune to the effects of cards like Evenly Match since they cannot exist banished face down. And the last thing that makes all of this come together is the fact that tokens are generally created at a surplus in card advantage. You see, one of the big problems with equip spell cards is that you get a 2 for 1 in card advantage if you're able to destroy a monster that has an equip spell card on it. Where normally a fissure would be a 1 for 1 trade, it becomes a 2 for 1 trade if you're able to get an equip spell card out of the exchange, usually netting whoever destroyed the monster with the equip spell card a plus 1 in card advantage. So, if a token summoned at a plus 1 in card advantage instead, like the adventure token engine is, and it has a whole bunch of inherent protection for being a token, then when the token is finally removed from the field, you are still getting a 2 for 1 in most cases, but since it was brought into existence as a plus 1 in card advantage, it definitely evens out the detriments incredibly. And the problem with having a monster equipped with a whole bunch of equip cards is that you have to expend resources to get a monster on the field, and it's really hard for them to exist at a surplus in card advantage without giving that card some kind of generic surge or draw effect. Whereas if you just have a card summon a token and give you a bunch of other benefits, that kind of solves the problem of creating a generically strong monster to be equipped with a whole bunch of stuff, which can simply just have its effects negated and then flip face down anyway. And even then, the adventure token only really uses a single eco spell card, and only because it has an effect that immediately impacts the board as soon as you use it, since it allows you to bounce any card your opponent controls. So even in the adventure engine, which kind of solved a lot of the problems with equip spell cards, they still don't use their equip spell cards to buff their tokens, and almost exclusively just use Draco back. So how could they fix equip spell cards to make them better? Well, if we look over at Magic the Gathering, the way they do equip spells is a little bit different than Yu-Gi-Oh. You see, in Magic, equip spell cards basically exist as cards that you put onto the field, then you pay an additional cost in order to equip them to a monster you control. And while they're equipped to a monster, you can pay its cost in order to equip them to something else. And the most important part, when the monster is equipped to is destroyed or removed from the field in any way, the equip card simply goes back to the field and is ready to equip to something else as long as you pay its cost again. So there is a detriment to a card being temporarily removed from the field, but it's not the absolute end of the world as you can just equip it again. So if equip cards in Yu-Gi-Oh worked in a similar fashion, where they basically activate like continuous spell cards and then could simply choose to give their benefits to a monster for as long as you wanted and exist as its own separate entity, this could really go a long way to making them a lot more viable as actual buff sticks. Because if the monster it's equipped to goes to the graveyard, you can simply choose another target on your next turn. Then the only way to get rid of them would be with spell and trap card removal instead of also monster removal. Of course, current equip spell cards are not inherently balanced to work this way at all. So it would really break the game if they implemented a rule change that made them work like this. But it would get rid of one of their biggest weaknesses of being attached to a monster so absolutely thoroughly. So. Why are Eco Spell cards a failed mechanic? Because they're vulnerable to all forms of destruction in the game, and the ability to simply buff a singular monster is not strong enough in a game that's focused around one card super combos. And additionally, because they are so incredibly vulnerable, Konami is perfectly fine printing very strong effects on them because their downside is the fact that they are an equip spell card. You know a mechanic is bad when being part of the mechanic is considered a detriment to your effect. Mystical Rep Panel is a trap card, which has the effect to redirect the effects of a spell card that targets one player to another player. This is the only card in the game that's able to change the target of a card from a player to another one, and for good reason. Yu-Gi-Oh cards do not designate which players they target. In Magic the Gathering, it's very common for these cards to designate which players they're targeting. And because of this, it's possible to have a four-way game, and not be confused about which cards affects which players because every card by default says that you have to target a player in order to use player targeting effects. But Yu-Gi-Oh! doesn't have this inherent distinction, but there are cards that do target specific players, like Cold Feet for example. Cold Feet has the effect that says you cannot activate set or use the effects of any spell or trap cards until the end of the turn. Emphasis on you as in the person activating the card. Now with modern problem solving card text, which always designates a target when it targets something, it's kind of weird that this card technically targets a player without saying it does. And Cold Feet is absolutely a target for Mystical Rep Panel. You can use Cold Feet during your opponent's turn, then chain Mystical Rep Panel in order to redirect the effect to your opponent, 
in order to lock them out of spell and trap cards for the rest of the turn. However, in order to know this interaction works, you basically have to look up rulings beforehand, because there are a lot of cards that do work under Miskora Panel that you wouldn't think work under Miskora Panel, because again, the cards don't designate that they target people, even though some of them technically can't. In fact, there's a huge list online that details all the cards that are usable under Miskora Panel, and even a list of cards that seem like they could be usable under Miskora Panel, but technically don't work, like that Grasslick Screener, which they have a list of because of official rulings specifically saying they don't work with the card. There are so many ruling confusions because of this one card, specifically because it was created to copy Magic the Gathering cards that I bet Konami probably wishes they could just delete it from the game. Or at the very least, just state on cards that they target a player so we can have four player duels like they do over in Magic the Gathering. During the early Xyz era, Konami introduced a small series of cards that focus on a self-banished playstyle. The Generation Fish, or Bandy Sharks, were a group of fish, sea serpent, and aqua monsters tied together by the set they were released in and their effects. In this video, we'll be delving into why this strategy failed to stand on its own when it came to competitive Yu-Gi-Oh! The Fish, Sea Serpent, and Aqua types are often grouped together when it comes to generic support. These three mirror the Beast, the Beast Warrior, and Winged Beast trifecta, but for sea creatures. The idea of having cards that let your monsters banish themselves temporarily actually predates a Generation Fish by a few cents. Forgotten Temple of the Deep lets you, once per turn, banish a level 4 lower monster you control from the super type until the end phase. The flavor behind this kind of effect is that your sea monsters are hiding in the depths before emerging later. However, the concept wouldn't get expanded on until the start of the Xyz era. Generation Force was a set that brought many changes to the game, including the introduction of Xyz monsters, the newest extra deck mechanic at the time. It was also the first set to implement some really important changes to how card text worked in Yu-Gi-Oh! Problem solving card text meant that from now on, remove from play would be referred to as banish instead. This change was probably why Konami decided to highlight the new support introduced in Generation Force to introduce the player base at large to the new term. Generation Fish was actually the name Konami used to talk about it in their pre-release coverage. It wasn't a fan-made term. Now, let's go over the initial pieces of support for this series. Fly Fang is a level 3 wind fish monster with 1600 attack. It has the effect to inflict piercing battle damage, and if it does, it banishes itself at the end of the battle phase until your next standby phase. Its Sea Serpent counterpart is Sky Star Ray, who shares the same attribute and level and only has 600 attack. But to make up for it, it can attack directly, but banishes itself just like Sky Fang. These two introduce the theme of Generation Fish pretty well. Cards that can easily banish themselves of their effects. Unfortunately, these mediocre battle-related effects were never really something that saw play in the first place. At the very least, these two are a bit better than Big Jaws, which is just a 1800 beater, but if it attacks, it banishes itself and never comes back. Ultimately, this series' best beater was similarly bad, Spearfish Soldier, a level 4 wind sea serpent with 1700 attack that got a whopping 100 attack for each of your banished fish, sea serpent, and aqua type monsters. Next up, we have Air Orca. This is a level 3 wind sea serpent monster which can, once per turn, banish a fish, sea serpent, or aqua monster from your hand to destroy a face of card your opponent controls, and then it banishes itself into your next standby phase. Air Orca has by far the most proactive effect out of all the generation fish making it one of the best members of the archetype. The flexibility of removing either annoying monsters or face-up spells and traps for potentially multiple turns even led this card to see a little bit of competitive play. Mermel decks sometimes cited in a copy of this card depending on the matchup, since it was easily accessible through either Atlantean Dragoons or Deep Sea Diva due to being a Sea Serpent. Mermel decks were a huge competitive threat for many years to the Xyz era, but this card only saw play sparingly in very early variants as a one-of tech. If the rest of the archetype had more cards which impacted the board like this, maybe they could have seen an even bigger splash in decks like Mermail throughout the years. As the last of the level 3 monsters, we have Winged Tortoise, a level 3 Wind Aqua that can special summon itself from your hand or graveyard when a face-up fish, sea serpent, or aqua type monster you control is banished. Winged Tortoise actually packs a really potent combination of effects. It's a non-once-per-turn revival which works from either hand or graveyard, and doesn't even banish itself after leaving the field if summoned this way which is usually a downside a lot of similar cards have in order to not allow you to infinitely reuse these effects. As a deck's soul extender, Wing Tortoise was supposed to enable rank 3 plays for days by special summoning itself for free, but unfortunately, since your other monster is gone until your next standby phase, all it does is maybe give you an attack blocker every turn. To make matters worse, since it's a when you can effect, that means you can't trigger two Wing Tortoises at once even if you have access to them in your hand or graveyard. This card missing timing also means it'll miss timing when being used with most other cards outside of Generation Fish ones, killing any splash ability it might have had as a non-once-per-turn special summon from the grave. Winged Tortoise has the potential to be one of the most broken self-revival cards in the game, and yet probably nobody's ever heard of it. Now we get to the one high-level monster that came alongside them. Sea Lancer is a level 5 Beast Warrior monster with 1300 attack. 
Once, while phase up on the field, this card can target any number of your banished fish, sea serpent, and aqua monsters, and then equips all of them to itself. It gains 1,000 attack while equipped, no matter how many equips it has attached, and can destroy its equips to protect itself from destruction by battle or card effects. Sea Lancer was actually a quite decent tribute summon monster for the time, and the one part of the archetype which was a TCG exclusive for quite some time. Within its archetype, Sea Lancer, at best, is a 2300 meter, but usually you wouldn't want to proc its effect on most of your banished monsters, as it's just going to prevent them from coming back to the field. However, this monster saw a decent amount of play as a Monarch replacement in Frog decks. The Frog engine gives you easy tribute fodder to bring it out, with Swap Frog being able to dump Treeborn Frog from the deck to the graveyard, which comes back every standby phase for free. Additionally, you could easily get banished Aqua Monsters for Sea Lancer to equip with a Ronin Toten, which can banish Frog Monster from your graveyard to special summon itself from the graveyard. The last bit of synergy was that Dupe Frog and Poison Draw Frog were amazing to equip to Sea Lancer, since their floating effects all trigger when this card destroys them to protect itself, letting you get easy frog searches and draws off of it. Lancer Frog wasn't the most competitive deck you could play, specifically as the game sped up more and more, but it was a very valid rogue option for several years. Now we get the supposed payoff for all the fish banished monsters. Submersible Carrier Aerial Shark. This is a water fish rank 3 XCs with 1900 attack, which can, once per turn, detach a material to inflict 100 damage to your opponent for each of your banished monsters. A really minor burn payoff seems to go alongside failed cards and mechanics very often, and this is no exception. At the rate which a dedicated generation fish deck could banish cards, you could maybe get this card to burn for a whopping 500 damage if you ever get really deep into a duel. That is, if you ever manage to summon this thing in the first place. With all that said, this card did see a little bit of play in Dino Rabbit decks, just to have it as an option of a tour guide. Though that was more because the rank 3 pool was quite limited back then, and even then most builds did not run it, as you were better off just running an extra copy of actually good rank 3s. And last, we have Levier the Sea Dragon. A Wind Aqua rank 3, which can, once per turn, detach material to special summon a banished level 4 lower monster to your field. Levier was the best card this archetype was ever graced with. It saw play in countless decks throughout the years, and still is one of the best rank 3s in the game to this day. Any deck that can get a couple level 3s onto the field has probably considered this card. While the strategies which played this card are far too many to list, it was notably a stable in Infernity, Burning Abyss, and Phantom Knight decks. And it's only gotten better at time, as recently this card became a very good way to climb into number of zero utopic Draco Future, which lets you negate and take control of an opponent's monster when it activates an effect. Most people probably aren't even aware that Generation Fish is a thing, but they certainly know about Levier due to how big of a staple it's been in the game for years. And that's one of the best things about this card. It is entirely generic as a pretty good extender and recovery tool. With all that said, it does have a pretty cool synergy with Air Orca, in that it lets you either use its removal effect twice in the same turn, or to get back the monster you banished with it to your field, but that's not nearly enough to carry it on its own. When it comes to the spell trap support, first off we have Fish and Kicks. This is a normal spell which lets you target and banish a card in the field, but only if you have three or more banished fish, sea serpent, or aqua type monsters. While targeting banish is a pretty good effect, especially at the time, Fish and Kicks activation condition made it far too awkward for it to see any play ever. Even in decks that could conceivably get three monsters of these types of banish, you'd be much better off writing generic removal that was generally more versatile. This card is followed by Fish and Swaps, that lets you discard a card to add two of your banished Fish, Sea Serpent, and Aquatype monsters back to the hand. This piece of support has too high of a cost and activation condition to be used generically, since Salvage fits the role this card wants to execute, but much better in every way. For the Generation Fish, this card does nothing as they generally want to stay banished to come back during your next standby phase, and they all take your normal summon except for Wing Tortoise, which doesn't banish itself anyways. For the traps, we have Underworld A Clutch, a normal trap which you can activate when a face-up fish, sea serpent, or aquatype monster is banished, and it lets you add one level 4 lower monster of those types from your deck to your hand. While being able to add monsters of the three different types of your deck to your hand is a pretty good effect, consistency traps have never been that good to play, even back in the day. Having to wait until your next turn comes around to be able to trigger this is never where you want to be, especially when other strategies get searchable, easier ways to get into their engine. A Clutch is more generic than these options and what it can add, but it's not like you'd be able to trigger it easily in any other deck. Fish Rain packs the same activation requirement, but special summons a level 3 lower monster of the super type from your hand instead. This one is just completely unusable. A negative one in card advantage, which not only requires you to have a way to get a fish banished on the field, but also another card in your hand to bring out. What's really unfortunate is that this was actually the latest piece of support which came out for the strategy before the concept was dropped entirely. And lastly, we have O Fish. A counter trap which you can use in response to a monster's effect activation and lets you shuffle one of your banished fish, sea serpent, or aquatype monsters back into the deck to negate the activation and destroy the card. This card is by far the best out of all of the spell and traps that the series got, and while ended up not seeing any competitive play, it was very similar to cards that did. 
Gladiator Beast War Chariot, which is also a counter trap that negates a monster effect, was one of the main reasons why that archetype was playable for as long as they were. Fraud decks could get Aqua Monsters banished really easily thanks to Ronin Toten, and shuffling them back into the deck is actually a benefit since it gives you more frogs to dump off of Swap Frog. Unfortunately though, unlike the Gladiator Beast Trap though, this card wasn't searchable or recyclable by any easy means. It did have a little bit of engine synergy with the frogs, as well as an easy setup, but that still made it less desirable than other generic traps that fulfilled kind of the same role anyways, without even getting to the fact that frog decks didn't want to run many traps in the first place due to Treeborn Frog needing to control no spell trap cards in the field to use its effect. And then, only better generic options have come out since then, making sure this card will never get an opportunity to see play again. So, in the end, despite having a few promising cards and even a couple that have seen play in other decks, the Generation Fish were nothing more than a very casual strategy throughout the years. One of this series' main features, monsters tagging themselves out, has actually been seen on tons of very competitive cards throughout the years. However, unlike something like a Stardust Dragon, which comes back to the field after using its destruction negation effect, the Bandy Sharks did so after getting their really mediocre effects off instead. There was actually a deck centered entirely around monsters which could banish themselves from the field and come back later, called Chainbeam. But what made these cards powerful, despite not being as much of a threat on the board as Stardust Dragon would, was that they could tag themselves out at almost any point, letting you dodge all kinds of removal with them. Even before that, Strike Ninja sometimes saw playing decks that played Dad due to its quick effect banish itself until the end phase as a recurring threat that can also manipulate the Dark Count in your graveyard as a bonus. In more modern times, Time Thief Redoer is still one of the best rank 4s in the game, and it has the ability to tag itself out just like Wind Up Rabbit, which makes him a huge threat in simplified game states, as well as having a couple of bonus effects. The Generation Fish lose out on almost all of the benefits of this mechanic, as even the best one can only do it during your main phase as a spell speed 1 effect. These cards were all meant to work together in a deck that centered around fish monsters banishing themselves, but even their best payoff for it, Wing Tortoise, barely did anything. On the years that followed, Konami would go on to release archetypes that plussed off of getting monsters banished instead of having that be their main effect. We got Dragon Rulers from that very concept, and later on we get Thunder Dragons as an example of what good decks that want to banish their monsters must have. However, despite having been such a failure in what they tried to do, the Generation Fish actually had a decent impact on Konami's card design, at least in the West. Abyss Keeper was a TCG exclusive Link 2 release recently, which can banish another fish monster you control and a card your opponent controls. This card would give us a small taste of the new TCG exclusive archetype, which would come out in the following year, Goaty. The Goaty are in many ways a modern reimagining of the Generation Fish, has a whole archetype made out of fish that can banish each other and then come back during your opponent's standby phases. However, this archetype was given an actual payoff, being able to synchro at quick effect speed to go into their boss monsters and interrupt your opponent's plays. However, even with the benefit of being a proper archetype with access to much better generic support or not, the Goatee are looking like they will be as competitively relevant as the Generation Fish were, even with their newest cards. It may be that in the end, this kind of playstyle was doomed to never be relevant in Yu-Gi-Oh's history. With both the new and old, we have a decent concept that despite having a couple of good cards, it's just too clunky and not explosive enough to ever be relevant in any metagame. Next is a spell card which has the effect to send a neo spacey monster you control to the graveyard in order to special summon a level 4 monster that has the exact same name as that monster from your extra deck. And this has got to be one of the worst fusion mechanics that we have in the game. Now, in order to explain why this is so bad, let's first explain every single card that's part of the small little sub archetype. Next is supposed to be support for the Neospatians, which is a series of 6 level 3 monsters that all have a fusion with Elmodero Neos, and they were all kind of infamous for being terrible in their time period, because natively you were supposed to contact fusion in order to bring out their fusion monsters, which required you to put a whole bunch of resources into getting the two materials on the field, and the monsters would return themselves to the extract during the end phase anyway, so you didn't even get to keep the fusion monster you invested a bunch of resources into bringing out. And there were a couple of little sub-archetypes with the Neospatians that were even worse than their main mechanic, as you could use next on either Neospatian Aqua Dolphin or Neospatian Glow Moss in order to bring out Neospatian Twinkle Moss or Neospatian Marine Dolphin from your extra deck. And these were the only two Neospatian monsters that received this treatment, despite the fact that there were four others, and all of them are featured prominently on the card artwork for Nex. This mechanic was just so bad that they stopped giving it support almost immediately, and no one's really been asking for any future support regardless. Neospacing Aqua Dolphin is a level 3 warrior monster that has the effect, where you can discard one card from your hand to look at your opponent's hand and choose a monster that has less attack than the highest attack monster you control on your side of the field, where you can then destroy that chosen card if you found an appropriate target and inflict 500 points of damage to your opponent. Otherwise, you just take 500 points of damage and you don't get to discard anything from your opponent's hand, while being out a discard from your own hand to activate the effect. Neospacing Aqua Dolphin was actually thought of as a pretty bad card at the time. 
but did see a ton of competitive play in the Goki format because it could be used in order to rip hand traps out of your opponent's hand before going into your combos thanks to Neo Space Connector and the Sol Day 2 Tales of the Noble Knights. And then if you rank up Neo Space and Aqua Dolphin with Nex, you can go into Neo Space and Marine Dolphin, which is a level 4 fusion monster that only has a 300 stat boost over its level 3 counterpart, and it has the effect where it does the exact same thing as the effect monster counterpart, with the only difference is that if you fail to find a card, you simply do not take 500 points of damage. So you still have to discard a card from your hand in order to look at your opponent's hand, and you still get to destroy a card and inflict 500 damage to your opponent if you find an appropriate target. It simply removes the downside of you taking 500 damage, which is not all that big a deal. And in fact, the card would be 10 times better if it just removed the discard cost instead. And there is also one other line of text on this card that kind of makes this whole archetype laughably unplayable even if we disregard the fact that the effect of the fusion monster is barely an upgrade over the original, and that is the fact that Neo Spacian Marine Dolphin's name is always treated as Neo Spacian Aqua Dolphin. This means that in the deck building process, this effect comes into play, where if you play Neo Spacian Marine Dolphin in your extra deck, you can only play two copies of Neo Spacian Aqua Dolphin in your main deck, before you run into the rule of not having more than three cards of the same name in your deck. Back in the early days of Yu-Gi-Oh when they wanted to print monsters with the same name as other monsters, they would pretty regularly give them the effect where their name was always treated as the same name as that other card. As you can see with the Harpy Lady monsters with Harpy Ladies 1 through 3, and Cyber Harpy Lady all infamously sharing the exact same name as the original Harpy Lady, so it's technically impossible to play all five of these cards in the same deck. So in more future releases of the cards that share the same name as other cards, they would give them stipulations where they only share the same name in specific places that's not the deck like how most of the Cyber Dragon cards only share Cyber Dragon's name while it's on the field or in the graveyard. And the reason a lot of modern cards do this is because they don't want to have the same mistake as Nex. Or if you have support cards that specifically require monsters of the same name in order to work with each other, you inherently limit how consistent those cards can be because you can only run three copies of that card total. So if you wanted to build a whole strategy around Nex and going into the Nex counterparts, it would inherently make the whole thing less consistent because you can only ever run one copy of the extra deck monster in order to maximize your chances of getting the two main deck monsters from your deck. And if you played more than one copy of your fusion monster, you would only be able to play one copy of the main deck monster, which means you wouldn't be able to go into your second copy unless you found some way to recycle the main deck monster in some way. It's just inherently a clunky design that seems more of an oversight than anything. And again, this is on top of the fusion monster not even having a better effect than the original. And also, you have to remember that the card used in order to bring it out, Nex, is a normal spell card with no archetypal synergy. So there's no way to search that specific fusion card from your deck outside of generic spell searchers. And fun fact, do you want to know what the hardest type of card to search in the game from your deck is? That would be normal spell cards. So not only is the whole next archetype kind of bad, and not only does the initial design of the cards inherently limit the consistency of it, but the main card the whole thing revolves around is basically unsearchable, just to make things even less consistent. Now let's go over the other monsters as an archetype, Neo Spacey and Twinkle Moss. This card can only be summoned by sending Neospacian Glow Moss to the graveyard with Nex. And the effect of Neospacian Glow Moss is that if this card attacks or is attacked, your opponent draws one card. And then depending on the type of card drawn, you apply one of its three effects. Where if the card your opponent drew was a monster, it ends the battle phase immediately. If it's a spell card, then it can change to a direct attack. And if it's a trap card, then Glow Moss is changed to defense position. Now, having your opponent draw cards off of being attacked is not the best effect in the world unless you're actually trying to slowly mill out your opponent. Which Neo Space and Glow Moss was actually used for this effect in Yu-Gi-Oh! Duel Links where the deck size limit was only 20. But in normal Yu-Gi-Oh! it wasn't enough of a mill to be considered as an option in mill decks. However, its fusion version, Neo Space and Twinkle Moss, is actually a huge improvement over the original, unlike Neo Space and Marine Dolphin. Neo Space and Twinkle Moss only has a 200 stat increase over its original, and its effect is kind of the opposite of Glow Moss in the best way. Where if this card attacks or is attacked, you get to draw one card, and then you gain the same effects based on what kind of card you drew where you either end the battle phase, change the attack to direct attack, or change the monster to defense position. So if your opponent has no removal of any kind, then you can get two card draws off of this one card in theory by attacking with a card during your battle phase, and then another when your opponent attacks over this card in order to try to destroy it. And being able to draw cards every time you attack with a monster or get an attack is actually a really good effect. If you're going to play a next deck, your whole strategy would probably revolve around going to Neo Space and Twinkle Moss in order to draw cards. Because you have to remember, being able to generically draw cards is one of the best effects in the game. So if this effect was on an actually useful monster in a better archetype, it would be kind of overpowered. But since its effect is attached to one of the worst archetypes ever, 
which is basically a side archetype of a mediocre archetype, it saw all of zero competitive play and probably never will. Now, with how bad the next cards are, it may surprise you to hear this, but they're not even the worst version of this kind of effect. For that, you'd probably need to go over a look at Elemental Hero Neo Bubble Man. Neo Bubble Man is a main deck monster that has the effect where it cannot be normal summoned or set and can only be special summoned from your hand by sending Elemental Hero Bubble Man you control to the graveyard and discarding the specific spell card Metamorphosis from your hand to the graveyard as well. Where it gains the effect that its name is treated as the original Elemental Hero Bubble Man while it's face up on the field, and also if it battles a monster, you get to destroy your opponent's monster at the end of the damage step. Now, with how Neo Bubble Man only has 800 attack, you are probably going to have to crash this into an opponent's monster if you want to destroy one of your opponent's monsters with it by battle. In which case, it's just a strictly worse Yomi ship, which has a very similar effect but slightly higher stats and no ridiculously convoluted summoning method. At least with the next cards, you don't have to search out the monster you're bringing out with next, as they're in your extra deck. With the Hero Neo Bubble Man, you need to have all the specific cards required for it to have been searched out on the field and in your hand, and the two cards required to bring it out are strictly better than the card you get for your payoff. And because Emblem Hero Neo Bubble Man exists, you can say, at the very least, that next cards aren't as bad as Neo Bubble Man. Now, there is an adjacent archetype with a similar mechanic that was actually able to succeed. There's a whole series of hero cards called Mast Heroes, which are brought up with a quick play spell card, Mast Change, where you can simply target any hero monster you control in order to special summon a Mast Hero monster from your extra deck that has the same attribute as that monster. Mass change is a quick play, so it can be used in response to your heroes getting destroyed or targeted by something in order to save them, or used during the battle phase in order to push for extra damage. None of the hero monsters required you to have the same name as anything else, so it's incredibly versatile in which hero monsters you could use in order to go into whatever mass change monster you wanted, as a lot of the different attributes have multiple mass hero monsters to choose from, even if usually you just use the best version of each. And some of the mass hero monsters are really strong, with mass hero Dark Law kind of carrying heroes in competitive rogue play ever since it was released. So it seems like whoever was designing the heroes and their adjacent archetypes with Nax and Elemental Hero Neo Bubble Man really wanted to get the one card fusion and summoning mechanic to work, and finally nailed it when they got to the mass heroes, which chronologically speaking were released at last, years after Nax and Neo Bubble Man. Now, just a little bit of a side note, technically Nex did get a better version of it released in 2018 called Next. However, it functions nothing like the original card, and is more of a homage to Nex than it is a direct upgrade, as what Nex does is allow you to special summon any number of Neospatian or Elemental Hero monsters from your hand or graveyard as possible, just as long as they're all different names. However, it negates their effects on the field, locks you into only summoning fusion monsters for the rest of the turn, and can be activated from your hand if you control no cards. And even with how much potential advantage you can get from Nex, the Neospatian monsters are so bad it doesn't really see competitive play. Now, in conclusion, it's pretty easy to see why it failed as an archetype and or mechanic. It was meant to be a side archetype of an already mediocre archetype that wasn't seen competitive play. It was even worse at doing its job than the original bad archetype. It inherently was inconsistent because it lowered the consistency of your combos by its very mechanic of having the monsters share the exact same names in the deck building process, and had a completely unsearchable spell card because its name doesn't have fusion in its title. Because spell cards that do have fusion or polymerization in its name are much easier to search out, and there's currently no way to actually search Nex outside of generic spell searchers. So if you wanted to play a gimmicky Nex deck today, it's just as unplayable as it was back then when it was first released, even if searching out the Neospatians themselves is much easier thanks to Neospace Connector. However, if they were to try to improve the mechanic to make it better, what they could do is make absolutely busted fusion monsters with crazy effects that could win you the game on their own, in order to try to be a payoff for going through all the effort of getting all the inconsistent combo pieces in your hand in order to bring them out in the first place. Neospacing Twinkle Moss has a good effect, but it's not good enough for the amount of effort required to bring her out. Even if they had an effect as strong as something like Master Dark Law, that still probably wouldn't be enough to justify the mechanic. You might have to go all the way up to a 5 material Rongo Miniad as a payoff, as an example, before it starts being worth all that hassle. Planting cards into your opponent's deck is an effect that only really one card has, called Parasite Parasite. There are other cards that allow you to do things to your opponent's deck, but none of them allow you to place your card into your opponent's deck, unless you somehow give one of your cards to your opponent's hand and then shuffle their hand back into the deck, which isn't really the same thing. What Parasite does is if it's flipped and survives the battle, it will be shuffled into your opponent's deck face up. Then, if they draw into the card, it will immediately special summon itself, making the player take 1000 points of damage, and then make it so all monsters they control become insect. Now, the effect is incredibly difficult to pull off, because you first have to search out the Parasite, then find some way to flip it without it getting destroyed by battle with its measly 300 defense, then find a way to actually search your opponent's deck so they draw into it, 
all for the payoff of only 1,000 points of damage. And because of the inherent flaw of having to actually search for the card, and then hope your opponent draws into that card, it's not a super reliable way of actually doing things, and it's pretty much entirely a gimmick. Which is why they haven't really tried to iterate on this design space in future cards, because it is just so inherently flawed with all the kinds of things you have to do to accomplish for it to be useful, that it's really not worth it. Unless the payoff is something amazing. If Parasite Parasite had the payoff where it made the controller lose the duel when it was summoned, then it would be worth all the effort to bring it out. So really, if they want someone to activate an incredibly difficult card, all they have to do is make it worth the payoff. And print proper support cards, and it will probably work. In fact, Parasite Parasite itself did see competitive play in Duel Links, because Duel Links has a system of skills, which allow them to do basically whatever they want when it comes to being creative with designing what a skill can do. And one of the skills made it so that your opponent would start with one to three copies of the Parasite in their deck face up, as if they were added by the effect of the card itself. And with the players only having 4,000 start and life points, this was actually a very good skill. Because if you don't have to go through the effort of actually giving the card to your opponent, then you only have the second part of the quest, which is just getting that card on top of your opponent's deck. So a card like Jade Insect Whistle, which forces your opponent to search an insect monster from their deck and place it on top of their deck, all of a sudden becomes a hand disruption tool, because it makes it so that your next draw is guaranteed to be that Parasite, which means they don't actually get a card for a turn, and instead get the downside of the Parasite summoning itself out. Jade Insect Whistle is actually just a useless bad card in the normal game, but became very good as a burn tool in Duel Links because of the ability to place the Parasites in your opponent's deck automatically at the start of the duel. So if the normal game ever gets skills like Duel Links, it would be pretty easy for them to turn a lot of previously bad cards and mechanics into pretty good ones, by heavily offsetting the downsides of them without having to use card effects. Proven how Parasite's effects could only be useful if half of its effects were heavily offset with an overpowered skill. Despite the constant influx of new cards and mechanics that have been introduced to the game throughout the years, Yu-Gi-Oh! still resolves entirely around three card types and their distinctions. Monster cards, spell cards, and trap cards. But there have been a number of cards and mechanics which have attempted to mix these two types of cards together, like trap monsters. Most trap monsters have rarely ever been an accepted part of Yu-Gi-Oh!'s metagame, which is why they're the subject of today's video, so we've explained why they never really took off, their issues, and even successes as a mechanic. Now, what is a trap monster? Trap Monster is the unofficial term used to describe trap cards which are capable of special summoning themselves as a monster to the player's field. They're the exact opposite counterpart to Pendulum Monsters, which are monsters that can be treated as macros since Trap Monsters are trap cards which can be treated as monsters. But while Pendulum Monsters have an official mechanic to facilitate their use as spells, Trap Monsters aren't as centralized, so there are a number of differences that can be spotted between the different individual Trap Monsters, including how they actually become monsters in the first place. So, how do Trap Monsters become monsters? For some trap cards, it's simply a matter of activating them. Tiki Curse and Tiki Soul can be spelled to summon to your field by just activating them as you would a normal trap card. Other trap monsters, on the other hand, have their own summoning conditions and can also special summon themselves from places other than the field. The Prime Monarch can be special summoned from your graveyard by banishing another Monarch spell or trap in your grave. And every one of the Paleozoic trap cards has an effect, which allows them to special summon themselves from the graveyard as a normal monster when another trap card is activated. Other differences between trap monsters can include the type of trap they are, whether or not they're still treated as a trap card while they're monsters, and whether they're summoned as a normal or effect monster. Now, why are trap monsters a failed mechanic? Despite the diversity of the mechanic, trap monsters very rarely see widespread competitive play for a number of reasons. Conceptually, trap monsters sound incredibly powerful since you're combining the strengths of two card types. Trap cards are already one of the best forms of interaction available, and monsters can be used as combo pieces or for materials for extra deck summons. So, a trap monster that interacts with the opponent and gives you free bond on your side of the field sounds amazing at first. And the best trap monsters actually fulfill that promise, either being a powerful interruption, an incredible extender, or in some rare cases, both at the same time. This, in theory, makes it entirely possible to run a deck without needing to play a single monster card, as instead, you would be able to use your trap card as interaction and as a way to put pressure on your opponent's life points. However, a lot of trap monsters, especially the earlier ones, don't actually interact with your opponent in a profitable way. A large portion of trap monsters have very middling effects, if any effect at all, so the actual interruption they provide isn't valuable. This wouldn't be so much of an issue if you were able to special summon trap monsters immediately, as they'd be useful for some strategies that need extra extenders for board building. For example, a sprite deck is always going to appreciate having more level 2 extenders. But trap monsters still come with the same harsh restriction as any other trap card. They have to be set for a turn before they can use their on-field effects. This makes trap monsters really unappealing for most strategies that are desperate for extenders. Having to wait a whole turn before you can board build makes it a lot worse than even the worst extenders, as they can at least be used on turn 1. 
Some trap monsters do circumvent this by summoning themselves from the graveyard, or be able to be activated immediately, but this is an exception and not the rule. These two issues are usually what really holds trap monsters from being a more successful mechanic. If the body isn't immediately beneficial, then the interruption must be strong. And if the interruption isn't strong, then the body must be immediately beneficial. The best and most successful trap monsters in the game have both, but the worst trap monsters in the game have neither. Some good examples of the best trap monsters in the game actually all belong to the same archetype, the Golden Land trap cards. Conquistador, Hakero, and Guardian. The entire Eldritch engine revolves around the Golden Lord itself, the Eldlixir, Spell Trap cards, and these three trap monsters, all of which provide the deck with strong interruption. Each of these trap monsters share one effect, that they can banish themselves from the graveyard in order to set an Eldlixir spell trap directly from your deck. But you can only use this effect on one of these cards per turn, so you do have to choose between using their interruption or their graveyard effect. Conquistador is the strongest of these three cards. It special sums itself as a level 5 light zombie monster with 500 attack and 1800 defense. But if you also control Eldritch the Golden Lord when it's summoned, you can destroy a face-up card in the field. Similarly, Hakero also summons itself out as a level 5 light zombie monster, but instead of popping a card in the field, if you control an Eldritch the Golden Lord, you can banish a card from either player's graveyard. Even if Conquistador and Hakero weren't trap monsters and were just instead trap cards, they'd still be excellent as both of their interruptions are really strong. Popping any card in the field allows you to clear away your opponent's combo pieces, boss monsters, or even their face-up back row. And having an archetypal DD Crow allows you to easily deal with graveyard strategies. But these cards are also monsters, so they also come with some extra utility that they wouldn't have if they were just regular trap cards. Because they stick around as monsters and are still treated as trap cards, you can send these monsters to the graveyard in order to pay the cost of Eldritch's graveyard effect to bring himself back to the hand or field. This not only gets you your main boss monster back on the field, but also allows you an easy way to put in your gold land cards in the graveyard so you can use their graveyard effects. Both Conquistador and Hakero also provide Eldritch with interesting extra deck options that the deck wouldn't otherwise have access to allowing the deck easy access to Link Plays and Lina and the Nightmares, as well as giving Eldritch the chance to run a substantial Rank 5 package, which includes cards like Constellar Pleiades. Guardian of the Golan, however, despite having a lot of the same perks as Conquistador and Hakero, is the worst card of the three, and their contrast helps to showcase what makes a trap monster good, but makes a trap monster bad. Guardian's interruption isn't strong at all. Lowering an opponent's monster's attack to zero does nothing to actually stop an opponent's combo. Instead, it's a lot more comparable to old battle tricks like Shrink or Honest, which you would use if you really need to protect your golden land from battle, which isn't something that needs to be done often, as Eldlitch's stats are already quite high, and get even higher from its own effect, reaching a whopping 3500 attack and 3800 defense. Guardian does still have some other niches though, it's a way to out high attack monsters Eldlitch will struggle to beat over, and it's still a trap card in the field so it can be used to pay the cost for Eldlitch. It even has the most impressive defense of any of the Golden Land trap cards. But Guardian is dragged down heavily by the fact it's a level 8 instead of level 5, which means it can't be used alongside Conquistador or Hakero in order to go into rank 5s, or Eldlitch to go into rank 10s. They're the sole level 8 of the archetype which makes it lose a ton of utility. It's just a lot more awkward compared to the other Golden Land trap monsters. But even though Guardian is the weakest of the three by far, it does still have some uses it shares in common with Conquistador and Hakero. All of the graveyard effects set an Eldlixir spell trap to your field, and those Eldlixir spell traps have graveyard effects which allow you to set the Golden Land spell traps to your field, so you may still choose to run Guardian as a toolbox option. But as well as common strengths, these cards do share some common weaknesses relating to their nature as trap cards. Because they're still trap cards as monsters, they can easily be cleared from the field by a Lightning Storm or Cosmic Cyclone, and they still need to be set for at least a turn before you can actually use them. The Phantom Knights of Shade Brigandine does not have these same issues. Shade Brigandine is a normal trap card which special summons itself as a level 4 dark monster with 0 attack and 300 defense. But unlike the Eldritch trap monsters, Shade Brigandine is not treated as a trap card while it's a monster. And you can only activate Shade Brigandine once per turn. If this was all Brigandine could do, the card would actually be terrible since it has no way to interrupt your opponent or benefit you in any capacity except for being a very weak body on the field. But despite having no way to interact with your opponent, Shade Brigandine is actually extremely powerful. Because as long as you don't have any other trap cards in your graveyard, you can activate Shade Brigandine the turn it's sent. This makes it a viable option for a number of different strategies that need an extra level 4 body in the field for extra deck plays, most notably the archetype that the card belongs to, Phantom Knights. Phantom Knights actually have quite a few trap monsters that are part of the archetype, but all of them are really underpowered when compared to Brigandine since they all need to be set for a turn before you can use and don't interact with your opponent well. Brigandine on the other hand gives Phantom Knights an extra extender to have an easier time accessing their link tools and rank 4 plays. And the fact that it's a trap card that's an extender gives it a neat synergy with the common staples of the Phantom strategy. Brigandine being a trap card makes it superbly easy for Phantom Knights to access. Not only is it searchable by the graveyard effect of Silent Boots, you can also set it directly from your deck with the effect of Phantom Knight's boss monster, Rusty Bardiche, provided you send a Phantom Knight's card from your deck to the graveyard. This high searchability, combined with how generic Rusty Bardiche is, has allowed for Phantom Knights to be used as an engine for dark strategies that need to strengthen their end board with Fogblade, or if they need extra extenders to board build, they can rely on Shade Brigandine. 
Although many decks that use Shade Brigidine don't actually want to run a large Pandanite engine and just value the card individually. For example, Time Thief is a dark rank 4 strategy and thus greatly benefits from Shade Brigidine being an extra extender that they can use to further their plays and access their boss monsters since Shade Brigidine is a level 4 monster, but it's specifically its status as a trap card which can be used as an Xyz material which makes Brigidine so important for this strategy. You see, Time Thief Redoer and Time Thief Double Barrel are both monsters with an effect that changes depending on the type of material you detach from them. Detaching a monster grants you their weakest effect. Redoer allows you to banish itself until the end phase and Double Barrel gains 400 attack. Detaching a spell card gives you a stronger effect. Redoer lets you draw a card and Double Barrel lets you take control of an opponent's monster until the end phase. And detaching a trap card gives you access to their strongest effects. Redoer lets you spin a face-up card to the top of the deck and Double Barrel lets you negate the effects of one monster on the field. Usually, the trap effect is the hardest to access. Time Thief does have archetypal tools to allow you to access every one of their effects, but it's a lot more difficult to use compared to their monster-based effects. But by using Shade Bridge and D as a material, Redoer and Double Barrel would already have a trap card attached as soon as they're summoned, allowing you free access to the strongest interaction without having to jump through the hoops of flyback or startup. Another great example where Shade Bridge and D being a trap card is important is with Trap Tricks. Unlike Phantom Knights and Time Thieves, Trap Tricks isn't a combo deck. It's a slow control deck based around the resource management of the whole trap cards, so at first glance, Shade Bridge Indeed doesn't really seem to fit in. But the fact that it's a level 4 trap monster makes it the best extender available for the deck. It gives you easier access to the rank 4 trap monsters while also giving you a trap card that you can activate on your first turn. This is important because it can trigger the first effect of Trap Trick Sarah, allowing you to special summon any Trap Trick monster directly from your deck. And if you just so happen to activate the effect of that Trap Trick's monster, you can also use Sarah's second effect to set any whole normal trap card directly from your deck. This means that a single shade Brigandine activation while Sarah's on the field allows you two level 4 bodies to make a Rafflesia or Almorus, and a free whole normal trap card to interrupt your opponent. Shade Brigandine's strength is clearly due to the fact that it's possible to activate it on your first turn. Phantom Knights actually have a ton of other trap monsters with pretty decent effects. Wrong Magnet Ring is a draw 2, Lost Vambrance gives your Phantom Knight monsters destruction protection, and Tomb Shield can be used from the graveyard as a trap card negate. But every single one of the Phantom Knight trap monsters has fallen into obscurity other than Shade Brigandine which, despite having no way to interrupt your opponent, has managed to work its way into a myriad of strategies, purely because it's a trap monster that you can use on your first turn to summon a free level 4 monster. It sets a very interesting precedent, because if more trap monsters were capable of summoning themselves out on the first turn, then the mechanic may have actually seen more success in combo strategies. But as it currently stands, Shade Brigidine is an outlier when it compares to other trap monsters, as it's actually a really playable generic extender for combo decks, while most other trap monsters have only seen play in slower control strategies which can facilitate their use. Although that isn't to discount control strategies, as the best trap monsters in the game's history belong to a slow control strategy based around grinding your opponent, and that's because every main deck card in the archetype is a trap monster. Every Paleozoic monster has two effects. The first effect is unique to that specific Paleozoic monster, and is activated by using it as a trap card. Dynamiscus can banish an opponent's face-up card, Canadia can book of moon an opponent's monster, and Morella can send another trap card from your deck to the graveyard. But every Paleozoic also comes with a shared effect, that when another trap card is activated while Paleozoic is in the graveyard, you can special summon that Paleozoic is a level 2 normal aqua monster that's unaffected by monster effects, but you have to banish it when it leaves the field. This allows for Paleos to work on two goals at the same time. The first is using your trap cards as trap cards, interrupting your opponent at key points in their combos. Some Paleos are better than this at others, Dynamiscus and Canadia are amazing ways of interacting with your opponent and have seen competitive play in non-Paleo decks, but Paleozoic Pikaia and Eldonia are a lot weaker. Still, even weaker Paleos have been made strong with some clever deck building. Paleozoic Morella is a great example of this. Its effect is just a worse foolish burial goods, but it's been used to great effect by Paleo decks to send trap cards with excellent graveyard effects that you can use on your opponent's turn. But if Paleos had only their trap card effects, the archetype would actually be pretty bad. They would have strong interruption but could only be used as engines for other decks. It's their effects to come back as monsters which skyrocketed Paleo into the competitive scene, and even allowed them to compete against full power Zodiac. Despite their low stats of only 1200 attack and zero defense, Paleos can put a ton of pressure on your opponent. This is because the number of extra deck options Paleos has available to them. Anomal Karis is a pop that can also add a trap card from the top of your deck to your hand. Opababinia lets you activate Paleozoic trap cards from your hand while also letting you search any Paleozoic trap if it has a trap card as an Xyz material. And Cambro Bostar can be used to set any Paleo trap from your deck, provided you send a set card in your spell trap card zone to your graveyard, all while protecting your set cards from destruction. But as well as that incredible lineup, Paleozoics also have access to one of the strongest boss monsters in the game, specifically because they summon themselves as level 2 aqua monsters. 
Two Paleos can overlay together into Totally Awesome, which allows you to negate to destroy and set an opponent's card to your side of the field. And you're virtually guaranteed to get access to those extra deck plays because of how difficult it is to interact with Paleozoics with monsters. You see, while they do summon themselves as normal monsters, every Paleozoic that summon has a lingering effect applied to them, which makes them completely unaffected by monster effects while also not being treated like trap cards. This means that cards like Cosmic Cyclone and MST can't be used to out Paleozoics as monsters, and because they're unaffected by all monster effects, the only way you can out Paleos with monsters is by battle. And Paleos as a control deck can protect its monsters by using cards like Dupe Frog, Threatening Roar, or even Rise to Full Height, that's been sent to the graveyard by Morella, ensuring your Paleos are protected by battle so they can be used for extra deck plays in the next turn. This is important because when they're used as material for an XC summon, instead of being banished, they go to the graveyard when they're detached putting another Paleo card in the graveyard to be summoned out the next time a trap card is activated, meaning that a handful of Paleo cards can potentially represent a near infinite amount of bodies. This recursion and their strong interruption has allowed for Paleo to see competitive play as both a deck and a small engine in other competitive strategies, mainly for their ability to interrupt their opponent as trap cards, but also because they have the potential to return as free bodies for link plates, especially mill heavy strategies like tier limits, which are likely to mill Paleos across the course of their combo. Both their strong interruption and recursion put Paleozoics leagues above other regular trap monsters. A card like Quantum Cat or Metal Reflex Slime may have better stats than every Paleo, but they have no way to actually do damage to an opponent's combo. And while a card like Angel Statue as a rune can have a fatally strong interruption, it doesn't really have much use as a body when compared to the Paleos. Being good as both a monster card and as an interruptive trap card is the key formula to making a trap monster good in the modern era and the Paleozoics are an excellent example of both. The same is true for the Eldritch cards, acting both as great bodies and an amazing way to stop your opponent's combo plays. But even with this general formula, there are some trap monsters which have seen competitive play without having a good interruption, a good body, or even both. Shade Brinjadine is a key example since it's only good as an extender, and not as an interruption. Brinjadine isn't the only outlier either. A number of decks throughout the game's competitive history have actually used trap monsters as part of their main engine, but not as their main way of winning the game. The Prime Monarch does not have an amazing effect as a trap card, and can't be used to stop your opponent's plays. But it does have the ability to special summon itself out from the graveyard by banishing another Monarch spell or trap from the grave. This pairs perfectly with Pantheism of the Monarchs, which is able to send the Prime Monarch from your hand to the graveyard to search for any Monarch spell or trap from your deck. This puts the Prime Monarch and Pantheism in your graveyard, so you can banish the Pantheism to summon out the Prime Monarch, which you can then use to tribute summon for your Monarch monsters. And because it doesn't get banished like the Paleos do, you can keep summoning out the Prime Monarch every turn for your tribute summons, making it an archetypal Treeborn Frog that Monarchs definitely took advantage of during their Tier 1 status in 2016. Shadow Core was also a mainstay in Shadows up until 2016. Core is a trap monster that, as a monster, can be used as a substitute for any attribute for a Shadow Fusion monster for a Fusion Summon. So even as a Dark monster, you can use Core as your Light monster for Construct or the Fire monster for Grista. The strongest part of Core's effect, however, isn't its ability to summon itself as a monster, it's its graveyard effect, which allows you to add any Shadow spell or trap card from a graveyard to your hand. So you can fusion summon Shadow Construct with the Shadow Fusion, then send Shadow Core from your deck to the graveyard with the effect of Shadow Construct. Then using the graveyard effect of Shadow Core, you can add the Shadow Fusion back to your hand to be used on a later turn. While this used to be a strong part of Shadows, which gave them plenty of follow-up, Core was eventually cut from the deck. Its use as a monster wasn't really that strong, and its graveyard effect became a lot worse when Shadow Fusions could more easily be sent to the graveyard with the advent of Link Monsters, allowing the Shadow Monsters to use their graveyard effects and add follow-up. Even in alternative formats, trap monsters at the time to shine, like in Speed Duels where Zoma the Spirit dominated. Zoma the Spirit is a trap monster that, when it's destroyed by battle, inflicts damage to your opponent equal to the attack of the monster that destroyed it. While this effect isn't valuable at all in the TCG, Zoma terrorized Speed Duels as an astonishing staple that just about any deck could play. It was a free bot you could use for attribute summons of Monarchs and Hades, and it had a relatively high attack if it stuck around on the field, which it often would. You see, in Speed Duels, like Duel Links, you only have 4,000 life points as opposed to 8,000 that you have in the OCG, TCG, and Master Duel. This meant that if your opponent ran over Zoma, they were usually paying around half of their life points just to remove it from the field. And since there's no main phase 2 in Speed Duels, their opponent could just wait for the battle phase before summoning Zoma to make it even harder to remove. So when Zoma was on the field, you basically had to make the difficult choice of either removing Zoma by battle, and paying a ton of life points, or letting them keep Zoma on the field and risking a strong tribute summon. Zoma was so strong in speed duels that it was placed on the only speed duel ban list to be released, specifically for one event only, where it was limited alongside Jinzo and Foolish Burial to give an idea just how strong Zoma was in that format. Although in the TCG, Zoma has rarely ever been played. In speed duels, the format is, ironically enough, a lot slower than the TCG, so there isn't as much pressure on trap monsters to be as strong as Paleozoics or Golden Land cards. 
You can summon Zone with the Spirit and expect it to still be there on your side of the field in speed duels by the start of your next turn. This same isn't so true in the TCG, where a card like Zone with the Spirit doesn't do anything except body block an opponent's attack, which just isn't enough to be valuable. With the number of extra deck tools and choices of removal that are available in the TCG, it's no longer enough that a trap monster just summons itself to the field so that you can use it next turn. It'll be destroyed by battle, popped, or even banished from the field before you properly use your Tiki Soul for something useful. For the modern format, a trap monster has to be recursive, or it has to interrupt, or it has to be immediately useful. If it isn't, then it's really unlikely that it'll see competitive play. Even Paleozoic, the archetype solely composed of trap monsters, has cut a number of their archetypal names, like Pikaia and Hallucinagia, because while they are excellent bodies on field, they're terrible interruptions, and you'd much rather just play other staples or engines in their place. All in all, while there have been plenty of trap monsters that have seen competitive play throughout the game's history, but in order to compete in the modern day, they need to do way more than just summon themselves to the field after being set for a turn. The trap monsters that have seen success, however, deserve recognition for turning what would be a slow way of special summoning monster into a genuine meta threat. Some because of their effects as trap cards, but others specifically because of the fact that they're monsters that happen to be a trap card. Even recently, prior to Majestic Mavens, Tear Limits were playing down a Mishkis since it was discarded for effect and it could trigger Tear Limit graveyard effects, while also being a level 2 monster they could use to go into Sprite Elf. Currently, however, trap monsters aren't seeing much competitive play. Even the Eldritch monsters are taking a backseat as Flew Under Reese is the best control deck available in the format. Although it won't take much for trap monsters to see competitive play again, as long as there's a control deck in the format that can actually use them. While the mechanic isn't a total failure like most of the other videos in this series, future trap monsters would do well to take inspiration from the Golden Land and Paleo cards, since they're interruptions that also happen to be strong bodies that allow you to apply plenty of pressure to your opponent, since Tiki Curse and Tiki Soul aren't going to be tier 0 anytime soon. Level monsters are a series of cards which level up into stronger versions of themselves by accomplishing some kind of task in order to gain their level up, similar to playing an RPG game. However, most of the level up tasks required were just too slow, and their effects weren't strong enough for them to see any kind of widespread success. The first wave of level monsters were introduced in 2004 in the Soul of the Duelist. This first wave of level monsters included Ultimate Insect, Horus the Black Flame Dragon, Mystic Swordsman, Dark Mimic, and Armed Dragon. And with this initial wave of five level monsters, they all kind of had different ways that they could level themselves up, and all of them saw varying levels of success, or lack of success. Ultimate Insect, for example, had four levels of evolutions, starting off with Ultimate Insect Level 1, which had zero attack and defense, and the only effect where it was unaffected by spell card effects. And its condition in order to level itself up are to simply have this card face up on your side of the field during your standby phase, where you can then special summon Ultimate Insect Level 3 from your hand or deck by sending this face up card to the graveyard, which is how most of the level monsters work. They would send themselves to the graveyard in order to perform the special summon condition, and since they were special summoning stronger monsters from the deck, Konami thought to give them conditions which should not be too easy to fulfill. As Ultimate Insect Level 1 also had extra conditions where you can't use its level up effect during the turn that it's normal summoned, special summoned, or flip face up. So if you wanted to use Call the Haunted during the standby phase to bring this card out of the graveyard in order to activate its level up condition immediately without trying to protect a zero attack monster on the field, then you wouldn't be able to do so although you could use it during your opponent's end phase to the same effect. However, the exact same combo did work for Armed Dragon Level 3, who has the exact same level up condition, where it just needs to be on the field during your standby phase in order to bring out its higher level monster, except without the restriction where it can't be activated during the turn it summoned, which is odd because they both came out at the same time in the same set. So, what do you get for protecting Ultimate Insect Level 1? Well, Ultimate Insect Level 3, where it had the effect that if it was special summoned by the effect of its level 1 counterpart, then all your opponent's monsters lose 300 attack while it's face up on the field. And then it had the same level condition where it just need to exist during the standby phase in order to special summon the level 5 variant from your hand or deck. And also has the same restrictions where you can't use the effect during the same turn that it's summoned. And the level 5 is the same thing which finally brings out the level 7, which simply reduces the attack and defense values of all your opponent's monsters by 700 while it's on the field. Now, the Ultimate Insects are supposed to be better versions of the Ultimate Moth Insect Monsters, and they definitely are, but they were also a little bit too restrictive on how they went about doing their thing, and didn't really see any competitive play. However, one thing to note about the Ultimate Insects is that they didn't have any negative effects that prevented you from bringing the card out normally. They just simply only gained effects if they were brought out properly. 
which was not the case for all level monsters, as some of them had good effects that they just had baseline, so they had restrictions on how they could be brought out in the first place. Let's take a look at Mystic Swordsman level 2. It has the effect that if it attacks a monster that's face down, you can destroy that monster immediately with its effect at the start of the damage step. And then, oddly enough, its level up condition requires you to destroy a monster by battle, and not with its destruction effect, in order to bring out its level 4 version during the end phase. Mystic Swordsman level 4 has the same exact effects, except it has the negative condition where this card cannot be normal summoned, except it can be normal set, which is kind of useless for a level 4 monster that doesn't have some kind of flip effect. And the Mystic Swordsman level 6 has the effect that if it attacks a face down defense boosted monster, you can also destroy that monster with its effect, however, instead of that card going to the graveyard, it's placed on top of your opponent's deck. Now, this effect is technically good, it's just not worth the effort of leveling up two monsters to get into it. Especially since its level 2 version can accomplish the same thing basically without jumping through hoops. Arm Dragon level 3 simply has to exist during the standby phase to bring out Arm Dragon level 5. And its level 5 version actually has different conditions for leveling up, where it has to destroy a monster by battle in order to special summon the level 7 version, which is unique because most of the other level monsters have all had the exact same conditions for each level up. And Arm Dragon level 5 actually has a pretty decent effect on the field, where you can just send a monster from your hand to the graveyard in order to destroy a monster opponent controls that has less attack than the monster you sent. And Arm Dragon level 5 doesn't have any restrictions on its summon, unlike Mystic Swordsman cards. And then Arm Dragon level 7 just has a slightly worse lightning vortex-like effect on the field and isn't really worth going into. Dark Mimic level 1 allowed you to draw a card when it was flipped face up, which was actually just useful on its own. And then if this card existed during the standby phase, you get to special summon Dark Mimic level 3 from your deck, who simply has a better effect if it's special summoned by its lower level counterpart, where you get to draw two cards when it's destroyed by battle instead of only one. And really, the Dark Mimic cards are some of the best examples of how they should have iterated on the level monsters going forward, where they have decent effects on their own, and just have better effects if they're brought out through their normal procedure. However, they definitely did not take the Dark Mimic approach going into the future. Just a spoiler alert. And then finally, the Horus cards. Horus the Black Flame Dragon level 4 simply needed to destroy a monster by battle to level up during the end phase. And level 6 has the exact same level of conditions although it was also unaffected by spell card effects while it was on the field, which was a distinction that was somewhat important because Horus the Black Flame Dragon level 8 is probably the best level monster. Its effects are basically just conditions on how it can't be brought out except by its level 6 counterpart, and then just has the effect where, if a spell card effect is activated, you can choose to negate and destroy that card if you want. So Horus basically just allows you to shut down spell card effects selectively which is super rare when it comes to shutting down all kinds of effects of one type of card. Usually they'll go the Jinzo route, where it just shuts down all effects that they're trying to negate, but not Horus. So this effect was legitimately good, and only a benefit to whoever controlled the card. It also has decent stats with 3000 attack baseline, so you can be pretty confident that it will stay on the field, especially after shutting down all your opponent's spell cards. And since Horus the Black Flame Dragon level 8 could activate its good effect no matter how it hit the field, it was the best target in order to level up with their only piece of good support called level up, with an exclamation point. And all level up did was allow you to send a level monster you control to the graveyard in order to special summon the higher level version of it from your hand or deck, ignoring its summoning conditions. And one of the great things about cards that ignore summoning conditions is that there's no real extra rules that come into play as long as you can special summon them from the hand or deck. So you could easily bring out Horus the Black Flame Dragon level 8, as long as you were able to get Horus the Black Flame Dragon level 6 on the field, and of course had level up in your hand. And even though Horus the Black Flame Dragon level 6 was immune to spell effects, it's not immune to the effects of level up, so you can send it to the graveyard in order to cheat out the level 8 version. Which is why it's in the card artwork of the spell, signifying that it's definitely the best target for the card. And out of all the level up monsters, Horus the Black Flame Dragon was the only one to actually see competitive play in the TCG, which is surprising because they did release more level monsters later on. None of them matched Horus in competitive play. Although Horus did not see widespread competitive success, and was only played a couple of times over the years before Dragon Rulers came out, where it was then played a couple more times in some variant of Dragon Ruler decks. And specifically only in the side deck, just because Blaster could search out the level 6, and potentially allow to go into level 8 for spell negate monster on the field. Although, I should also mention, Dark Mimic level 3 did see some competitive play as well as a tour guide to the Underworld target, 
as well as a few times in some burn decks in 2007. So, outside of Horus, and to a lesser extent, Dark Mimic, the Lola monsters were not very successful. The only two pieces of support they received in their set were, of course, Level Up, which continues to this day being their only good piece of generic support, and the Graveyard in the Fourth Dimension, which is honestly not very good. It just allows you to return two level monsters from your graveyard back to your deck. A short time after the first wave of level monsters, they released two more, being Silent Swordsman and Silent Magician. Silent Swordsman level 4 had the effect where each time your opponent drew a card, you got to place one spell counter on it, and it gained 500 attack for each spell counter, and its level up condition required you to have five spell counters on it, where during your standby phase you could send it to the graveyard in order to bring out its level 8 version, which simply had the effect where it was unaffected by your opponent's spell card effects. But it also had 3500 attack, which was very high back in the day, although not enough to see competitive play, because Silent Magician level 4 was incredibly slow with its level up condition. Because outside of forcing your opponent to draw cards with some other kind of card effects, it would take you 5 turns of protecting the card in the field before it can complete its level up condition. Although it did make it a very lucrative target for the level up spell card, because it could just go straight into the 3500 attack beat stick that was immune to spell cards. There was also Silent Swordsman level 3, which had a level up condition similar to Ultimate Insect level 3, where it just needed to survive until your standby phase in order to bring out its level 5 version, while also not being usable in the turn that it summoned. Its level 5 version was passively immune to your opponent's spell effects, and its level of condition required you to inflict damage to your opponent's life points by a direct attack, where during your next standby phase you could then bring out the level 7 version. And the level 7 version was just a straight up lockdown on all spell effects on the field. So kind of like a Jinzo, but for spell cards and not as good as Horus, which could selectively negate any spells you wanted, but still a really good effect nonetheless. And then shortly later, they released Winged Karibo level 10, Armed Dragon level 10, and a new support card called Level Modulation. And none of these cards saw competitive play. In fact, Level Modulation is kind of hilariously bad. It has the effect where you can special summon a level monster from your graveyard, ignoring its summoning conditions, but with the restrictions where that monster can't attack, or use its effects for the turn that it's summoned, and your opponent draws two cards. And here's the thing with cards that ignore summoning conditions from the graveyard. They can only bring out a card that was properly special summoned first. So, you can't just send Horus the Black Flame Dragon level 8 from your deck to the graveyard with Foolish Burial, and then just bring it out with level modulation, because it would need to have been properly summoned first. Whereas, you can use a level up on Horus the Black Flame Dragon level 6 in order to cheat it out of the deck because the rules for ignoring special summoning conditions are different for different places in which those cards are summoned from. Which I'm sure definitely confused a lot of people who are a lot more casual with these cards back in the day, seeing as they had two cards from their archetype which ignored summoning conditions, but only one of them worked the way you would think it does. And also, giving your opponent two card draws for the effect is just really bad. Like, hallmark of a bad cost for a card kind of bad. Level Monsters wouldn't really receive a new wave of support until 2006, where in the infamous set called Cyberdark Impact, they released two new level monsters as well as some new support cards, which like level modulation were all kind of hilariously bad. First we have the Allure Queen archetype. They all have the effect where they can attach one of your opponent's monsters to them as an equip card, similar to Relinquish, although they can only target specific kinds of monsters. Allure Queen level 3 can only equip level 3 or lower, the level 5 version can only equip level 5 or lower monsters to it, but the level 7 version can equip any monster your opponent controls to it. However, the only thing they gain for being able to absorb one of your opponent's monsters is battle protection, and that's it. And since they all have incredibly low attack, it's really easy for that battle protection to just be used up by any monster attacking over them, where at least cards like Relinquish or Destiny Hero Plasma, who have similar effects, are able to gain some kind of attack points from the monsters they equip. And the higher levels of Allure Queen only gain their equip effect if they're brought out properly, which means you can't use level up in order to cheese their effects. And then we have Dark Lucius, where its level 4 version has a pathetically low 1000 attack, and requires you to destroy a monster by battle in order to proc its level up condition. However, it does have the ability to negate the effects of a monster it destroys by battle, so it can stop floating effects. Its level 6 version only has 1700 attack, which again is very low for a level 6 monster, and basically just has the same effects and level up condition as its past counterpart where its level 8 version finally has decent stats for the level at 2800. However, its effect is just DD Crazy Beast, where it banishes any monster destroys by battle, while also negating their effects. And then the new piece of support that the level archetype received was called Level Down, which is basically the opposite of Level Up, 
where you can return a high level level monster to the deck in order to special summon the lower level version of it from the graveyard, ignoring its summoning conditions. So it could be a decent card if you're trying to counter an opponent's level monster, although none of the monsters outside of Horus really saw competitive play, so it wasn't really something you'd need to concern yourself with. Although since it was quick play, I guess it could be used in order to allow another monster to attack during the battle phase. So, the new support they received in 2006 definitely didn't do anything to help them out. And level monsters wouldn't see a resurgence in play until 2013, when Dragon Rulers came out, and some of them used Horus in the side deck as an option. And then in 2009, they released Wing Kribo level 9, randomly, and it has no affiliation with its level 10 counterpart, and doesn't actually need to be leveled up at all. So the fact that it's a level monster is kind of irrelevant and probably just a flavorful thing. And that was kind of it for level monsters until 2016, where they randomly decided to release support for two of the level monsters, that being Silent Magician and Silent Swordsman. And by randomly, I think it's because they were anime cards. The Silent Magician archetype received a card aptly named just Silent Magician with no level, which is a level 4 monster that can be special summoned from your hand by tributing any spellcaster type monster you control. It gained 500 attack for each card in your opponent's hand, once per turn it can negate one spell card effect, and if it was destroyed on the field by an opponent's card, you got to special summon Silent Magician level 8 from your hand or deck, ignoring its summoning conditions. So with Silent Magician, you no longer had to use Silent Magician level 4 in order to go into the level 8 version. And the card itself was just good on its own. A once per turn spell card negate that could float into a 3500 tank beat stick if it was destroyed was just way better than what the level monsters were trying to accomplish on their own. And the Silent Swordsman was kind of in the same vein, it was a level 4 monster that could special summon itself from your hand by tributing any warrior type monster. Once per turn, it could also negate a spell card, it gained 500 attack during each player's standby phases, and if it was destroyed, you got to special summon a Silent Swordsman monster from your hand or deck, ignoring its summoning conditions. Which meant it could go straight into Silent Swordsman level 7 and negate all spell effects on the field. The fact that both of these cards just floated into the main boss monster of the archetype meant you didn't really need to play any of the other level monsters and could just ignore the entire mechanic entirely and only reap the benefits of the final stages of those monsters. Although in 2016, even being able to just completely skip all the steps and go straight into the big guy, these two cards were not enough for either of those archetypes to see competitive play. Not in the TCG anyway. When they were brought over to Duel Links, they absolutely saw competitive play, and one of their support cards was even put on their ban list. As in addition to the Silent Magician and the Silent Swordsman, they also released a couple of other support cards for them, and one of them was called Silent Sword Slash. Where on a quick play spell card, you could increase the attack of a Silent Swordsman monster you controlled by 1500 permanently. And also, until the end of the turn, that monster is immune to card effects. And being immune to all card effects is easily the best for protection that a card can have. So you could just chain Silent Sword Slash to one of your opponent's removal effects. It allowed you to simultaneously give your monster a huge attack boost, avoid one of your opponent's effects, and then basically have an immune monster with a whole bunch of attack points on the field that was just going to crash over what her opponent might have with no problem. And also, it could be banished from the graveyard in order to add a Silent Swordsman monster from your deck to your hand, which was just a little bit too high of a power level for Duel Links, although not good enough to see any kind of competitive play in the regular TCG. And then after 2016, there wasn't any other new level monster support, or any new level monsters until 2021, so very recently, when they released the Armed Dragon Thunder series. These are a series of support cards for the Armed Dragon monsters, which are actually level monsters, although they work a little bit differently than the original ones, and can be played alongside the original Armed Dragon monsters as well. As the Armed Dragon Thunder monsters have the effects, where their names are treated as the original Armed Dragon monsters while on the field or graveyard, and they can send a monster from the hand to the graveyard in order to forcefully level themselves up, and special summon the higher level Armed Dragon monster from your hand or deck, but only 2-3 to three levels higher each time. And since their names are treated as the originals, you could use Arm Dragon Thunder level 5 in order to properly bring out Arm Dragon level 7 from your deck. And the Arm Dragon Thunders also have effects that activate if they're sent to the graveyard in order to activate the effects of a dragon monster, which usually just involves gaining advantage in some way. So if you have a handful of Arm Dragon Thunders, it would be very easy to go all the way into the level 10 version with the level 3 version immediately on normal summon, as you could use level 3 to go into level 5, then level 5 into level 7, and then finally level 7 into level 10, while gaining advantage as long as you were able to ditch armed dragon monsters from your hand for each of those level ups. So, it seems like they kind of fixed the level up effects by just allowing you to do them whenever you want. 
However, they kind of already figured out how to properly create an archetype of level up monsters way before the Arm Dragon Thunder monsters came out. More specifically, with Rank Up XC's monsters. The whole theme of level up monsters was just weaker monster slowly leveling up into a stronger version of itself. And this is exactly how a lot of Rank Up XC's archetypes work. Let's take a look at the digital bugs for example. They have three Xyz monsters who can rank up into higher level versions of themselves by detaching two materials from their previous iterations. Digital Bug Corbage can special summon itself on top of Scar Radiator or any other rank 3 or 4 insect type Xyz monster by just detaching two of its materials and putting itself on top of it. Digital Bug Rhino Sebes can do the same thing but for a rank 5 or 6 insect type monster, which Digital Bug Corbage fits that description. Anyone who's played Duel Links knows exactly how successful these Xyz monsters are, especially for their ability to rank themselves up on top of other monsters, even if they aren't specifically other monsters from their archetype. There's also the Utopia cards, which can rank up a lot easier, as a lot of the Utopia cards are just rank up on top of the original Utopia, and there's a couple of other rank up archetypes, but a lot of those require to use spell cards in order to bring out the higher level versions of themselves. But I think the Xyz monsters who level up on top of each other kind of fit the whole theme of leveling up better than the level monsters did. Mainly because they don't require main deck space. A lot of the times if you play the level monsters, you're going to get a lot of bricks in your hand as you don't want to have the higher level monsters in your hand, ever. Even if you did have the option to special summon them from the hand with their normal procedure. It was just always better if they were special summoned from the deck. So if they only ever existed in the extra deck, then you would never have to worry about accidentally drawing all the higher level monsters which was also fixed with the Arm Dragon Thunder monsters, where they're also useful in the hand because they have effects that activate if they're used as materials for the Dragon Monster stuff. So if it wasn't for the Arm Dragon Thunder cards, I probably would have said that the XC's rank up mechanic completely replaced how level monsters work. But the Arm Dragon Thunders all having Atlantean-like effects, where they gain advantages if they're used as materials to activate the effects of Dragon Monsters, definitely makes them useful while in your hand, and not just automatic dead brick cards like the old ones used to be. And a pretty funny thing to note about some of the level monsters is that there were a couple of retrains of some of the level monsters that saw way more competitive success than their original counterparts ever did. More specifically, Dark Arm Dragon and Dark Graffer. Dark Arm Dragon was the dark counterpart version of Arm Dragon level 7, and was so influential it was part of a tier 0 deck that literally revolved around the card. And all the card did was allowed you to destroy a card in the field by banishing a dark monster from your graveyard with a non-once-per-turn effect. And it could be special summoned from your hand if you controlled exactly three dark monsters in your graveyard. And all of this was way better than the original, which was cumbersome to bring out, and only had a weaker lightning vortex-like effect that required you to use resources from your hand to use. And Dark Greffer is a dark counterpart of Warrior Die Greffer, which Dark Lucius Level 4 is a level retrain of that vanilla monster as well and Dark Greffer has seen pretty much constant competitive play ever since it came out, and is currently limited to one copy because it's too good with Dark Warrior Gambas. Whereas Dark Lucius never saw any competitive play, which is ironic because Dark Lucius is in a whole bunch of card artwork, including Sakuretsu Armor, which is a trap card that was kind of a staple in the early days of Yu-Gi-Oh, so a lot of people know of it and have used it. And lastly, there is a Duel Links only archetype of level monsters called the Masked Knights which all have effects that allow you to, once per turn, inflict effect damage to your opponent, and level up during the standby phase. They're not good enough to see competitive play in Duel Links either, so that's not really worth a mention outside of just noting that they exist in that game. So why exactly did the level monsters fail? The biggest reason was they were just too slow to reach their full potential. Most of them required you to wait around a full turn before you could level up to their better versions, and almost none of them had effects that were actually worth waiting around for. Even the level monsters that did see competitive play, they were only used because of a combination of things in the meta just going well for them, where dragon rulers were broken enough to facilitate the downsides of Horus, and the dragon rulers coincidentally allowed you to search out the cards needed very easily by just doing their plays like normal. And coincidentally, the boss monster of the Horus archetype just happened to have a really good effect. And even then, it was only used as a side option and kind of a niche one at that, where it wasn't even played in every dragon ruler deck. And generally, cards that require you to wait around in order to do something are just not fast enough with how the game works. Where there's all kinds of removal that just kind of makes cards not super valuable if they have to stay around too long, or can't float into other cards. Which is what they figured out with the Silent Magician retrains, and how they bring out their boss monsters through their floating effects. And of course the Armed Dragon Thunder retrains, which don't have to wait around at all, 
and can do the level up immediately. So if they were to fix level monsters to be less bad, what they would do is find a way to allow them to level up faster and just give the cards better effects, which is exactly what they did with the Arm Dragon Thunder retrains. And in fact, the Arm Dragon Thunder series is just a really good example of what was wrong with the original level cards, i.e. being too slow to level up and what they could do to fix them, i.e. just give them much better effects in addition to some kind of floating effects, like they did with the Silent Magician retrains. There are a handful of cards in the game that are able to treat spell and trap cards as monsters, but not in the way you might think. There is a whole series of cards called trap monsters, which are basically trap cards that are also monsters and have a whole bunch of specific rulings that exist just for them. No, what we're talking about here with these failed cards and mechanics is specifically cards like Magical Hats, and to a lesser extent Dark Sanctuary. Dark Sanctuary allows you to place the spirit message pieces to the field as monsters, which are immune to card effects and also cannot be attacked. They basically exist as ghosts that can't be interacted with, which take up monster board space. For the most part, the cards summoned by Dark Sanctuary are not a big deal, because they basically exist to allow your back row to have more cards in order to activate the win condition of Destiny board. It's magical hats that really causes the problems. There's a whole host of rulings when it comes to this card, because what it does is allows you to special summon two spell or trap cards from your deck as normal monsters with no attribute, level, or types in face-down defense position, as the intention of it is to blank out attacks by also putting down face down one of your monsters and then shuffling three cards so your opponent doesn't know which one they're attacking into. However, because Magical Hats allows you to treat any spell or trap card in your deck as a monster on the field, this causes a couple of ruling confusions as well as clarification nightmares. There are a couple of spell or trap cards that have floating effects that activate when they're sent to the graveyard, and sometimes they activate when they're destroyed by battle while under the effects of Magical Hats. And sometimes they don't and most spell trap cards are just not created with the intention of being turned into monsters. They had to create so many ruling clarifications for Magical Hats, stating that cards like Gear Town do in fact trigger their floating effects on a special summon of an ancient gear monster when it's destroyed while being treated as a monster. But I'm sure they don't want to iterate on this design space, specifically because it's a nightmare to balance. Sometimes a mechanic will fail, not because it's bad, because it simply creates weird rulings. Malefics are an archetype of monsters mostly based on the game's most iconic boss monsters from the first three eras of Yu-Gi-Oh! and were played by Paradox in the Bonds Beyond Time movie where they were called the strongest monsters in history. Unfortunately, in the OCG, TCG, and Master Duel, Malefics haven't really lived up to the legendary status the anime gave them, which is why they're the topic of today's video, delving into why they never saw too much competitive success, as well as where they actually saw use. Now, what is a Malefic monster? The Malefic monsters can be divided into two categories. There's the Malefic Dragons and the Malefic Gears. The Malefic Dragons, other than Truth, Perigym, and Paradox, are all based on iconic Yu-Gi-Oh! boss monsters and features the likes of Malefic Blue-Eyes White Dragon, Malefic Cyberan Dragon, and Malefic Stardust Dragon. These monsters can be normal summoner set and, other than Truth Dragon, are instead brought out by banishing respective monster from your hand deck or extra deck. So in order to bring up Malefic Red Eyes, you have to banish a Red Eyes Black Dragon from your hand or deck, and to bring up Malefic Cyberan Dragon, you need to banish the original Cyberan Dragon from your extra deck, and so on and so on. This mechanic was actually why Malefics were so strong in the anime, as they bypassed the restrictions of the regular Sony mechanics, and so Paradox was able to spam the field with multiple Malefic monsters. But in the TCG, OCG, and Master Duel, most of the Malefic monsters have an effect that stipulates that you can only ever control one Malefic monster at a time. And that's not the only restriction that comes with these dragons, as they also prevent your other monsters from declaring attacks while you control them, meaning that you can only ever attack with one monster at a time. And on top of that, if you don't control a face of field spell, the Malefics will destroy themselves, and some of them even require Malefic World specifically to be on the field so they don't blow up. There are some variations between the effects of Malefic monsters, and some even have their own unique effects, like how Malefic Truth Dragon can only be summoned when a Malefic monster destroyed by battle or card effect, or how Malefic Stardust Dragon protects the field spells from being destroyed by card effects. But for the most part, they're pretty synonymous boss monsters that only vary by stats and the monster they banish to summon themselves out. The Malefic Gears, on the other hand, are a series of monsters designed to allow the deck to synchro summon and access Malefic Paradox Dragon, their synchro boss monster. Malefic Parallel Gear is the only tune in the archetype and allows you to synchro summon despite most of the Malefic Dragons only allowing one Malefic monster on the field, and does this by letting you use Malefic monsters in your hand as synchro material. Malefic Paradox Gear isn't a tuner, but special summons Malefic Parallel Gear from your deck and allows you to add a Malefic monster to your hand, effectively making it a one card synchro summon, and you can even banish it from your graveyard to summon out a Malefic monster from your hand instead of banishing the respective monster. So, why are Malefics failed cards? In theory, the Malefics lend themselves to two different styles of play depending on the deck they're in. In a pure strategy, you would rely on their easy summoning conditions as well as the consistency the Malefic world provides to ensure that you always have a huge beat stick on field. 
And in combination with Malefic Gears, you can use the varying levels of the Malefic monsters in your hand to access level 9, 10, and 12 synchro boss monsters. Or instead of playing a pure Malefic strategy, you could splash the Malefic monsters into a deck that's already playing their associated brick, allowing you to splash Malefic Blue Eyes into your Blue Eyes list with ease since the deck has already played multiple copies of Blue Eyes White Dragon. This gives these iconic strategies access to a free beat stick they can also use as an extender for extra clays, provided they have a field spell on field. In practice, however, Malefics have a lot holding them back both as a pure strategy and as a splashable option in other decks. The first big issue is that most of the Malefics need to play a ton of bricks in the main deck that do not synergize that well with the rest of the deck in order to bring out their boss monster. Red Eyes, Blue Eyes, and Rainbow Dragon are all necessary to play to bring out their Malefic forms, but are useless for the rest of the Malefic strategy and make the deck quite bricky. The common restrictions of the Malefic Dragons have also virtually ruined any chance that they might be a viable as a pure strategy. Especially because most of the Malefic Dragons are basically just vanilla beat sticks that don't have a positive effect that make their harsh restrictions worthwhile. Not being able to attack with any other monster while you control a Malefic Dragon makes them pretty ineffective as beat sticks and OTK tools as you're only ever going to be able to beat over one of your opponent's boss monsters. Even the strongest Malefic monster, Truth Dragon, can't OTK your opponent on an open board. The first restriction is even worse, as it makes it so the archetype is incapable of comboing with itself, since it only allows you to ever control one Malefic monster at a time. This makes it so you can't swarm the field with your Malefic monsters as Paradox did in the anime, severely limiting your board presence and your range of extra deck plays making it really hard for Malefics to access more modern tools like Lynx or XC summoning. Synchro summoning is also difficult for the deck, as it's entirely reliant on you drawing Malefic gears. But by far, the worst restriction of the Malefics is that you have to control a face-up field spell. Otherwise, they just destroy themselves before you can use them, and this directly counters their main upside of being easy to summon. Since by requiring a field spell to not blow themselves up, it makes every Malefic monster a two-card combo to bring out rather than just a free special summon. This is part of why Malefic counterparts aren't often splashed into other strategies. Blue Eyes, for example, definitely appreciates having a free level 8 extender that they can use to go into their extra deck and even has multiple field spells that they can benefit from. But they're not always going to have access to those field spells, and even if they did, the deck has a whole range of better options for free level 8 extenders that actually have beneficial effects and don't blow themselves up. However, despite how unappealing the Malefics are for most strategies, a couple of the Malefic monsters have actually seen a decent amount of competitive success. The decks that have been able to use the Malefic monsters the best either negate their on-field effects so their restrictions don't apply, or center around a strong field spell that they have easy access to. Both instances, however, heavily rely on the use of Floodgates. The most interesting Malefic card by far is Malefic Stardust Dragon. This card comes with all the same restrictions you'd expect from Malefic Dragons, and is even the second weakest Malefic Dragon based on stats alone having a measly 2500 attack and 2000 defense, just like the original Stardust Dragon. This makes Malefic Stardust Dragon a decent beat stick, but a lot weaker when compared to something like Malefic Cyber and Dragon, or even Malefic Blue Eyes White Dragon. But even despite its weak stats, Malefic Stardust Dragon is the Malefic monster that's seen the most amount of competitive play. Unlike most of the other Malefic monsters, Malefic Stardust Dragon actually has an effect that's designed to mirror its uncorrupted counterpart, as it protects all face-up field spells from being destroyed by card effects. This has allowed for Stardust Dragon to be an absolute boon for decks that revolve around using their field spell, and nowhere is that more apparent than in Gravekeepers. Gravekeepers are a strategy that occasionally appears in the metagame whenever there's a graveyard reliant strategy at top tables. Specifically because of how easily the deck can find and utilize their field spell, Necro Valley. Necro Valley has had a number of changes in how its effects works throughout the years, but basically it shuts down graveyard interaction by preventing cards from being banished from the graveyard or moved from the graveyard to a different place. This has made Necro Valley an integral piece of the history of Yu-Gi-Oh's meta, as its floodgate effect is so strong that it's capable of shutting down strategies that rely on the graveyard almost entirely. Even in the modern format, Necro Valley has seen a ton of competitive play, since it's one of the strongest counters to tier limits. But Gravekeepers specifically have a ton of synergy with Necro Valley. Commandant allows for the deck to consistently find Necro Valley, and while it's on the field, all Gravekeepers gain a huge 500 attack boost. But that's not all. Because Necro Valley also allows for Gravekeepers to use some incredibly overpowered effects, like Royal Tribute, which can hand rip every monster from your opponent's hand, or Hidden Temples, which can lock your opponent out of special summoning entirely. When you have a strong floodgate on field that benefits you immensely, your opponent is going to want to out it immediately. And for a while, Gravekeepers really struggled to protect their Necro Valley from targeted destruction. Which is why Gravekeepers began to incorporate Malefic Stardust Dragon, especially in older formats. You see, Gravekeepers could easily play Malefic Stardust Dragon without any kind of brick in their main deck, because Malefic Stardust Dragon could summon itself by banishing a Stardust Dragon from the extra deck, so you weren't forced to play an unsearchable brick unlike most of the other Malefic Dragon. So it was astonishingly easy to bring Malefic Stardust Dragon to the field. 
And because the entire Gravekeeper strategy was centered around finding Necro Valley, you were always going to have access to it so Malefic Stardust didn't blow itself up. As soon as Malefic Stardust hits the field, you are safe in knowledge that your opponent can't destroy your Necro Valley with Mystical Space Typhoon or Heavy Storm. Protecting your Floodgate and stopping your opponent from playing while also being a decently strong body on field, which you can use to gradually close out the game. Essentially, Malefic Stardust Dragon makes Necro Valley difficult to out, and Necro Valley makes Malefic Stardust Dragon difficult to out by floodgating your opponent, making them complement each other perfectly. This strategy survived for a decently long time, but eventually most of the Gravekeepers found their way out of Malefic decks as they began to focus less on how the Gravekeepers complement Necro Valley and more on how Floodgates complemented the Malefics, with Commandant being the only Gravekeeper's monster left still seen play in these deck lists because Commandant could search for Necro Valley. In general, the Malefic cards have a lot of synergy with some of the game's strongest Floodgates. A card like Rivalry, There Can Be Only One, and Goes in Match can lock your opponent into only controlling one monster. And a card like Dimensional Fissure doesn't affect the summoning conditions of the Malefic monsters as they banish to summon themselves out anyways, making Dimensional Fissure a really solid tool in slowing your opponent down. But there is one specific Floodgate which pairs extremely well with the Malefic monsters by getting rid of one of their downsides. With Skill Drain phase up on the field, two of the three main restrictions of the Malefic monsters don't apply since their continuous effects are being negated. So, while you still can only control one Malefic monster, your other monsters can now attack, and you also don't need to control a field spell to prevent your Malefic monsters from being blown up. All the while, Skill Drain is also negating the on-field effects of every monster your opponent controls, preventing them from playing and making it harder to access their high attack boss monsters. This was particularly advantageous for Malefic monsters, as most of them have pretty high attack and are difficult to out without monster effects, which is why Malefic Cyber and Dragon saw a decent amount of competitive play, in decks that actually use and centered around Malefics. Malefic Cyber and Dragon doesn't have any unique effects that make it better to run over the other Malefic monsters, but what it does have is 4000 attack. This makes it tied with Malefic Rainbow Dragon as the second strongest Malefic monster in the game, as it's only being out by Malefic Truth Dragon, which comparatively has a much harder summoning condition. But the reason why Malefic Cyber and Dragon saw competitive play Malefic decks and Malefic Rainbow Dragon didn't was because of the slight difference in their summoning conditions. Malefic Rainbow Dragon did manage to run the original Rainbow Dragon in your main deck a bricky card that you wouldn't even be able to summon if you drew it. Malefic Cyber and Dragon on the other hand, like Malefic Stardust Dragon, has its associated monster located in the extra deck. This made Malefic Cyber and Dragon 10 times better than Malefic Rainbow Dragon, as you could just run 3 copies of Malefic Cyber and Dragon alongside 3 copies of the original Cyber and Dragon in your extra deck, rather than being forced to run any copies of Rainbow Dragon to make your deck more bricky for no reason. This made Malefic Cyber and Dragon the perfect choice of Malefic Monster to pair with Skill Drain. It was incredibly easy to summon and came with an insane attack stat to boot. This is why Malefic Cyber and Dragon is the only Malefic monster other than Malefic Stardust Dragon that has seen any competitive success. No other Malefic monster has seen the same heights of success as either card, and they were eventually ran side by side with the same strategy by virtue of being the strongest Malefic cards that didn't also require main deck break. Necro Valley was also played with these Malefic decks, but rather than being the main focus of the deck as it was in the Gravekeepers, Necro Valley was instead run alongside other generically good field spells, such as Gear Town. Now, Gear Town doesn't appear to do anything for Malefics or offer any kind of floodgate that you could use to slow your opponent down, which makes it appear to be a strange choice since you're unlikely to ever use this effect to perform a tribute summon. But the way the old field spells rules worked allowed for Gear Town to bring some insanely strong beaters to the field and apply a ton of pressure to your opponent. You see, when Gear Town is destroyed and sent to the graveyard, you can special summon any ancient gear monster from your hand deck or graveyard. And the way you would trigger this effect of Gear Town is by activating a new field spell over your Gear Town. In the modern era, this doesn't do anything, as your Gear Town would just be sent to the graveyard. But older field spell rules meant that activating a new field spell would destroy the old one, and thus allow for Gear Town to trigger, as long as you set the other field spell on top of Gear Town face down, otherwise it would miss timing. This gave Malefic decks access to another powerful beater by just activating their Necro Valley over their Gear Town and allowing them to summon Ancient Gear Gadgetron Dragon for free. A card with an impressive 3000 attack stat that helped making OTK way easier, especially under Skill Drain. This style Malefic deck did eventually fade out, the Floodgates were still strong, and so were the beaters, but they just couldn't keep up with the ever evolving meta with their style of Caveman Yu Gi Oh! Despite the interesting use of Malefic Cyber and Dragon and Malefic Stardust Dragon, most of the other Malefic monsters have only ever seen fringe experimentation at best. Malefic Red Eyes is a good example. It's by far the weakest of all the Malefic Dragons, but it benefits a lot from being a Red Eyes card. This has allowed it to see a decent amount of experimentation in Dragon Link, a deck which already plays cards like Black Metal Dragon which could search out Malefic Red Eyes Dragon by linking it off into Striker Dragon, a card which searches for a strong field spell. But because of the requirement of having to play the original Red Eyes Black Dragon, Dragon Link players found that it was far more optimal to just play Red Eyes Darkness Metal Dragon rather than playing a breaky card that was hard to use if you drew it. 
Malefic Blue Eyes also saw experimentation as an extender in Blue Eyes, as a target for Melody of Awakened Dragon. But with the release of Blue Eyes Alternative White Dragon, Malefic Blue Eyes became obsolete, as Blue Eyes list would rather just search Alternative Dragon alongside the original Blue Eyes to summon it. The Malefics in general became really clunky and awkward to use in the modern era due to their restrictions and negative effects. And as a result, in order to make Malefics a playable strategy, they printed a card which actively negates the main downsides of Malefics, Malefic Territory. With Territory, you get a free copy of Malefic World from your deck and put it into your field zone, fulfilling the field spell requirement even though Malefic World doesn't have an amazing effect like Necro Valley. Territory's first continuous effect allows you to actually swarm the field with Malefic Monsters by literally changing the effects of all Malefic Monsters. Now, while you control Territory, instead of only being able to control one Malefic Monster at a time, you can control multiple Malefic Monsters, providing they each had different names. And its second continuous effect acts as a one-sided skill drain. It doesn't come with the same benefits as Skill Drain since it doesn't floodgate your opponent in any way, but it does allow you to attack with multiple monsters by negating the effects of your Malefic monsters during the battle phase. Territory is an excellent card that seeks to fix all of the issues of Malefics and does a pretty decent job of making the strategy actually functional. But even despite Territory's absurd design, it's not enough to allow for Malefics to see play in the modern era. A monster having high attack or being an okay special summon isn't reasoned enough for Malefics to see competitive play especially not as a splash in other decks, which would rather just play stronger special summon. All in all, despite the role and history of Yu-Gi-Oh's meta, the Malefics were just a flash in the pan and didn't have a huge impact on the way the game was played as a whole. Their use did showcase, however, the power of Floodgates when combined with high attack and hard out monsters, and the DNA Malefic decks can even be found in modern strategies like Guru, which uses a combination of Floodgates alongside the high attack Red Eyes Dark Dragoon to lock your opponent out of play in the game. Grand Maju also carries the Spirit of Malefics by emphasizing Floodgates that banish while using Grand Maju as a big beat stick to steal games from your opponent. But in terms of Malefics themselves, it's really unlikely they'll ever see competitive play again. Other decks do what they aim to do but way better, and even as an extender in decks that could use them, there are just better options available. The deck would need a lot to see play again in the modern format, including ways to easily find Floodgates or at the very least, a better field spell than Malefic World. As an anti-meta strategy, it could definitely score some wins against unsuspecting opponents, especially since the Floodgates Malefics use are insanely strong. But as it stands right now, it's going to take a whole lot more for them to even enter Rogue tier right now, let alone the metagame. Spirits are a special type of effect monster, which all generally share the effect of returning to the hand during the end phase when their normal summon or flip face up, and with the restriction of not being able to be special summoned. Out of all the mechanics that never amounted to anything in Yu-Gi-Oh!, spirits have not only not received much cohesive support to the mechanic, but they're also one of the ones that have aged the worst. The main idea behind spirit monsters was to have monsters with really powerful effects when they hit the field. They also have the added benefit of being reusable in your next turn by returning to your hand during the end phase, while also not being able to be destroyed by battle or spell speed 1 removal effects. The balancing mechanism was that since they cannot be special summoned, spirits would always be taking up your normal summon for the turn, putting you behind on tempo and field presence by using them. This is essentially what killed any longevity the mechanic had, as the game became more and more special summon focused with time, even back in the day. It didn't help that this mechanic had the same issues that Gemini's did, in that many of their monsters wouldn't see play even if they had no restrictions whatsoever attached to them. Even the concept of reusable normal summons, which was valuable back in the day, would also get overshadowed by better monsters which could grab you follow-up for the next turn without all the downsides of spirits. If even back in the day these monsters were already falling out of favor, we can see there is a very good reason there's only been a single spirit monster to see play in the last several years. Still, despite being home to so many unimpressive cards throughout the years, let's go through how competitively relevant spirit monsters were in Yu-Gi-Oh's history. First, we have Yadagarasu. This is a level 2 Wind Fiend with only 200 attack. It has the usual spirit monster stipulations, and then it cannot be specialed and returns to the hand during the end phase of the turn it was normal or flip face up, and the effect to skip your opponent's next draw phase if it inflicts battle damage. This was one of the couple spirit monsters to have ever put on the ban list, and the only one to still be there in some way as the time of recording this video, though that has more to do with Konami being slow to update the ban list than anything else. Yada saw play as the ultimate win more card in extremely old Yu-Gi-Oh formats. With the games being extremely swingy due to all those powerful spells still being legal, you could leverage a momentary advantage into a game-ending play if the opponent couldn't answer Yanta denying them their outs turn after turn. However, this card only became really good when coupled together with Sand Gand and Chaos Emperor Dragon Envoy of the End. In short, the combo would use Chaos Emperor Dragon's Field and Hand Wipe to send away all your opponent's cards and your Sand Gand, so that you could surge Yanta from your deck and use your normal summon to lock your opponent entirely out of the game. Despite being clearly the least powerful card of the three, Yada was the one to remain on the ban list the longest. 
Though, to be fair, that's because both Sangin and Cast Emperor Dragon ended up getting eroded at some point. This card was one of the few spirit monsters which actually earned all the restrictions spirit monsters have by default. It was never overly powerful by itself, and only saw play due to the brokenness of other cards surrounding it at the time, being just a finisher. Unfortunately for Yana though, it used a mechanic which Konami would deem unhealthy, draw phase denial. So just like Time Seal, it was banned for too long and still isn't at 3 copies, despite being completely unoffensive. Next up we have Tsukiyomi, a level 4 dark spellcaster monster. It has all the usual spirit restrictions and has the effect to target and flip down a monster in the field when it's normal summoned or flip face up. Tsukiyomi just had the perfect combination of stats, attribute, and effect to see play during early Yu-Gi-Oh formats. It was a dark monster, which gave it chaos energy. Its 1100 attack may look unimpressive at first, but it was just enough to beat over monarchs, which it had flipped face down, since they all had 1000 defense. And it returning to the hand would protect Tsukiyomi from being removed by those monsters too. This card's effect can also be used to further your game plan by setting your flip monsters or soft ones per turns to flip them face down and reuse them. The other spirit monster from this era that saw play was a Sewer Priest. This is a level 4 light fairy monster with 1700 attack, Besides the spirit effects, it can also attack all monsters your opponent controls once each. A sewer priest was good for beating over all scapegoat tokens or removing entire chains of recruiter monsters, as it could attack over them again and again when they kept bringing them out. Its light attribute was even more important for chaos since there was actually a shortage of good light monsters, to the point where people sometimes had to play really mediocre ones just to fill space. Tsukiyomi and a sewer priest were arguably the peak of the spirit mechanic in Yu-Gi-Oh! For the time, they both had really good effects which weren't present on any other monsters. Their special summon restriction actually served to balance them from being brought back with revival cards. Them returning to the hand gave them a downside, but was also a benefit because it meant you could use them turn after turn until they got answered. At least one of these could be found in most deck lists from back in the day, and while a big part of that is due to old Yu-Gi-Oh being so good stuff focused that people would just play the strongest generic cards available, never again did spirits see such widespread play. Then we have Dark Dust Spirit a level 6 earth zombie monster with the effect to blow up all other face-up monsters on the field when it's normal summon. Dark Dust Spirit actually has a pretty great effect, especially for the time it was released in. Its downside lies in the fact that it requires a tribute summon to be brought out, and it returns to your hand during the end phase. And if spirit monsters could already put you behind tempo by using them normally, Dark Dust Spirit sets you back even further because of the tribute cost. However, there is a reason why this was the only tribute summon spirit monster to ever see widespread competitive play. The release of Treeborn Frog, which can special summon itself from the graveyard every turn as long as you don't control spells or traps, made monarch strategies viable for a really long time. However, you had the issue of needing to draw into multiple monarchs alongside your live Treeborn to actually get value off of it turn after turn. Dark Dust Spirit being the best reusable tribute summon available helped with this shortcoming massively. Once frog monarchs became a more coherent strategy as the frog engine expanded, this card became a staple in those strategies, only being rivaled by a few other one tribute monsters in power. Its relevancy did wane with time, as other boss monsters such as Vanities and Light and Darkness Dragon had its effect, which aged a lot better, but that didn't stop Dark Dust Spirit from getting tops to its name even as late as 2014. Despite those being pretty good cards, the mechanic would be left in limbo when it came to support for a really long time. To put it into perspective, these cards were all from 2003. And while Konami did put out some pretty mediocre support for the mechanic at the time, the next large batch of spirit support wouldn't come out until the Synchro era and the same set introduced Stardust Dragon, we also got the first spirit which broke up convention and could be special summoned in Yamato no Kami. There was also generic support for the mechanic with Izanagi as well as a series of equip cards specifically meant for spirit monsters. While the support wasn't all that bad outside of the equip cards, there still was not enough cohesion between the new support and the old, mostly mediocre cards to make a proper spirit deck work yet. But this batch did give us a monster which would eventually see a little bit of play in Kinkya Byo. This monster has the ability to special summon another level 1 monster from your graveyard when it's normal summoned, but it gets banished when Kin Kabyo leaves the field. It saw play in Chaos Piper strategies as a way to recycle Mystic Piper every turn to draw a card, as Piper contributed itself to draw a card, and then another if the card drawn was a level 1 monster. It was a pretty ingenious use of the card, but unfortunately those strategies weren't that good at sending it to the competition at the time anyways. Despite being a great rank 1 enabler when XC's monsters were eventually released, it saw no play due to most of them being awfully mediocre back then, and due to there being way better options that were introduced later on in the game, such as the Lurless Engine in Modern Yu-Gi-Oh! Spirits were forgotten and left behind for quite some time then, which led Konami's first attempt at revitalizing the mechanic with the new spirit support, which worked not only pretty nicely as an engine between themselves, but also had synergy with the other existing spirits. These were Aratama and Nikitama, released in back-to-back -back sets. Aratama is a level 4 Dark Fiend with, of course, all the usual spirit effects, on normal summon, it would get to add any spirit monster from your deck to your hand, except itself. Nikitama is a level 4 light fairy with the same stats as Aratama, 
and when it's normal summoned, you get to normal summon another spirit monster in addition to your regular normal summoner sent. Also, when it's sent to the graveyard, you draw a card if you control a spirit monster when it's sent there. These two formed a powerful rank 4 engine, which was at its peak at the time. Kage to Kage, a level 4 with special summon itself when you normal summoned, was a must in pretty much all versions of these decks. You could even trigger its effect twice if you drew two, since you got an additional normal summon. So was Blackluster Soldier and Void the Beginning, because Aratama and Nikitama were dark and light respectively. This powerful advantage engine lets you search spirits every turn with Aratama returning to the hand, while also drawing a card with Nikitama while also spamming rank 4s. Since Aratama lets you search any spirit, it even enabled the use of some spirits which had never seen play before, such as Izanami, which lets you recycle spirits from the graveyard, and Yaksha, which bounce spells and traps. This was the best adaptation spirits could have for the modern time, as getting extra normals would circumvent their downside of not being able to special summon, and by using them as material for XEs, you wouldn't be putting yourself behind on field presence during the end phase. With all that said, though this attempt worked for a while, they were a slower and brickier strategy than most other availables at the time, and only lasted a while as a row contender until the next tide of power crap swept them off the charts again. Now, let's look at a couple of times Konami tried to play this mechanic with varying levels of success. First we have the Yosenjus, an archetype made of mostly level 4 beast warrior monsters, but which also had some pendulum support going for it. Yosenjus borrowed some elements from the spirit monsters, in that all of the beast warriors returned themselves to the hand during the end phase of the turn that their normal summoned. However, the inverse was true for the high level ones, which returned to the end phase during the turn that they were special summoned instead. This lets you play the archetype either as a rank 4 spam strategy, which spams the extra deck while plussing you and disrupting your opponent, or as a pendulum strategy, which could reuse their on summon effects of their boss monsters. Ultimately, the first playstyle won out competitively, getting a few tops to its name during the highly disputed formats that followed Duelist Alliance. It was essentially just a heavily power crept version of the previous Aratama Nikitama strategy, a spammy rank 4 strategy which benefits from much better generic support due to the Osenju's typing and attribute as well as direct support. They had the same theming as spirits, but could have much more cohesive support due to working with only their archetype and not a whole category of monsters. As a consequence, they could be very liberal with the extra normal summons you can get, and since every comma has them, it made them much better at spamming the field than the sole Nikitama in spirit decks ever could. The other instance of Konami trying to modernize spirits was Shinobirds, which were actually spirits unlike Yosenju's. The regular Shinobird monsters range from mediocre to terrible, but the ritual part of the archetype had some nice ideas going for it. Shinobird on Peacock can bounce up to three monsters your opponent controls to the hand when special summon, and then lets you special summon a level 4 lower spirit monster from your hand, ignoring its summoning conditions. Shino Baroness Peacock lets you spend three back row cards instead, and then special summons a spirit monster from your deck. Both of them also have the effect to bounce themselves during the end phase, but they also give you two tokens each when doing so. Peacock and Baron weren't subject to the regular spirit summon restrictions, despite being part of the archetype, since they're both rituals, which can only be special summoned by the ritual spell cards. Their on summon effects are actually really good, as non-destruction, non-targeting removal lets you get around almost every kind of protection a monster can have. Additionally, since they special summon spirits while bypassing their restrictions, this means they won't be bounced back to the hand during the end phase, letting you keep spirits with powerful effects around during your opponent's turn. At last, them giving you advantage when returning to the hand with the tokens they bring out could also have been a nice way to improve spirits, had this kind of effect been thought up sooner. Ultimately, they failed though, as even if they were good in a vacuum, combining the clunkiness of the ritual and spirit mechanics would obviously never amount to a competitive strategy. To make matters worse, they were confined to being an exclusively going second strategy, since the Shino Barons needed to bounce monsters or shuffle spells in order to get the second part of their effects off. All of this while coming out in an era where power crap was at its highest, with the release of Zodiac monsters in the same set they came out in, one of the most powerful archetypes of all time and the introduction of the Link mechanic not soon after. And yet, after another years-long gap of seeing no play, Konami would finally release the next and last spirit monsters to be considered a genuinely good card. Outside of a single instance where a spirit monster was played as a one-of, as a high-scale tech in some pendulum decks, this is the last instance of spirits being in the metagame. And that is, of course, a Mono Iwato. A level 4 Earth Rock monster with 1900 attack. Its effect is that monsters cannot activate their effects, except spirit monsters. One of the most oppressive effects that a card can have in Yu-Gi-Oh, this kind of floodgate has gotten countless other monsters banned, all present in a normal summonable monster with beefy stats. Amano is the only spirit monster which actually needs all of its restrictions not to be broken. It was a staple in true Draco decks for years when the deck was still relevant. When going first, you don't really activate any monster effects and also can gain extra normal summons with your true Draco back row. 
So you could use a modern water to prevent your opponent from stopping all of your powerful draw and search spells by making their Ash Blossom and Joy Spring be unable to be activated. Then, when going second, you could use it to disable the entirety of your opponent's board while the graveyard effects of your true Draco spells and traps pick it apart. The other deck which picked this up was Mystic Mind Burn much later, though not nearly as common as it was in True Draco. Imano was still a very good tech to make sure your mind would stick onto the field even when going second. Imano helps put in perspective why this mechanic has been almost completely forgotten by Konami. Even as far back as 2018, Konami could print a card that says your opponent cannot activate monster effects, something which cannot be power corrupt by anything short of locking your opponent out of the game entirely, as long as it was coupled with the spirit's usual restrictions. Even with this all-powerful effect, Amano still faced lots of competition in its role by Inspector Border, which offered a weaker lockdown, but with the huge upside of still being there to disrupt your opponent during their turn. While being the strongest part about the mechanic, Amano also makes sure there won't ever be good enough way to easily swarm the field with spirit monsters in the modern metagame. This leaves us where we are now, getting at most one new spirit monster every year. The way this type of monster functions is just an antithesis to modern card design, with the most recently released one being Konohana Sakua, which is pretty much just a Mono Iwato support, and the upcoming one being yet another Pendulum Scale, in hand Shin Kyudo Spirit, there is little reason to believe this mechanic will ever see play in a higher tier strategy ever again. Redirect effects like Shift are incredibly rare in the game and people aren't really clamoring for there to be more effects like this added. Shift has the effect that if your opponent attacks or activates a spell or trap card that targets a monster you control, you can simply change the target to another one of your monsters instead. Now, the reason these kinds of effects are inherently not very good is because there's no reason to redirect an effect when you can instead just negate the effect with the plethora of generic cards that offer that on a trap card nowadays. However, even in the early days of the game, there were inherent design flaws with cards like Shift, in the fact that you needed to have a well-established board for the card to even work in the first place. If you wanted to protect one of your monsters by changing attack target to another one, that means you need to have at least two monsters on the board, and having set Shift a turn before to activate. And it only works on targeted effects, so full board wipes like Raigeki and Dark Hole would be completely unaffected by it. And in fact, modern cards generally don't target either. However, just because Shift was never playable doesn't mean redirect effects themselves have never seen play. There is a generic rank 4 XZ monster called Carnagorgon Anti-Luminescent Knight, which actually saw a decent amount of competitive play. And basically what it does is have Shift's effect, except it works on any card you control, and redirects to any other card in the field instead of just your own. So, if you were going first and you wanted some form of protection for your board, you could end on this card in order to protect it from some of the popular single target removal options of their day. But even then, it was only used because they just didn't really have any other better options to use. So as soon as better effects were printed on generic ring 4 cards, this card immediately stops seeing play. Because even if you can redirect any card effect to one of your opponent's cards, it's still incredibly dependent on the meta and whether or not they're using card effects that can even be redirected to your opponent anyway, if they even bother to target at all. Union Monsters are pretty unique as a failed card mechanic, because they actually had a very competitive deck that was entirely comprised of Union Monsters. Although, that was more despite the fact that they were Unions, and not really because of how strong Union effects could be. The Union Monsters were introduced pretty early on in the game, as evident by the fact that they were given their own monster tag, like Flip and Spirit Monsters something they did a lot in earlier Yu-Gi-Oh's history that they kind of stopped after Gemini. As having a monster with its own unique tag allows you to create cards and effects that just say they work on Union monsters, rather than having to specify a name from an archetype. And the way early Unions worked was they shared about four effects. The first two effects were the ability to equip themselves to an appropriate Union target from the field as an equipped spell card, or if they were an equipped spell card, they could unequip themselves and special summon themselves from the spell and trap card zone. But they could only choose one of those two effects per turn in order to prevent loops. Additionally, its third effect was more of a restriction, that only one monster could be equipped with one union monster at a time. And lastly, if the monster that the union monster was equipped to would be destroyed by battle, you could destroy the equipped union monster instead. And pretty much all union monsters had these four effects until 2016. And early Union Monsters also had another shared distinction, which wasn't really an effect, it was more the fact that Union Monsters all required incredibly specific targets. There wasn't really generic Union Monsters in the first wave. Y-Head Dragon would specify that it could only be equipped to X-Head Cannon. Zombie Tiger specified that it could only be equipped to DK Commander. And more unique, Freezing Beast and Burning Beast were both Union Monsters that could equip themselves to each other. 
and Union Monsters were definitely not supposed to be generic and be equipable to anything. That didn't really become a thing until later on when they figured out that Unions weren't really a big deal. And part of the problem with early Union Monsters was the same problem that kind of plagues equipped spell cards. If the monster they're equipped to was removed from the field, even temporarily, or just flipped face down, they would go to the graveyard, making the Union Monster very vulnerable while it was equipped. And also, it was just hard to get two cards in the field at the same time, outside of a few outliers like Decayed Commander and Vampiric Orcus, which had the special effect of allowing you to special summon their Union counterparts from the hand. The other Unions required extra resources to get them on the field in order to start doing their equipping. The Union monsters basically existed so they could be equipped to their specific target, but you had to expend extra resources to get them on the field in the first place, which was something that was later rectified by other equip archetypes, or just types of cards that can only be equipped to specific cards, like Rider of the Stormwinds, which is a level 1 tuner that can equip itself directly from your hand to a dragon normal monster you control. And then it grants effects and prevents its target from being destroyed by destroying itself instead. Rider of the Stormwinds is basically a Union monster, but it's better because you don't need to get it on the field as a monster first before you can start equipping it, since you can do it straight from your hand. They didn't realize this would be a problem early on, because along with the first wave of Union monsters, they also released Frontline Base. This is a continuous spell card, where once per turn it allows you to special summon a level 4 or lower Union monster from your hand. And obviously they thought Frontline Base would be too strong if it allowed you to special summon any Union monster, because they also released a couple of high level Unions like Koitsu, Kiryu, and the two Parasites. And none of these Union monsters were particularly good anyway, so they could have easily allowed Frontline Base to special summon any of them. But whatever, they also had Combination Attack and Formation Union as support cards, but they weren't really as useful as Frontline Base. Combination Attack allowed you to unequip a Union monster after the monster is equipped to attack in order to allow that monster to attack again, and of course allow the Union monster to maybe attack as well if you put it into attack position. And Formation Union simply allowed you to use the first effect of the Union monster to either equip it to a face-up monster you control that was the correct target, or unequip it in special summon in attack position. And none of these cards helped very much with making Union monsters very good, as this was definitely the case of them overcorrected and trying to make them balance, for the worry that they might be too overpowered. Especially since the XYZ Dragon Cannon archetype also had their own fusions which could only be brought out through contact fusion, and also had the ability to destroy cards. Although, none of these original Union monsters saw any competitive play. So, two years later in 2005, they released some new support. They released a V Tiger Jet and W Wing Catapult, in addition to a new fusion monster for them and a combination fusion monster that worked with the previous XYZ Dragon Cannon. And none of these cards saw competitive play. However, they did release a really nice piece of support called Rollout. This is a trap card which allows you to equip a Union monster from your graveyard to a monster you control that Union monster could be equipped to basically allowing you to equip any Union monster to a monster you control, which included the high level ones that were normally a lot harder to use, because they couldn't be special some with frontline base. So with Rollout, all you need to do was get Aitsu on the field, and you can equip Koitsu directly from your graveyard to it. And even with this much better support card, Union still did not see any competitive play. Then, in 2010, they released Machina Gearframe, and Machina Peacekeeper alongside Machina Fortress. Machina Gearframe allowed you to add a Machina monster from your deck to your hand on its normal summon. Then it had the Union effect where it could equip itself to a machine type monster you controlled, and that was it. It didn't actually have a Union effect, it could just equip itself to one of your machine type monsters in order to grant it the generic Union protection, where it could destroy itself if the equipped monster would be destroyed by battle in order to prevent it from being destroyed by that battle. And Machina Gearframe saw a ton of competitive play, and was the first ever Union monster to actually see widespread success. And the reason for that is because it could search out Machina Fortress. Fortress has the effect where you can discard machine type monsters from your hand whose total levels equals 8 or more in order to special summon this card from your hand or graveyard. And it could discard itself as one of the machine type monsters in order to activate its own summoning condition. So you would only need one other machine type monster with any level in your hand in order to bring it out, unless you were trying to bring it out from the graveyard. And while it was on the field it had two effects, where if this card was destroyed by battle and sent to the graveyard you got to destroy one of your opponent's cards. And if this card was targeted by an opponent's card effect, before resolving the effect you got to look at your opponent's hand and then send one card from their hand to the graveyard. So if your opponent tried to interact with Machina Fortress to get it off the field, you were also going to be able to get rid of something your opponent controlled as well. 
which made it super strong because it also had 2500 attack and could bring itself out very easily. And Machina Gearframe basically allowed you to just search it out and could also equip itself to Machina Fortress in order to grant it a little bit of battle protection. But mainly it was just used because it could search out the really good card and that was its whole purpose. The fact that it was a Union Monster was only sometimes useful, but it was definitely not the selling point of the card. And also Machina Peacekeeper was released with the same structure deck and had the effect that if it was destroyed in the field and sent to the graveyard, you could add a Union Monster from your deck to your hand. And its Union effect was just the generic Union effect and the fact that it didn't actually have one, but could proc its search effect if it was used to protect the monster from being destroyed by battle while it was equipped to a monster. And Peacekeeper did not see anywhere near as much play as Gearframe. And then after 2010, Konami would occasionally just release Union Monsters as part of archetypes that could maybe equip to stuff. There was the previously mentioned Machina archetype, and also the Violon archetype received two Union Monsters, who had effects that destroy cards and special summon Violence from the graveyard when the equipped monsters did stuff. But besides those two archetypes, they didn't really release too many new Union Monsters. And if they did release a new archetype that revolved around equipping things, they rarely gave them Union Monsters and instead just made up their own mechanics. Take Dragoonity for example. Their archetype revolves around equipping dragon type monsters to their wing beast monsters in order to go into synchro monsters, as a lot of the dragons are tuners. And some of the dragons that exist to be equipped have effects that can only be activated while they're equipped, similar to a Union Monster. Take Dragoonity Ducks for example. When it's normal summon, you get to equip a level 3 or lower Dragon Dragoonity monster from your graveyard to it. And if you equipped a Dragoonity Phalanix to it, that card could then use its equip effect to special summon itself and give you a level 2 tuner on the field which could be used to go into all of their combos. They also released the Insector archetype, which heavily involved equipping things, as almost all the Insector monsters had effects which only applied while they were equipped to a monster, and they all had the effect in order to also equip other Insector monsters to themselves in order to grant them a different effect in addition to some of them having third effects that happened if the equipped card was sent to the graveyard. So, Insector Dragonfly, for example, could equip an Insector monster from your hand or graveyard to it once per turn, had the effect to special summon an Insector from the deck if the equipped card was sent to the graveyard while equipped to it, and if it was equipped to a monster itself, its effect would be to increase that monster's level by 3. And there was also the ZW archetype, which basically existed to be equipped to Utopia, which was an easy to bring out extra deck monster, and just provided a whole bunch of benefits similar to equip spell cards. The fact that they were monsters was almost irrelevant, but at least they didn't need to be summoned first in order to be equipped to Utopia, and could be equipped directly from the hand to that card. So Konami kind of abandoned Union Monsters as being the way to have monsters equip themselves to other monsters, and just would invent their own new things when it came to an archetype that revolved around equipping. However, Unions were not dead in the water just yet. In 2016, Unions received a whole bunch of new support, and, more importantly, some erratas. Union Monsters had two changes to some of their fundamental effects that all Union Monsters shared. For one, they no longer had the restriction where you can only have one Union Monster equipped to a monster at a time. And the other was that if the monster they were equipped to was destroyed by battle or card effect, they could send themselves to the graveyard to prevent the destruction, where previously it only worked on destruction by battle. Now, all Union Monsters after 2016 are printed with the effect to prevent destruction from card effects as well. And this includes reprints. If Konami ever reprints a Union Monster from pre-2016, they almost always update its effect and no longer restrict the monster to only one Union and grant the effect protection in addition to battle protection. Although this only really applies if they reprint old Union Monsters. So a lot of the old ones still work how they used to back in the day because they haven't had a reprint yet and have some weird ruling interactions because of it. Also, in 2016, they released the ABC Dragon Buster archetype, which is a series of three Union monsters who are heavily inspired from the XYZ Dragon counting cards, where they kind of tried to do that gimmick again, but just better this time. The three cards all have effects, where they can be equipped to any light machine monster you control, actually grant the equipped monster some kind of extra protection, and when they're sent to the graveyard from the field, they all have floating effects to either add a Union Monster from your deck to your hand, from the graveyard to your hand, or special summon a Union Monster from your hand. They also have an excellent Fusion Monster, which has an alternative summoning condition where it can banish its three materials from your field or graveyard in order to bring it out of the extra deck, which is actually one of the best alternative Fusion summoning conditions in the game, as it's basically the only Fusion Monster that can use materials from the graveyard for its summon without requiring a spell card or any other resource from your field or hand. 
And it also has two great effects, both of them quick effect, where you can discard one card in order to banish one card on the field, or you can tribute this card in order to special summon three of your banished light machine union monsters with different names. So it has spell speed to disruption and can tag out into its three materials if it's about to get destroyed or something, where those three cards can then just be used as materials to bring out another ABC Dragon Buster. In addition, they were given a super good field spell card called Union Hanger, which is still a hallmark of really good field spell card design to this day. Where on activation, you can add any Light Machine Union monster from your deck to your hand. And once per turn, if one of your Light Machine Union monsters was summoned to the field, you can equip a Light Machine Union monster from your deck to that card with a different name. So Union Hanger was like a rollout on steroids. It allowed you to completely bypass the downsides of the type of monster, where you had to spend a whole bunch of resources to get all the Union monsters in the field to start doing their thing. Union Hanger allows you to equip Union monsters directly to their appropriate targets in the best possible way by just equipping them directly from the deck, on just their regular summons. You didn't have to jump through hoops to equip them, and since some of the equipped monsters allowed you to go plus one in card advantage when they were sent to the graveyard, Union Hanger was essentially a plus two in card advantage immediately, since it allowed you to search on activation and equip cards that could also search. So thanks to Union Hanger and ABC Dragon Buster both being kind of busted, it definitely powered the ABC archetype into being competitive overnight. And in fact, ABC Dragon Buster still occasionally sees competitive play to this day, as it even saw a couple of places on the ban list for being too good. Although the success of ABC Dragon Buster doesn't prove that unions were actually good the whole time, and it's more of a proof that if you just print ridiculously broken support, you can kind of force anything to work. If anything, Union Hanger should be a poster boy for all the old terrible archetypes and mechanics, and what they could possibly do in order to maybe make them all work as well. Just create a very good field spell card and a borderline broken fusion monster, and you're kind of good to go. And after the release of ABC Dragon Buster, Unions did receive a couple more support, but nothing as big as what Union Hanger or ABC Dragon Buster ended up being. Shortly after the ABC saga, they got their first ever Union Tuner monster. Later on, they got a Union monster that was obviously meant to work with the Cyber Dark archetype, and then in 2020, the Unions received a somewhat more generic support in the form of Union Driver which can equip itself to any monster you control, and allows you to banish itself while it's equipped to a monster in order to equip an appropriate level 4 or lower union monster from your deck to that monster that it was previously equipped to. And since it's a light machine type monster, it works perfect with Union Hanger. And ever since Union Driver, there hasn't really been good new union support cards. Over the years, they did release cards that were kind of unions, but not really, as they didn't want to have the restrictions of union monsters. There was the XC's card called Number 58 Burner Visor, which functioned almost exactly like a Union monster, except wasn't a Union monster. If an archetype needed a monster to be equipped to other cards, usually they would allow the monsters to be equipped directly from the hand. Or in the Noble Knight's cases, they have a couple of cards that can equip themselves from the graveyard to the monster they control. Which would have been very helpful if Union monsters could do something similar. And there's even the new Magistus archetype, which has the unique mechanic of equipping cards from your extra deck to monsters you control, which seems like the natural evolution of equipping monsters to other monsters in order to accomplish things, since you don't need to search out extract monsters to use them. So, in conclusion, did Union monsters really fail if they had a very competitive archetype comprised entirely of Union monsters? I think so. That archetype was kind of an exception, in the same way Elemental Hero Neos Alias being a Gemini monster didn't make Gemini monsters good, despite the fact that it also saw tons of competitive play and used a lot of Gemini support. And it's kind of funny that in order for them to make Union Hanger even work, they had to errata Union monsters to make them better, by removing the restrictions of only one per monster, and granting them extra protection from card effect destruction. So, removing the ABC Dragon Buster archetype from the equation, the reason Union monsters didn't perform very well was because they had all the downsides of equipped spell cards, but required you to go through extra hurdles in order to even equip them in the first place. The idea of combining monsters in order to make them stronger definitely sounds cool, but it really does not work well in practice, due to the limitations of how equipped cards work in the game. And if they were to ever fix Union monsters to be more competitive, it's great that we can just look at the ABC Dragon Buster archetype for a great case and point, allowing them to equip Union monsters directly from the deck, and give all the Union monsters floating effects so they're not terrible when they eventually leave the field, because of how vulnerable they are. Gemini monsters are a series of cards which were released in 2007, and were unique effect monsters which had the effect to be treated as a normal monster while phased up on the field or in the graveyard. And you could normal summon the card again while it was on the field in order to be treated as an effect monster in order to gain its effect. 
The way this was supposed to work out was that they would have a very good effect to justify two summons required to use them, and they could gain benefit from normal monster support. Although Konami forgot to give them those really good effects part, so they kind of fell flat and never really hit the mark. Let's take a look at Gago Golem. This is a rock monster with 1500 attack and has the effect that when it's Gemini summoned, you set its original attack to 2100. Back in the days of 2007, Cyber Dragon had already been out in the game for two years, and was a monster that could special summon itself from your hand with 2100 attack, so its effect was already kind of power crept out the gate, as you'd have to use up resources to get Gago Golem on the field and then activate its good effect, where Cyber Dragon didn't use any of your summons and had the same benefits immediately, and was definitely a game changer because of it. There's also Phantom Dragon Ray Bronto, which had 1500 attack baseline, although it could be Gemini summoned in order to set its attack to 2300. But if it attacked, it's changed the defense position until the end of your next turn. Goblin Attack Force, which was released in 2002, has literally the same exact effect, with the same attack point value. A lot of the Gemini monsters in the first wave were like this, just straight up worse version of cards that already existed. However, they did also release a lot of new normal monster support along with the first wave of Gemini monsters. So, it made sense why they thought it would be super easy for them to gain all of their effects. For one, in the set which introduced Gemini monsters, we also got the card Double Summon in the game. Double Summon is a card which actually saw competitive play, because it just gives you one extra normal summon during your turn. The intended synergy with this card in Gemini monsters is pretty obvious. It would allow you to use the Gemini monsters effect immediately. Although, let's go over the normal monster support that was also released. Only a handful of months before Gemini Monsters, they released Birthright and Ancient Rules. Birthright allows you to special summon a normal monster from your graveyard at attack position, and is basically like a Call of the Haunted except only for normal monsters. And this was back when Call of the Haunted was still a staple card that was played in pretty much every deck. So, gaining more access to Call of the Haunteds was a bonus back then. Ancient Rules allows you to special summon a level 5 or higher normal monster from your hand which should have helped along some of the higher level Gemini monsters, like Grass Chopper, which actually had a decent effect of being able to attack all of your opponent's monsters once each. However, Gemini monsters were not treated as normal monsters while in the hand, even though there were other cards that did have this distinction, like Zamorg, Bird of Ancestry, which would be released shortly after the first wave of Gemini monsters. So because Gemini monsters were only normal monsters while in the field or graveyard, this actually severely limited a lot of normal monster support they might have especially once we got really good normal monster support like Rescue Rabbit in 2011, which can special summon two normal monsters from your deck. And the set which did release the Geminis also had cards like Summoner's Art, Creature Seizure, Amulet of Ambition, and Common Charity, all of which are pretty decent normal monster support cards. Although Summoner's Art doesn't work on Gemini monsters since it searches normal monsters from the deck, and Common Charity doesn't work on them because it requires you to banish a normal monster from your hand. Which does leave Creature Seizure and Amulet of Ambition to function with them, but neither of these cards were good enough to see competitive play. As Creature Swap was better than Creature Seizure, and Amulet of Ambition is only really good with very high attack, low level monsters like Clown Zombie. Honestly, it seems like the only reason Gemini monsters were thought of as too strong was because of Birthright, and maybe Justy Break, which is like a normal monster mirror force and kind of works with Geminis as long as they don't have their effects and that maybe they thought these cards would be so good with Gemini Monsters that they obviously could not give them good effects. Although Gemini Monsters were hilariously weak anyway, so they gave them a little bit of a buff. About a year later, they released a structure deck which included Supervice, which is an equipped spell card that immediately grants the Gemini Monster equipped to it its effect, and it has a floating effect where if it's under the graveyard, you get to special summon a normal monster from your graveyard, which is actually pretty good. The structure deck also reprinted a whole bunch of good normal monster support that was probably meant to help the archetype along, like Birthright, Justy Break, Swing of Memories, and Soul Resurrection, and even brand new series of Gemini monsters, like Evocator Chevalier, which has the Gemini effect to send an equipped spell card to the graveyard to destroy one of your opponent's monsters, which has obvious synergy with Supervice and being able to special summon other Gemini monsters from the graveyard by destroying your opponent's cards, which was still not enough to help out the archetype because they still had the inherent flaws, of only being normal monsters while on the field or graveyard, and requiring extra normal summons to get their effects off the ground. Especially since the cards which were supposed to activate all of their effects, like Unleash Your Power, were too restrictive, and having bad downsides like setting all of the monsters after they gain their effects that turn, when none of them really had effects that were good enough to justify a downside. Unleash Your Power could have just given all the Gemini monsters their effects and not have a downside, 
and it still wouldn't be very good. So, Konami tried again. A year later in 2009, they released a new set which contained a card called Gemini Spark. Gemini Spark allowed you to tribute a level 4 Gemini monster in order to destroy one card in the field and then draw one card. And Gemini Spark was legitimately good. It was quick play, which means you could chain it in response to one of your Gemini monsters getting destroyed by something. It didn't require the Gemini monster to have its effect activated, so it was alive as soon as you got a level 4 Gemini monster on the field. And it allowed you to draw a card after destroying anything, which turned the card into card neutral and card advantage, which gives you some staying power and control in the field while also maintaining card advantage. And with Gemini Spark, Gemini Monsters finally started seeing play in Hero Decks, which leads over to the most successful Gemini Monster in the game's history, Elemental Hero Neos Alias. Elemental Hero Neos Alias is a 1900 attack beat stick whose Gemini effect is simply, this card's name becomes Elemental Hero Neos while it's on the field. Seeing as the Neos archetype revolves around having Neos on the field in order to use their contact fusions, this was definitely seen as a good effect, because the original Elemental Hero Neos is a level 7 vanilla monster that's hard to get on the field. So, Neos Alias was supposed to be an easier way of getting that name on the field, but it was almost never used for its Gemini effect. It was mainly used because it was a light hero monster, which was technically useful in order to go into Elemental Hero the Shining, and could be used to activate the effect of Honest to beat over any monster, and because it could combo with Gemini Spark, to have some staying power in the field and just be a beat stick. It was played mainly because of everything about the card that didn't have anything to do with its actual effect. There was, however, another Gemini monster that saw some competitive play called Eelblood, which was released alongside the original wave of Gemini monsters, which I think should probably be mentioned as well. Eelblood is a level 6 zombie monster which has a Gemini effect where once per turn you can special summon a zombie monster from your hand or graveyard with the condition that if Illblood leaves the field, then all zombie monsters it's special summoned are destroyed. And since Illblood can be brought out of the deck with Pyramid Turtle on its destruction, it was a nice card to end off on during your opponent's turn in order to just use that normal summon on your next turn to activate Illblood. So, Elemental Hero Neos and Illblood were the only two Gemini monsters that saw widespread competitive play, and only Illblood was actually used for its actual Gemini effect. However, there was one other Gemini card which had the potential to be overpowered, and is probably why Gemini monsters were limited in what they could actually accomplish. You see, there's this Gemini card called Gigaplant, which was released after the first wave of Gemini monsters, and has the effect that, once per turn, you can special summon one insect or plant monster from your hand or graveyard. This effect is only a soft once per turn, and is not restricting from targeting other copies of itself. So, if you get the Gemini fusion monster on the field, called Super Alloy Beast Raptinus, which has the effect to grant all Gemini monsters their Gemini effects, then, if you simply had two copies of Giga Plant on the field, you can infinitely cycle between both of them in order to have an infinite amount of tribute fodder for something like Cannon Soldier or Mass Driver, in order to FDK your opponent. Currently, this is too hard to pull off to be competitively viable, but if they ever made Geminis too strong, then this is something that might be worth worrying about. In 2016, they released some new support with the Chem Critters. These were a series of level 2 and 8 Gemini monsters, which had much better effects that still weren't that great, but they did receive a really good field spell card called Catalyst Field. This effect tried to solve all the problems with Geminis by itself, where it allowed you to summon level 5 or higher Gemini monsters from your hand without tributing. During your main phase, you got one additional normal summon which could be used to summon a Gemini monster, which means it can be used to activate one of their Gemini effects immediately. And then it also allowed you to banish one of your Gemini monsters that had its effect in order to destroy one of your opponent's cards. But the important part about Catalyst Field was the ability to normal summon high level Gemini monsters without a tribute. And then again, an additional normal summon for that turn. They also released a couple of other better high level Gemini monsters, like Darkstorm Dragon, who could send a spell or trap card on the field to the graveyard to destroy all spells and traps on the field, or Red Eyes Archfiend of Lightning, which could destroy all of your opponent's monsters in the field with a defense lower than its attack. They also got a really good rank 8 monster called Vola Chemi Critter Methy Draco, which allows you to special summon a Gemini monster from your graveyard on its summon, made it so all your Gemini monsters cannot be targeted by your opponent's card effects while it had Xyz material, and could detach one of its materials whenever you normal summon a Gemini monster in order to force your opponent to send a card from their hand or field to the graveyard. None of this was good enough to compete with 2016 meta cards though, so, Geminis continue to see no competitive play despite getting a pretty good field spell card and a decent Xyz monster that just wasn't easy enough to summon. 
since just getting one new field spell card and a couple of mediocre main deck monsters didn't really make their new Axis monster any more viable. Although, in 2016, Elemental Hero Neos was still occasionally seen competitive play, but it didn't use any of the new Gemini monsters' support cards, and in fact had stopped using Gemini Spark a long time ago. And then once actual good main deck hero monsters started being released in 2016 and 2017, Elemental Hero Neos Alias was dropped from hero decks completely, and finally stopped seeing widespread competitive play. So, with Gemini cards all but dead as a mechanic, Konami released a new support card in 2020 called Gemini Ablation. This is a continuous trap card that has the effect that during the main phase you can discard one card in order to activate one of its two effects. The first effect allows you to special summon any Gemini monster from your deck as an effect monster and it gains its effects. The second allows you to tribute a Gemini monster in order to special summon a Fire War monster from your hand or deck, and then additionally, if you tributed a Gemini monster who had its effect gain, you could also destroy one card on the field. So, being able to discard a card in order to bring out a Gemini monster from your deck with its full effect during both players' turns is pretty decent for a continuous trap card. And the second effect has some niche uses as well as like quasi-Gemini Spark if you're playing Fire Warrior monsters. And since some of the best Gemini monsters were Fire Warrior, this kind of made sense. Then in 2021, they released Dimer Synthesis which gives you a way to search out Catalyst Field from your deck, and has a graveyard effect in order to buff the attack of one of your Gemini monsters, which is decent since it technically supports Geminis and searches out their good field spell card. And lastly, they have dualized Lord Gold Knight, one of the last pieces of Gemini support to be released, which is technically not out in the TCG yet, which is simply a 1500 attack Earth Warrior monster, which has a Gemini effect where, if it's summoned, you get to add a spell or trap card with Gemini monster in its text from your deck to your hand and then it becomes a machine type monster and gains 500 attack. So, if you special summon it from the deck with Gemini Ablation, it gives the Gemini Archetype a way to actually search out cards, including something like Gemini Spark which could then immediately be used on Gold Knight. So, the best pieces of support they ever released for Gemini monsters were Gemini Spark, Gemini Ablation, and the field spell card Catalyst Field. And if these three support cards are released at the first wave of Gemini monsters, then we might have had an actual history where Geminis were a legitimate meta threat. But all of these cards are released too far away from each other, and at times where the effects were not that special. Say for Gemini Spark, and maybe Gemini Ablation too. Being able to special summon a monster once per turn from your deck during both players' turns is actually super good, and would be kind of broken if it was attached to anything besides Gemini monsters. Now, in conclusion, why did the Gemini mechanic fail? because they require two summons, and are too restrictive in how they are treated as normal monsters. It's really that two normal summon thing which really hampers the entire thing. The normal summon is incredibly valuable. You only get one normal summon per turn by default, and there are a lot of cards which gain a whole bunch of advantage off of a single normal summon, like Alistair the Invoker for example. So having to give up that normal summon in order to activate the effect of a card better be worth the activation of that card's effect which almost none of the Gemini monsters were, besides Eelblood or Gigaplant, and only because those two cards allow you to summon another monster immediately, so it's kind of like trading a normal summon for a special summon of another monster from a different location. So in order for Gemini monsters to see more competitive play, they'd either have to release some absolutely disgusting normal monster support, which just unintentionally worked very well with Gemini monsters, or make more Gemini monsters that have really good effects because they do have some really good Gemini-specific support with Gemini Ablation. The funny thing is, they did actually release a whole archetype that supports normal monsters, but it's actually worded in a way to only support non-effect monsters. So, none of the Tengi cards work with Gemini monsters since they aren't counted as non-effect monsters, as they have an effect which treats them as a normal monster. Which is technically not the same thing. I will say though, one thing they could do to Gemini monsters to make them better or to make an actual good Gemini archetype, would be to take advantage of the fact that they are treated as effect monsters in the hand, and just give them a whole bunch of hand effects like they did with the Necroz ritual monsters. And also, more cards like Gemini Ablation, which allow you to bring out Gemini monsters easier and also grant their effects immediately, so that you'd never have to waste normal summon on giving a Gemini monster its Gemini effect. Skipping the draw phase in Yu-Gi-Oh! is generally considered a very sacred thing when it comes to card effects. For a very long time, there were only two cards in the game that could skip your opponent's draw phase, those being Time Seal and Yanta Garasu. Even though these two cards aren't very good, they remained banned for an incredibly long time, until eventually, after 2020, both of them were slowly removed from the ban list. 
In fact, they even released another card which can skip the draw phase called Yaoi, but has a once per duel clause on its skipping effect. And the reason that skipping the draw phase was considered so bad that the very mechanic had to be banned from the game was because it can create a state of the game where your opponent can't possibly come back. If your opponent had their entire board wiped and you activated one of the draw skipping effects, then there was nothing your opponent can do to try to prevent them from losing the game. And this was seen as an insurmountable type of gameplay that they didn't want to have existing. However, the reason this isn't that big a deal anymore is because modern Yu-Gi-Oh! is about setting up a whole bunch of negates. And if you simply have one Omni negate, then it doesn't matter what your opponent draws because you can just stop it. And most end boards will have more than one Omni negate. Basically, the game had already turned into a game where drawing a single card didn't matter with no other cards on the board or in your graveyard, because you weren't going to win with any singular draw anymore through a negate. And under this context, it was kind of fine for them to remove their long-held tradition of banning cards that skip the draw phase. It's still an inherently powerful effect, but as long as they don't give the effect to an already powerful card and keep it on relatively the weak side, like with Time Seal Yadagarasu, then it's probably fine. The god cards are a series of monsters which have their own specific type and attribute that were created just for them, and is used for no other cards in the game. So you would think that an archetype that was so important that it was given its own type and attribute, something that's not done for anything else, would be somewhat game-changing. But at the best of times, god cards were nothing more than a niche tech option. There are five divine beast type monsters in the game, which are also the only five divine attribute monsters in the game. Of those five, two of them are just different forms of the Winged Dragon of Raw, and basically interact exclusively with that card. Also, each of the three original god cards has individual support, with the Winged Dragon of Raw eclipsing all of them when it comes to the amount of support it's received. To start off, let's go over Obelisk the Tormentor. This was the first god card released in 2010 in the TCG, and released a couple of years earlier in the OCG. Despite the god cards being incredibly linked to each other, they were all released at different times in both the OCG and TCG for some reason. In the anime, the god cards were basically ultimate falcons on legs, with actual good effects, because they were basically immune to everything and had like 20 different effects that could apply to whatever situation they needed. The god cards kind of acted as video game boss monsters, where they had different phases and different kinds of effects depending on what kinds of things you had in the field, or whatever they thought would be cool for that moment. So when they transferred these ridiculously broken cards over to the real game, where there just literally was not enough text on a card in order to print all the effects they had, they went with a rather lackluster option of just giving them a handful of the effects they once had, while also ignoring a lot of the protection that would probably have made them playable. That is, except for Obelisk. Obelisk is a 4,000 attack monster that requires three tributes to normal summon. Its normal summon cannot be negated, and when normal summoned, other cards and effects cannot be activated during that window, a trait that all three of the god cards share. Then Obelisk goes on to have its own effects, where, on a spell speed 1, you can tribute two monsters you control, including itself, to destroy all monsters your opponent controls. However, this card cannot attack during the turn it activates this effect. If this card is special summoned, it's sent to the graveyard during the end phase, and finally, neither player can target this monster with card effects. It was this last line of its effect that allowed Obelisk the Tormentor to actually see competitive play. When it was first released in 2010, gigantic monsters that cannot be targeted were kind of rare, and non-targeting removal was even rarer. So bringing out Obelisk the Tormentor could be paramount to having an unstoppable boss monster on the field, simply because it had high attack while being untargetable. Nowadays though, the average meta deck can easily bring out multiple forms of non-targeting removal and monsters that can beat over Obelisk the Tormentor by battle, which was not the case in the early 2010s. So Obelisk the Tormentor was often used as a single one of in frog decks, since back then they were geared more towards tribute fodder for monarchs and light and darkness dragon, and when dragon rulers came out in 2013, Obelisk the Tormentor saw play as a side tech option in the mirror match, because dragon ruler decks themselves had a hard time with non-targeting removal, or getting more than 4,000 attack on the field. But it was only really a side deck option because the main other meta threat at the time, spellbooks, had their best former removal in Spellbook of Fate, which was a non-target banish. Then, after the Dragon Ruler format had its power level reined in by some choice bands, new support cards were released, Obelisk the Tormentor fell out of play, and then kinda stopped seeing competitive play ever since. However, Obelisk was only the second most played god card in the competitive scene, as we'll see a little bit later on in this video. Next up, we have the Winged Dragon of Ra. This card was released two years later in 2012, or 2009 in the OCG, and has the same summoning protection effects as Obelisk the Tormentor, and also on its summon, its attack and defense become equal to the amount of life points you paid when you summon the card, 
where you can pay all but 100 life points in order to grant this card that amount of attack and defense. And you are not able to choose the amount of life points you pay, you have to pay all but 100. So if you summon this card with a full 8,000 life points, it will have 7,900 attack and defense. The Winged Dragon Raw also has an effect where it cannot be special summoned at all. And finally, it has the non once per turn effect where you can pay 1,000 life points in order to destroy one monster on the field, which is kind of counterintuitive with its attack gain effect because you won't actually be able to destroy anything unless you find a way to gain life points after you bring out the Winged Dragon of Raw. And the first version of the Winged Dragon of Raw was absolutely terrible. It had no protection like Obelisk, which was strange that they decided to regress the protection of the god cards rather than adding more onto it, so its attack point gain could be reset by any kind of negate that just kind of breathed on it. And it was already making you super vulnerable for activating its attack gain effect in the first place because you only had 100 life points left, and Gagaga -Ga -Ga Cowboy was a very common staple in the following years after it came out, which could burn you for 800 points of damage on a generic rank 4 summon. Of the three original god cards, the Winged Dragon of Raw was easily the worst which is kind of funny because the anime counterpart that it was based on was the most overpowered out of the main three, which is probably why they gave it a massive amount of support later on, which simply exists to simulate its many anime effects. And finally, we have Slifer the Sky Dragon. This card came out later in the same year of 2012 as the Winged Dragon of Raw, and came out two years after the Winged Dragon of Raw in the OCG in 2011. I'm not sure why they staggered the release of the three god cards so much, but it obviously wasn't in order to make them stronger. Slide for the Sky Dragon has the effect tied to its summoning condition, that are shared with the previous two, and its attack and defense are based on the amount of cards you have in your hand times 1000. And unlike the Winged Dragon of Raw, this card can be special summoned. It's simply sent to the graveyard during the end phase just like Obelisk the Tormentor. And finally, if a monster is summoned to your opponent's side of the field in attack position, they lose 2,000 attack, and then if the monster's attack is reduced to zero, it's destroyed, which is actually a really good effect. This would be an excellent floodgate effect to have on another monster that wasn't so difficult to bring out and lacked absolutely all kinds of protection. Since, just like the Winged Dragon of Raw, they didn't give Slifer the Sky Dragon any form of inherent protection, where it would definitely have benefited from being untargetable like Obelisk. Over the years, they did release some generic support for the god cards, either in the form of cards which interacted with their Divine Beast tag or Divine Attribute, list the card's name specifically, or allowed you to tribute summon with the three tributes easier. In 2014, they released Mound of the Bound Creator, which is a field spell card that makes it so level 10 or higher monsters in the field can't be targeted or destroyed by card effects. In addition, if one of these monsters destroys a monster by battle, your opponent takes 1,000 points of damage. And then, if this card in the field is destroyed, you get to add a divine monster from your deck to your hand. So the floating effect of Mound of the Bound Creator is one of the few ways to actually search out the three god cards. Now, its on-field protection actually gives the god cards protections they probably should have had built in from the beginning, as being untargetable and indestructible is actually really good. And the field spell card was obviously made in order to try to rectify some of the early design choices of the three original god cards. Although, requiring the field spell card to be on the field, which itself doesn't have any protection, didn't really solve the problem. In fact, it was mostly played in non-god card decks to make use of the fact that it works on any level 10 or higher monsters, if it was used at all in competitive play. In the same year, they also released Ra's Disciple, which is a monster that can special summon two other copies of itself from your hand or deck on its summon. However, the card then has restrictions, where you cannot tribute these cards, except if it's for the tribute summon of the three original god cards, as it lists all of them exactly by name, and also you cannot special summon other monsters, except by the effect of Ra's Disciple. So, funnily enough, because of this card's restrictions on locking you into not being able to special summon other monsters, it's actually a really good card to give to your opponent with something like Give and Take, in order to completely lock them out of special summoning monsters. It is actually what got Give and Take limited in Duel Links, because it was one of the few ways to lock down your opponent, since they don't really have floodgates included in that game. However, since Ron's Disciple didn't actually give you an additional summon, just provided three monsters in the field to be tributed for the god cards, it's actually not that useful for bringing them out. Two years later, in 2016, they released a card called True Name. This card is meant to be another searcher for the god cards, although it's actually harder to use than Mount of the Bound Creator, because what you do in order to activate the effect is declare a card name, then look at the top card of your deck. If the top card of your deck is that card name, then you get to add it to your hand, then you get to take a divine monster from your deck, and either add it to your hand or special summon it from the deck. However, if you get the name incorrect, then you just send the card to the graveyard. And since the Winged Dragon Raw can't be special summoned, the card only really works to bring out Obelisk the Tormentor or Slifer the Sky Dragon. In 2020, along with some Winged Dragon Raw support, they released a card called Egyptian God Slime, 
which is a fusion monster that can be brought out by triveting a level 10 aqua monster with zero attack. So cards like the trap card Metal Reflex Slime. And while it's on the field, it can't be destroyed by battle, has 3000 attack and defense, and can be treated as one or three tributes for the tribute summon of a monster. So obviously an excellent card in order to bring out the god cards, just as long as you play Metal Reflex Slime, which can be searched out of the deck immediately during the battle phase with Reactor Slime, and then activated the same turn. Or with the raw support card Guardian Slime, and Egyptian God Slime is definitely one of the better cards released in order to help bring out the original God cards, although it's not the best one. In 2021, they released a whole bunch of other support cards for the God cards, including a card called Soul Crossing. This is a quick play spell card which can only be activated during the main phase that allows you to tribute one Divine Beast monster from your hand, and allows you to tribute monsters on both players' side of the field. So basically, you can use Soul Crossing in order to tribute three of your opponent's monsters for one of your God cards which is easily the best way to bring one of them out. However, because Soul Crossing is actually good with its effect, because it even gives you an additional normal summon for this tribute, so you don't have to waste your one normal summon, is that if you use this card, you can only use one card or effect per turn, not counting a god card's effect, and this restriction lasts until the end of your next turn. So, if you use this during your opponent's turn, you can only use one card effect in your next turn. However, another distinction to this card over other similar things like the Monarch Stormforth or Soul Exchange, is that Soul Crossing actually works on immune boss monsters, because it treats the effect as a tribute summon, rather than the effect of a spell card allowing you to tribute your opponent's monsters. Which is a distinction that matters for things like Ultimate Falcon. So Soul Crossing is definitely one of the best pieces of god card support created, which is why it has that really awful restriction to allow you to do anything else for the two turns after using it. Also, the same year they released Divine Evolution, which is a buff for one of your god cards or the Wicked versions, which gives it 1000 attack and defense, makes it so all of their effects are spell speed 4, and if they declare an attack, forces your opponent to send one monster they control to the graveyard. There's also the Ultimate Divine Beast, a continuous trap card which has the effect, where if your opponent declares an attack, you can discard a spell or trap card from your hand in order to special summon a Divine Beast monster from your graveyard defense position, and redirect the attack to that monster. And then during the end phase, if you control a Divine Beast monster, you destroy all cards your opponent controls and activate their effects on the field this turn. And both of these cards seem like they'd be pretty good god card support, except for the fact they kind of don't really help getting the cards of the field or in the graveyard, and they might be considered more of a win more option in the case of Divine Evolution or the second effect of Ultimate Divine Beast. However, you may even think Ultimate Divine Beast literally special summons Obelisk or Slifer to the field every turn. How could this possibly not be a good card to get the god cards out? Well, the devil is really in the details in this case. It only activates its effect if your opponent declares an attack, which means it's a sitting duck until your opponent activates the trigger, which is the reason why cards like Mirror Force don't really see play, even though it can destroy all of your opponent's attack position monsters, but Lightning Storm sees play in pretty much every side deck, even though it has an effect to do the same thing. Relying on a battle trigger is one of the worst kinds of triggers, and is just too slow in modern Yu-Gi-Oh. Additionally, it requires you to discard specifically a spell or trap card in order to activate the effect, which means you can't even discard a god card to the graveyard in order to help set up its effect. So you need some other way to get the god cards in the graveyard. And some of the best cards to discard are monster cards, because graveyard effects are just much more common on monsters than they are on spell or trap cards. But in addition to these more generic god card support cards, they did also have a series of incredibly specific ones. Let's go over Obelisk and Slifer first, since they definitely have the least amount. When it comes to specific support cards for Obelisk himself, he only really has one that's released in the TCG called Fist of Fate, where it's a quick play spell card that can only be activated if you control Obelisk the Tormentor, where it allows you to negate the effects of one monster your opponent controls and destroy it, and then if you do, for the rest of this turn, it negates all effects of that monster with the same original name, kind of in the same way as Called by the Grave. In addition, the activation of this card cannot be negated, and it does not target. So it can be seen as a way to outpower boss monsters, and it gains additional effect if activated during your main phase, where you get to also destroy all spell and trap cards your opponent controls. Now, this card definitely seems like a strong card. It's a quasi spell speed for destruction of one of your opponent's monsters that does not target, and it negates its effects. So it can remove pretty much anything your opponent controls other than something that's just immune to card effects. And then it's a Harpy's Feather Duster on top of that. But this is just another win more card that doesn't actually help get Obelisk on the field in the first place, or search it out, which has historically been the hardest thing to do with the god cards. There's also two pieces of Obelisk support in the OCG that are not released in the TCG yet, which are a little bit better in actually helping getting Obelisk on the field. One of them is called Soul Energy Max, which is a trap card that allows you to tribute two monsters you control if you control an Obelisk, in order to destroy as many monsters your opponent controls as possible, 
and then inflict 4,000 points of damage to your opponent. And this effect is actually one of the highest amount of burn damage inflicted by a singular card. So requiring Obelisk and two tributes to use the effect is definitely warranted. The better part about this card is definitely its graveyard effect though, where during the battle phase you can banish this card from your graveyard in order to add Obelisk to your hand from your deck or graveyard, then immediately you can normal summon that Obelisk if you have the required materials. And then there's Magical Trick Mirror, which is another normal trap card that has the effect where, if your opponent declares an attack, you can target one spell card in your opponent's graveyard in order to set it to your field. And then its more useful effect is tied to its graveyard effect, where you can banish this card from your graveyard in order to send a monster reborn from your hand or field to the graveyard in order to special summon Obelisk from the graveyard in defense position. And then if it activates its effect during your opponent's turn, all of your opponent's monsters must attack that Obelisk. And since it has 4,000 defense and this card can be used during the battle phase, it could be a way to do a lot of defensive reflect damage to your opponent. And outside of these three cards, Obelisk doesn't really have any other specific support cards that's just for him. Next up we have Slifer the Sky Dragon. When it comes to specific support for Slifer, it really only has Thunder Force Attack, which is a quick play spell card that can only be activated if you control Slifer the Sky Dragon on the field, and just like Fist of Fate, its activation cannot be negated. And it has the effect to destroy as many face-up attacks with monsters your opponent controls as possible. And then it has an additional effect, if it's activated during your main phase, where you get to draw a number of cards equal to the monsters destroyed with the effect, but you can only attack with one monster during this turn. Which again seems like an amazing effect since it's basically a Raigeki that can draw you a whole bunch of cards. But since it doesn't let you get Slifer on the field quicker, it's actually not that useful. Because that is definitely the biggest problem with all of the god cards. The resources to just get them on the field in the first place are so difficult to accomplish when you're trying to play through your opponent's disruptions that anything that requires a specific named god card to be on the field when they're already hard to search out is just not viable no matter what their effects are. And Slifer doesn't really have any other support specific to it, except for the Joker's straight archetype. You see, there's a series of support for these three cards, which allows you to really easily get three monsters in the field with their spell card called Joker's Straight, which allows you to special summon a Queen's Knight from your deck at the cost of a discard from your hand, then allows you to add a King's Knight from your deck to your hand, then immediately normal summon it which will proc King's Knight's effects in order to special summon Jack's Knight from your deck. And since Joker's Straight is a straight get three monsters in the field without using up your normal summon, it has restrictions where you can't special summon from the extra deck for the rest of the turn except for light warrior monsters. And the card recycles itself to your hand during the end phase. And this definitely allows you to use those three monsters to go into any of the god cards. But the reason this archetype is more specific to Slifer is because of one of their support cards called Thunder Speed Summon. Which is a quick play spell card that has the effect where, during the main or battle phase, immediately after the effect resolves you can normal summon one level 10 monster, or if you control the three King's Knight cards, you can apply an additional effect which allows you to add a level 10 non-dark monster with question mark for attack from your deck to your hand, where you then immediately normal summon a level 10 monster. And what do you know, Slifer is a non-dark level 10 monster with question mark for attack and defense. Although, so is the Winged Dragon of Ra. So I guess technically it could be support for both of these cards. Speaking of that, let's go over the Winged Dragon of Ra. The Winged Dragon of Ra has received way more support specifically than all of the other god cards, probably combined as two of the five Divine Beast monsters in the game are just different forms of the Winged Dragon of Ra. We have the Winged Dragon of Ra of Mortal Phoenix, which can only be summoned from the graveyard if the Winged Dragon of Ra is sent from the field to the graveyard, and cannot be special summoned in other ways. When it's summoned, other cards and effects cannot be activated in response to it, it's baseline immune to other card effects, has 4,000 attack and defense, and you can pay 1,000 life points in order to send a monster from the field to the graveyard on a non-once per turn effect. And then during the end phase, this card is sent to the graveyard where you can then summon the Winged Dragon of Raw Sphere mode from your hand deck or graveyard, ignoring its summoning conditions. So, the Winged Dragon of Raw Immortal Phoenix kind of has the effect the original one should have had, being immune to card effects and having a high baseline attack and defense, while being able to actually use its effect to send your opponent's monsters to the graveyard. Although, since the activation requirement requires you to have the card in the graveyard already, and to have the original Winged Dragon of Ra both hit the field and then enter the graveyard while it's there, it's really more of a gimmick than it's an actual usable card. Unlike the card it actually summons from the deck during the end phase. Next up we have the Winged Dragon of Ra Sphere Mode, which is easily the most used god card, and is actually just a pure staple card that has seen tons of competitive play. Which is kind of funny because it's just a random side support for the Winged Dragon of Ra, the worst god card which technically makes Sphere Mode the best god card by a mile because of its massive amount of success. As what it does is it cannot be special summoned and in order to normal summon this card you have to tribute three monsters on either side of the field. And that's the main benefit of this card. You can tribute this card with three of your opponent's monsters which bypasses pretty much all card effects. 
except ones which would prevent you from normal summoning in the first place. So if your opponent is playing a whole bunch of unbeatable monsters, or just a whole bunch of monsters with negates or quick effects, what you can do is slide in the Winged Dragon Frost Sphere mode during game 2, in order to easily out all of them with the least amount of resources, i.e. just one monster from your hand and giving up your normal summon. There aren't really cards that out more unbeatable boss monsters with one card from your hand than the Winged Dragon or Ross Sphere mode, to the point where sometimes people only end on boards with only two or less monsters just to play around Sphere mode if they think their opponent has one, which is also a benefit. Sphere mode also has the effect where, if you're actually using this card's god card support abilities, you can tribute this card in order to special summon the Winged Dragon of Ra from your hand or deck, ignoring its summoning conditions, and then setting its attack and defense to 4000. So actually, a pretty good way of bringing out the original Winged Dragon of Ra. Especially if you have Immortal Phoenix in your graveyard ready to come out if it's simply breathed upon because it still has no protection. And then they also released a couple of other Winged Dragon of Ra support cards. There's Guardian Slime, which can special summon itself from your hand when you take damage, and allows you to search out a Winged Dragon of Ra spell or trap card from your deck if it's sent from your hand or field to the graveyard. There's also Ancient Chant, which allows you to actually search out the Winged Dragon of Ra from your deck, and then immediately allows you to tribute summon one additional monster during your main phase this turn. Which is actually a great piece of support for a specific god card, because it actually does the ever-important thing of allowing you to search out the card, which all the other specific god card supports are lacking. Really, they should print an Ancient Chant for both Obelisk and Slifer, and it's kind of a shame that it only works on the Winged Dragon of Ra. Additionally, it has a graveyard effect, where you can banish this card from your graveyard in order to make it so that if you tribute some of the Winged Dragon of Ra this turn, its original attack and defense become the original attack and defense of the monsters tributed for its tribute summon. And since this is a lingering effect granted by a spell card, it actually keeps the attack gains if it's negated on the field, since you can't negate a lingering effect, except if you remove the card from the field or flip it face down. There's Millennium Revelation, which allows you to send a Divine Beast monster from your hand to the graveyard to surge out Monster Reborn, and then has another effect where you can send this card from your field to the graveyard in order to allow you to use Monster Reborn to special summon the Winged Dragon Raw from your graveyard, ignoring its summoning conditions. But then you have to send that Winged Dragon Raw from your field to the graveyard during the end phase. There's Dark Spell Regeneration, which is a trap card that can only be activated when your opponent declares an attack that allows you to steal a spell card from your opponent's graveyard, and has a graveyard effect in order to send a monster reborn from your hand or field to the graveyard to special summon the Winged Dragon of Ra from your graveyard, ignoring its summoning conditions. Then it sends one monster your opponent controls to the graveyard. There's Sun God Unification, which is a continuous trap card that allows you to basically copy the effect of the Winged Dragon of Ra's normal summon of paying all your life points only have 100 left in order to grant that amount of attack to your Winged Dragon of Ra, and then has an effect where you contribute a Winged Dragon of Ra in order to gain those life points back. And since it's a continuous trap card, can be used in response to your Winged Dragon of Ra maybe getting destroyed by one of your opponent's card effects. And finally, there's Blaze Cannon, the specific quick play spell card made for the Winged Dragon of Ra in the same vein as Fist of Fate and Thunder Force Attack, where its activation and effect can't be negated and allows you to grant the Winged Dragon of Ra you control three effects, where it becomes unaffected by your opponent's card effects, and if it declares an attack, you contribute any number of your monsters that did not declare an attack, in order to give their attack points to Raw, Then, after damage calculation, if you attacked, you can send all monsters your opponent controls to the graveyard, with all three of these effects only lasting until the end phase of this turn. Now, what's funny with all these support cards of the Winged Dragon of Raw is that each of these new pieces of support are just trying to give the original Winged Dragon of Raw back some of the effects it had from the original anime, to kind of give you an indication of how many effects the original god cards had, and how completely stripped of them they were when they were imported to the actual card game. And even with all of this support, the Winged Dragon of Raw still hasn't really seen any competitive play, even though the Winged Dragon of Raw Sphere mode has seen mountains amounts of success. So, now that we've gone over the god cards and all of their support, why exactly did the god cards fail as an archetype or mechanic? Well, because, funnily enough, they're actually really hard to search out, and you have to build your entire deck around them in the first place. Only the Winged Dragon of Raw has a card that specifically surges it out in the TCG, with the other two god cards just kind of relying on generic support that requires you to jump through hoops in order to really search them out. You can surge out Obelisk with Card of the Soul though, but only if you still have 8,000 life points left, and Slifer with Thunder Speed Summon, but only if you have three specific monsters in the field. In addition to them actually being difficult to just search out in the first place, you have to dedicate three monsters in the field and have an available normal summon for them to actually come out. And this in itself, is not that difficult to accomplish, assuming your opponent has zero disruption. The average meta deck has to be able to play through at least one form of disruption, otherwise it's not considered competitive. So, if you're able to provide two forms of disruption, you can kind of shut down your opponent's entire turn, assuming generic scenarios. So with this in mind, getting three monsters on the field and a specific name card in your hand, 
it's already hard to do either of those two things in the first place, which just makes it so the card you do bring out has to be absolutely worth the effort, where none of the original god cards are worth that effort. So the ideal situation is being able to successfully resolve Soul Crossing in order to normal summon them from your hand during your opponent's turn. But still, in that circumstance, you still need to have the god cards in your hand in the first place, and they're dead cards in your hand unless you're able to actually provide the tribute fodder outside of that. And a lot of the support cards revolve around them being on the field already, which is the hardest thing to accomplish with them. So, it's a combination of the cards being too hard to bring out, and not being worth the effort in order to bring them out, with all of the support requiring them to be on the field already. The thing is, there are archetypes in the game, which require a whole bunch of tributes in order to hit the field, which have seen competitive play in the past. So it's not like the concept can't work. The two best examples are the True Draco and Monarch archetypes. The True Dracos are able to hit the field a lot easier because they have the effects to allow you to tribute continuous spell and trap cards in addition to monsters, and they all have effects in the field that allow you to gain additional advantage immediately. And because they primarily rely on tribute summons, usually only a single one, they're able to play a whole bunch of floodgates to stop their opponent from playing. Whereas with the God card and its support, each one of them requires three tributes, which usually involves a lot of special summoning and playing other resources, where you can't just reliably floodgate your opponent with floodgates, because you actually need to perform a lot of special summons. And there's also the Monarch archetype, which was able to solve its problem of requiring tributes for all of its high level monsters, by just printing a whole bunch of Spell of Trap cards that allow them to cycle through their deck quicker, search out their key cards like crazy, and easily supplement their tribute costs through spell and trap cards and vassals that grant them extra tribute summons, bring themselves out of the graveyard infinitely, or summon during your opponent's turn for their immediate effects. Whereas the best thing the god cards have in comparison is Ancient Chant that allows you to search out only the worst god card, and Soul Crossing, which can allow you to summon the god card during your opponent's turn, but only Slifer has an effect that's actually useful during your opponent's turn, who is one of the hardest to search out ones outside of Thunder Speed Summon, which is not easy to use at all, or using MST on your own Mound of the Bound Creator, or stacking the top of your deck and then using True Name in order to special summon it from the deck. So, in conclusion, why did the God cards fail? Well, because they don't do enough on the field by themselves to justify the resources required to bring them out, and their only support consistently only works while they're already on the field in the first place, where their biggest weakness is just hitting the field in the first place. So, if they were to help fix the god cards to be more usable, they'd have to add more ways to actually get the cards on the field, rather than more cards that interact with them while they're already on the field. So, if they had something like Ancient Chant that worked on all of the god cards, that would definitely go a long way to help. If they had more cards like Egyptian God Slime that can be treated as three tribute summons and special summoned easier, that would go a long way to alleviate the massive resource requirement required in order to have them get on the field. And if the specific cards made for them that required them to be on the field had a dual nature instead, where they instead had a good effect that could be activated while the card was on the field, or had a good way of searching the card out if it was not, that would be miles better than what they are now. Which seems to be the direction they're taking with the new Oblis support, as that's basically what Soul Energy Max does. And to end off this video, I should probably talk about Halakti the Creator of Light. This is an OCG only card that allows you to instantly win the duel if you're able to special summon this card from your hand by tributing the three original god cards on your side of the field. I imagine one of the reasons they don't want to give you too many easy ways to get the three god cards out is because Halakti exists, and can allow you to win the duel too easily, which is kind of funny to think about. In the early days of the game, Konami printed a slew of mediocre battle traps which would end up never seeing play. Among these was Metamorph, whose distinguishing feature was that it was mentioned by name on a couple main deck monsters as part of their summoning condition. In this video, we'll go over why Metamorph and its monsters were so bad, even for their time, and the impact these cards had in the future of Yu-Gi-Oh! Let's start by going over the original cards. First of all, we have Metamorph. This is a normal trap which can target and equip itself to a face-up monster on the field. While equipped, that monster gains 300 attack and defense, and if it attacks, it gains half as much attack as the monster it's battling during damage calculation only. While a 300 attack boost is quite a minor amount, it's worth noting this card was released early on in the game's history for its biggest competition being Reinforcements, which is 200 higher but also only a one-time boost, while Metamorph sticks around. This is without even getting to the fact that this is a much better card offensively, letting you beat over huge bodies with any common beater. Why did this card see no play even during the early years? Well, it's a couple of things. First of all, the earlier in Yu-Gi-Oh you go, the more the game is based entirely on the available power spells. While Metamorph is technically stronger than much of the pack filler you could see at this time, 
it doesn't hold a candle to any of the staples of the period, such as Dark Hole or Change of Heart. Even if play Metamorph trades well into a battle phase, you're still going to get 2 for 1 when the turn rolls over to your opponent and they inevitably remove both it and the equipped monster somehow. While it has all the makings of a card that would dominate the most commonly played form of the game at the time, Playground Yu-Gi-Oh!, it couldn't even fulfill that role due to its availability. You were only able to obtain it as a promo for the video game Yu-Gi-Oh! Forbidden Memories in North America. Outside of Spain, who got access to the card only a couple of years after, it ended up unobtainable for much of the rest of the Western world all the way until 2007. By then, this card was already power crept by many other more versatile options, such as Shrink, which kind of achieves the same thing but as a quick play spell card instead. Alongside it, we also got Red Eye's Black Metal Dragon, a level 8 dark machine monster with 2800 attack and 2400 defense. It cannot be normal summoner set and must be special summoned from your deck by tributing a Red Eye's Black Dragon equipped with Metamorph. This card is extremely unique for having an inherent summon condition that works straight from the deck. While it's very common to see conditions like this on monsters that come out from the hand or graveyard, it's only ever been printed in less than a dozen cards out of over 10,000 total. Due to the way it works, the summoning doesn't even start a chain and cannot be responded to directly. So, for example, despite being a summon from the deck, your opponent can't use Ash Blossom and Joy Spring in response to it. Unfortunately, the qualities of this card end there. It requires you to play a terrible vanilla monster, which was only ever put in competitive decks as a garnet to bring out Dragoon when Verte was still legal, but this was way before Red Eyes even became a proper archetype. Red Eyes Black Metal Dragon's only redeeming quality is that it's a retrain, Red Eyes Darkness Metal Dragon, is actually a really good card that's seen play pretty much ever since it came out, and has nothing to do with Metamorph. When looking at Red Eyes Black Metal Dragon, you'd have to consider you're giving up a monster who'd get 2700 total attack, plus half of whatever it attacked into due to Metamorph, into an effectless 2800 attack beater. The 100 attack boost wouldn't even be worth a slot in a deck by itself, but it's even worse when you lose the only thing Metamorph had over Battle Tricks. It really is puzzling why they didn't incorporate the attack gain effect into this at all. Even if a combo to bring out a huge beater might not sound so terrible for the first couple of Yu-Gi-Oh formats, you could do it much better by using the Flute of Summoning Dragon to bring out Blue as White Dragon from your hand instead, which is much easier to pull off. Outside of the novelty of summoning a monster from the deck, there is never any reason to include this card into any strategy. Further on, Zoa, another level 7 vanilla, also got a metamorph version of itself with Metal Zoa. And just like with Red Eyes Black Metal Dragon, it's one level higher and has 400 more in each stat than its original form. However, this card is even more forgettable due to not being attached to a fan favorite archetype like the Red Eyes is, even if its stats are a direct improvement over it. The only interesting thing about Zoa is that it became a bit of a meme in the OCG due to the new Labyrinth archetype. Japan often takes an unusual liking to early Yu-Gi-Oh vanillas, which is why Morinfin actually got exclusive official Konami sleeves at some point, since it was the most voted card in a poll. Zoa is a fiend monster, so it can be cheated out with many Labyrinth cards, and its accompanying Metamorph can also be searched in the archetype due to being a normal trap. This led to many jokes in the OCG over how to play Metal Zoa Turbo with the deck, but not much else. For better or for worse, the Metamorph thing was dropped entirely after these two terrible retrains. However, Konami wouldn't let go of the idea of special summons from the deck so soon. Dark Sage was released just a couple of years afterward, and it's a level 9 Dark Spellcaster monster with 2800 attack and 3200 defense. It cannot be normal summoned or set, and must be special summoned by its own effect. After applying the effect of Time Wizard and calling the coin flip right, you can tribute one Dark Magician to special summon it from your hand or deck. It also lets you add one spell card of your choice from your deck to your hand when it's special summoned this way. Differently from the Metamorph monster, Dark Sage's summon effect actually triggers. This means that once the conditions are met, this is a card effect you'll be activating straight from your deck. While there's always some fun to be had in picking up your deck and activating an effect straight from there, something which usually led to a game loss under normal circumstances, this does make it so Dark Sage's summon condition is respondable by hand traps and the like. Outside of that, it does have a good effect of searching any spell in the game that can win you the game on the spot. Odds are, your opponent wasn't putting much of a fight if you managed to bring out Time Wizard into the field, resolve its effect right after Dark Magician was out, and also resolve Dark Sage. While getting this card out was almost impossible at the time, it's at least very much easier to resolve nowadays due to the plethora of Dark Magician support, as well as Fusion Deployment which can bring out Time Wizard from the deck by revealing Time Wizard of Tomorrow, even if you'll always be at the mercy of the coin toss no matter what. While Dark Sage was still too clunky to ever see play in anything, at least it wasn't less than the sum of its parts like the Metamorph monsters were. However, the same couldn't be said for Konami's next stab at the sort of effect, with Athean the Great Sphinx. This is a level 10 light beast with 3500 attack, which must be special summoned from your hand or deck by paying 500 life points when both Andro Sphinx and Sphinx Talia are destroyed on your side of the field at the same time. For reference, these are both level 10 beaters, which can be special summoned to your side of the field by paying 500 life points while Pyramid of Light is phase up on the field. Pyramid of Light is a continuous trap card which does nothing but destroy Andro and Talia when it leaves the field. 
Thus, making the intended way to bring out the Yin being popping your own pyramid while both of them are on the field. As if that didn't sound banned enough, you'd have to make sure they're both destroyed as a chain link one. Due to Theon being a when you can effect, something as simple as a chain link two mystical space typhoon and pyramid can make this card miss timing straight from the deck. And for all that effort, this card gives you a 3500 attack body and lets you pay 500 life points to increase its attack by 3000 until the end phase. Continue with the trend of terrible cards which can be summoned from the deck for their own effects, we have this in which you exchange a 3500 and a 3000 monster for one with 3500 attack which can go up to 6500 for a turn, with a summoning condition that's arguably harder to get off than the previous card we've talked about. There's an extremely convoluted OTK that can be done by attacking with both the smaller sphinxes and then popping them during the battle phase to attack for lethal, but both back then and now, you can more reliably kill using two cards than you can with these four. Outside of coming up with Evil Eye's gimmick of paying 500 life points to do anything a decade and a half before them, there's nothing that stands out with these cards. Even though it would take a while for Konami to attempt this gimmick on monsters again, Metamorph itself would eventually get a retrain with Rare Metamorph. This is a continuous trap card which can be activated by targeting a machine monster on the field. While it's face up, it grants the machine monster 500 attack and negates the first spell effect that targets that monster. This card falls into the pool of mediocrity as Metamorph and a hundred other attack boost and effects. While the targeting protection could come in handy sometimes, the machine type restriction made it far too awkward for any deck to run. The most interesting tidbit about this card is that its printing seemingly predicted the future. When Metamorph was released for most of the world, it was misprinted as a continuous trap, just like rare Metamorph. And though this card was never good enough to see play in the TCG, it had a very short burst of playability at some point in Duel Links as a way for machine decks writing cards like Sergeant Electro and Ancient Gear Knight to play around enemy controller, one of the format warping staples of that game. The familiar Possessed came out not long after. They all had similar summoning conditions where you must send their flip monster counterpart and a monster with their corresponding attribute to special summon them from the hand or deck. When summoned by this effect, they all get piercing battle damage. Even if it may not look like much, these were the best cards with the ability to special summon themselves from the deck to be put in the game, and by far. Not because their summoning condition would be fulfilled more easily than the others, since you just needed your flip monster to resolve and your opponent have a monster with the same attribute on the field, or because of their piercing battle damage. No. It was because they didn't actually have any summoning restrictions. So you could just normal summon them and have a level 4 1850 beater, which is more utility than any of the cards we've talked about so far would give you 99% of the time. Despite not having been the first to have this gimmick, this piece of support for the individual charmers would make the ability to special summon themselves from the deck become exclusive to the possessed cards from this point on. Several years after the release of these cards, we would get familiar possessed dark, which packs the same effect as the previous ones, but for dark the dark charmer. And as a small bonus, it also adds a level 3 or 4 light spellcaster from the deck on summon. Half a decade after, Konami would give us the familiar possessed form of the last one, Lina. Just like Dark, she also got a bonus effect to add a spellcaster with 1500 defense or less on summon. While they both got decent effects with plenty of targets, these cards were obviously meant to just complete this out of the evolved versions of the charmers, and to not have any kind of actual meta relevance. With so many cards surrounding the originals, the only thing that was left was to tie them up in a proper archetype which Konami would do with the release of the Charmer Structure deck. It was then that we would see monsters which can special summon themselves from the deck being printed into the game for the last time. Ra Senru, Nefarious Archifine, Gigabyte, and Greater Inari Fire were all evolved versions of the original monsters present in the familiar possessed card artwork. They each need you to send a face of spellcaster and a level 4 lower monster of their corresponding attribute to summon themselves from the hand or deck. And they all float into a possessed spell or trap card of their respective spiritual art when sent to the graveyard. They also each have a different on summon effect which is inflicting burn damage equal to your opponent's monster's attack with a Naba, a hand rip, and then making each player draw a card with Gigabyte, a non-targeting bounce with Rasenru, and special summoning a monster from the graveyard with Archfiend. While these monsters all actually had pretty decent effects and not so hard summoning conditions, the Charmer archetype still failed to hold its own when it came to competitive Yu-Gi-Oh. It was now 2020, and if you wanted to get utility by just sending any monster from the field to the graveyard, well, you could just link summon instead. Be it for removal, interruption, or extension, you now had a plethora of much better options which would not take main deck slots and accomplish the same thing, but much easier to pull off. The only impact this archetype ever had in the game was with the link retrains of each charmer, which have pretty much all seen competitive play at some point, due to being able to steal a monster from your opponent's graveyard. This brings us to where we are today, as this mechanic hasn't gotten any new monsters ever since. All in all, the concept of monsters which can bring themselves out from the deck might have been interesting into the first few years of the game, but it suffered from having zero good cards which could make use of it. It wouldn't take long for Konami to realize that they could have the same kind of concept work better by making use of the extra deck. Contact fusions became a thing even before synchro monsters with the gladiator beast, and they achieved more or less the same thing which special summon from the deck cards aimed to do. 
While it is true that it would take a bit more until we got one card fusion, such as Rainbow Overdragon and Egyptian God Slime, we can clearly see that Konami ended up giving all of the monsters with similar summon conditions a purple border for a reason. Be it Cyber Dark End Dragon or Blue Eyes Tyrant Dragon, both need you to tribute a monster equipped with something specific to special summon themselves, just like the Metamorph monsters, or just by tributing a monster once certain conditions have been met during their turn, like Thunder Dragon Colossus and Dark Sage. Not that cards like Metal Zoa or Thenan would be viable if they were extra deck monsters, but at least they'd be better at doing what they're meant to do. This mechanic isn't actually terrible by itself, unlike other cards in this series which are held back by their base design such as Geminis or Spirits, it just hasn't had a single good enough monster printed for it. It is annoying to have to run useless cards in your deck unless specific conditions are met, but history has shown that people are willing to play bricks or even garnets in their deck as long as the payoff is strong enough. If we ever get something with an easy enough summon condition and a decent enough effect that special summons itself from the deck, there's no reason why it wouldn't see play. But then we have the problem that if Konami wanted a monster that works like that, why wouldn't they just print it as a Link monster instead? It's unlikely we'll ever see monsters with a you can special summon this card from your deck tag being put into the game again. But who knows? That's also what everyone was thinking before Konami dropped the newest wave of Charmer support. Maybe we'll see in the next huge wave of power creep it being starters that are available from the deck even if you don't draw them. Or maybe we'll see these cards get forgotten with time as many others were. Either way, for now we can safely say this mechanic has never been successful at any point in Yu-Gi-Oh's history, despite the fact that it can very easily be made that way if they just made any decent cards with it. There's a card in the game called Pharaoh's Treasure, which basically requires you to complete a quest in order to get its effect off, where you first have to set the card in the field and then wait for it to be usable, where you can then simply activate it whenever you want it and it shuffles itself into your deck. However, this card will shuffle itself face up into your deck, where then, if you draw this card while it's face up, you get to add any card in your graveyard to your hand and then send Pharaoh's Treasure to the graveyard. So basically, the quest is just to find a way to draw the card. And if you're able to do that, you're rewarded with an unconditional add back of any card in your graveyard to your hand, which is actually a pretty decent effect, especially for early Yu-Gi-Oh when this card was first printed. Remember that the Dark Magician of Chaos was banned for getting a spell card out of your graveyard. Same with the Magician of Faith. So being able to add back any card from your graveyard was a legitimately good effect with all of the powerful staples that you could grab. The only problem with the card is that the quest of having to find a way to stack the top card of your deck and then draw it was incredibly difficult to do because you either had to randomly draw the card like normal, find a way to draw a whole bunch of cards in your turn with things like Reload or Magical Mallet, or use a Cataveal Omen in order to guarantee it was stacked on top of your deck, which was another slow flip effect monster. And the thing is, the reward for the quest was not good enough to justify building your deck around trying to complete. And also, it was too difficult to complete on its own without support, which meant that it was kind of doomed to fail. If, however, they made the effect even more worth it to complete, then these types of effects might be more useful. But until then, the only ones that exist, which is basically just this one that I know of, are just not good enough for the mechanic to be successful. Gamble cards in Yu-Gi-Oh! are usually described as cards which have effects that are based somewhat on random chance with most of them taking the form of performing a coin toss or rolling a six-sided die, since these are two of the easiest extra materials that an average person should have access to pretty readily. And a vast majority of gamble cards rely on these two mechanics. Gamble cards in Yu-Gi-Oh! are not very prevalent, and rarely do cards with gamble-like effects see competitive play. And why is that exactly? Let's take a look at another card game called Hearthstone, and more specifically, a gamble card called Mind Control Tech. This is a pretty easy to summon minion which has the effect that if your opponent controls four or more minions, you can take control of one of them at random. Now the effect of just stealing one of your opponent's minions is just as valuable in Hearthstone as it is in Yu-Gi-Oh! However, not being able to choose which one you take control of means the card can completely win you the game on its own by stealing a strong boss monster, or gain you a nominal amount of advantage by stealing a small token instead. And Mind Control Tech was so swingy in its nature that it actually was placed on their version of a ban list, for being too good of a gamble card. And Yu-Gi-Oh! even has its own version of a gamble card that's too good in the form of Six Cents. This is a trap card which has the effect where you can declare two numbers from one to six. Then your opponent gets to roll a six-sided die. Based on the result of that roll, one of two things will happen. If the roll is equal to one of the numbers that you declared, you get to draw that many cards. If the roll is something else, you instead send that many cards from the top of your deck to the graveyard. So the best way to make use of six cents is to just declare the numbers five and six. That way if the roll is one of the higher numbers, you can draw five or six cards. 
and being able to draw five or six cards in the modern metagame is a huge advantage that can probably win you the game on its own. However, if you call the roll wrong, you also gain a beneficial effect, because sending cards from the top of your deck to the graveyard is useful in a lot of meta decks as well. So both of the gambling results of Sixth Sense are beneficial effects. It's just one of the effects can straight up win you the game on its own, while the other effect is just also good, but it's probably not going to win you the game. Mind control tech is the same way. If you're lucky, you can steal a very powerful monster your opponent controls and win the game. But if you're not, you still get a good effect. So if gamble effects in Yu-Gi-Oh went along this vein of having super broken good effects on a positive result, or just normal good result on a negative result, then we probably would have a lot more gamble cards in the game that have seen play. However, Sixth Sense is more of an exception rather than the rule. If we take a look at some of the more earlier gamble cards, stuff like Time Wizard, Jirai Gumo, Graceful Dice, Skull Dice, or even Gamble, we have a wide variety of different types of gambling effects. In the case of Time Wizard, one of the most iconic gamble cards in the game, because it appeared heavily in the first anime, we have a low standard monster who has a simple heads or tails effect, where you get to call a coin toss, and if you call it correctly, you get to destroy all of your opponent's monsters, which is an excellent effect. However, if you call it incorrectly, you instead destroy all of your monsters, in addition to take damage equal to half the total of attack of all the monsters that were destroyed on your side of the field. So Time Wizard falls into the category of good effect if you get it right, but terrible effect if you get it wrong. For gamble cards to be good, you need to also have a positive effect on that negative result, because you're still spending cards and losing card advantage to get the cards on the field. And if you spend a resource and don't actually advance the game state for doing so, then you just put yourself behind in card economy that can possibly lose you the duel right there. That's why having a singular card negate as part of your combos is so prevalent in the modern metagame strategies, where they're trying to put as many negates on the board as possible in order to out card advantage your opponent through choice negates. So if the negative result not only does not give you any kind of positives, but is purely detrimental to you and can cause you to lose even more advantage, then it goes into the category of just not being worth using at all. It does fit more to the theme of gamble cards being, you know, a gamble, but the gamble has to be so good that it can possibly win you the game in order to make up for that terrible downside. Time Wizard does have a good effect on its head's result, but itself requires your normal summon or using up a resource to cheat on the field. So if you waste your normal summon on Time Wizard and don't have any other extenders, your whole turn is basically summoning Time Wizard, hoping for a positive result, and you're rewarded with a 500 attack monster of the field that can't really do anything else. So its effect is just not really worth the risk, even though the positive result is technically good. It's just not technically good enough. In the same vein, we also have Gamble, which is a trap card that has the condition where you can only activate this card if your opponent has six or more cards in their hand, and you have two or less cards in yours, where you get to toss a coin and call either heads or tails. And if you call it correctly, you get to draw until you have five cards in your hand. However, if you call it wrong, you skip your next turn. So just like Time Wizard, it has an all or nothing gamble on a simple coin toss, where drawing five cards can possibly win you the game, or skipping your next turn will almost certainly lose you the game. And Gamble would be an excellent card if it wasn't for the activation requirement being really hard to set up. Unlike Time Wizard, trying to get a positive result on Gamble is actually worth putting resources into to an extent it would be worth trying to get a heads result on Gamble. You might even play cards like Second Coin Toss in order to increase your chance to get a positive result from this card. But the game state required in order to even use the card, where your opponent needs to have more than six cards in their hand while you have almost none, just makes it too hard to activate, surprisingly enough, on top of the Gamble effect, maybe losing to the game if it doesn't resolve correctly. So it never saw any competitive play, but it was only half because of its actual Gamble effect. Then we have something like Jirai Gumo, another early gamble card whose effect is just being a high stat in level 4 monster with 2200 attack, which would allow it to beat over pretty much any other level 4 monster in the game at the time, as the highest attack, most played level 4 monster was Zombra the Dark, which only had 2100 attack baseline. So the gamble effect on Jirai Gumo was a little bit different to Time Wizard, in the fact that you always gain the benefits of the card no matter what i.e. it being a 2200 attack level 4 monster. The gamble was whether or not you took a negative effect for declaring an attack, as whenever you attack with a card, you'd have to call a coin toss, and if you called it wrong, you would lose half your life points. However, the attack would still go through. So Jirai Gumo was actually not half bad when it comes to a gamble card, 
because its system of design wasn't an all or nothing gamble, and more of a gamble to see if you would take any kind of negative effect or not, for always having its positive effect available. But its positives were just not good enough, where you'd want to risk the downside of paying half your life points. Because early Yu-Gi-Oh cared a lot more about the life points than modern Yu-Gi-Oh does, so most decks didn't really take that risk. And then we have the Fairy Dice cards. Graceful Dice allows you to roll a six-sided die in order to increase the attack and defense of all your monsters by the result times 100. And Skull Dice was the opposite. You roll a dice in order to lower the attack and defense of all of your opponent's monsters by the result times 100. So, no matter what your result from the die, you were going to gain the beneficial effect from both of these cards. The gamble was simply to see if it was a bigger effect or a smaller one. And the problem with these two cards was that no matter what you rolled, the stat increase or decrease was just incredibly minor, where it didn't really matter. If you always rolled 6 on the result, that's not really worth going minus 1 in card advantage for. So, Graceful Dice and Skull Dice are in the camp of having a positive effect no matter what, it's just the positive effect in a best case scenario is not really worth running either of the cards for. So, there's no risk to getting in a low result either, if the high result is not better than just running a normal staple. Another category of gamble cards are monsters which have a gamble effect in order to copy the effect of another card that does not have a gamble effect tied to it. If we take a look at a card like Cryol, it has the effect where if it's sent to the graveyard as a result of battle, you're able to toss a coin. And if you call it correctly, you get to destroy one monster on your opponent's side of the field. The main benefit of Cryo over something like Maneater Bug is probably that it has more stats. Specifically, it's defensive stats at 1700, so it could be more useful in the field if it eventually goes to the graveyard by maybe surviving a battle phase and blocking out one attack first. But even then, we have cards like Snow Maneater, which have even better defensive stats and gain the positive effect much easier by just being flipped face up. And there's lots of other categories that gamble cards fall into, Sometimes they're there to curtail a positive effect, like Sasuke Samurai number 4 having the ability to destroy monsters at the start of the damage step, but only if you call a coin toss correctly. But going over every other category that gamble cards fall into would probably be listing half of the gamble cards. So this is just to give an example of some of the gamble cards in Yu-Gi-Oh, and gamble cards themselves only receive nominal support over the years, but never really a set that just had nothing but gamble support. Usually they just release random new gamble cards like Nice Foon or Blind Obliteration without really making a big deal of either of the gamble cards. But there have been a couple of archetypes of gamble-like mechanics inside of them. In 2003, they released the first wave of Archfiend cards, which were a series of fiend-type monsters that were based on chessboard pieces and all shared an effect where they had targeted protection from effects, but only under a condition. Let's take a look at Shadow Knight Archfiend, for example. This is a 2000 attack level 4 monster, where it has a maintenance cost of 900 life points during each of your standby phases in order to keep it on the field. And if it's targeted by an opponent's card effect, you get to roll a 6 sided die. And if the result is exactly 3, you get to negate the effect and destroy that opponent's card. And also it halves any battle damage it deals to your opponent because it's a strong level 4 monster in 2003. And a lot of the early Archfiend cards were in this vein. Terror King Archfiend, the boss monster of the archetype, had an 800 life point maintenance cost, and if it was targeted by a card effect, you got to roll a six-sided die. If the result was exactly two or five, you got to negate the effect and destroy your opponent's card. Or if we take a look at the Summon Skull Retrain, which is part of the Archfiend archetype, and was outfitted to have the same effects as them, it has a 500 life point maintenance cost during the standby phase, and if it's targeted by a card effect, you can negate the effect if you roll six-sided die, and the result is one, three, or six. So it has a 50% chance to negate targeted card effects. And they thought being able to sometimes negate a target of effect was so good that these cards required a maintenance cost to be on the field because obviously they were going to be broken if they could just be used like normal monsters. And the early Archfiends were terrible. And future iterations of Archfiends completely abandoned all of the mechanics of the early Archfiends with only their Link monster paying homage to them where it kind of does what they were trying to do but better. It has a 500 maintenance cost during the standby phase but also an effect where, if you pay life points, you can send a fiend monster from your deck to the graveyard that has an attack or defense equal to the amount of life points you paid. And then it has a gamble effect where if a fiend type monster is sent to the graveyard, you can roll a six sided die and then apply one of its three effects based on the result. Where if the result is one exactly, you can add the card to your hand. If it's two to five, it's shuffled back into the deck. Or if the result is six exactly, you get to special summon that card. So the card only has a 1 in 3rd chance of having a positive effect by rolling a 1 or 6. However, there is a trap card called That 6, 
which will always treat a dice roll as either 6 or 1. So it at least has some combo potential to always gain a positive result. So the first wave of Archfiend cards with their gamble-like protection was just not very good. Even though having targeted protection is very good, it's just gambling on whether or not you actually get to be target immune was not enough to make all the mediocre monsters with low attack and maintenance costs see very much competitive success. In 2008, they released another gamble archetype in the form of the Arcana Force cards. These cards all have the gamble effects, where when this card is summoned you get to toss a coin, and depending on the coin toss it would gain one of two effects. Where the heads effect was almost always a positive effect, and the tails effect was usually negative. However, the tails effect was usually super negative, like in the case of Arcana Force 7, the chariot. Where if you got the tails result on its effect, you had to give control of the card to your opponent. Not all of them were as bad as the chariot, but they were pretty close. Arcana Force 3, the Empress, had a tails effect, where each time your opponent normal summons a monster, you would have to send a card from your hand to the graveyard. Where its positive effect was simply that if your opponent normal summons a monster, you were allowed to special summon an Arcana Force monster from your hand. Special summoning monsters from your hand is technically a good effect, but waiting for your opponent to normal summon a monster to do this is too slow for it to be worthwhile. Whereas having a discard each time your opponent normal summons a monster is much worse. The Arcana Force cards kind of failed horribly, just like the early Archfiends. A lot of them had technically good effects with their positive heads effects, and even had some ways of kind of forcing the heads effects with their field spell card Light Barrier, where it allowed you to choose the effect of the monster when it was summoned, but also required a coin toss each turn to see if you got to keep the effects or not. So the Arcana Force archetype did not see competitive play, even if a few of the cards in the archetype did see play, three of them to be exact. Arcana Force Zero the Fool, probably the most out of all of them. It has a gamble effect where, when this card is summoned, you get to toss a coin, and then the card will negate and destroy any card effect which targets the card, where if you got heads, it will negate your effects on the card, and if you get tails, it negates your opponent's effects on the card. So it's one of the few that has a positive tails effect rather than heads. However, this card was almost never summoned in a way where it would use its effect, as the reason this card saw play was because it had the effect where it can't be destroyed by battle and battle immune monsters were kind of rare in 2008, where the few that did exist were actually limited on the ban list, so having an unlimited monster that was immune to battle destruction was pretty useful for some decks, especially if they needed a light or fairy type monsters. So Arcana Force Zero the Fool was not really used for its gamble effect at all, and just the other effect of the card. Same case for Arcana Force 14, Temperance, which was almost never used for its summon effect and instead for its hand effect, where you could discard this card from your hand in order to take no battle damage from a battle. In fact, Temperus sees a lot of play in Duel Links because of how valuable that effect is in that version of the game. The Arcana Force card that actually saw play for its gamble effect is Arcana Force 21, The World, where its heads effects has the effect that during your end phase, you can send two monsters you control to the graveyard to skip your opponent's next turn. And being able to skip your opponent's turn can kind of win you the game because of how powerful that effect is. So a danger deck took Arcana Force The World to an event, used a super combo that allowed them to turbo the card out as well as search out Light Barrier to guarantee its head effect, and then skip their opponent's turn in order to beat them with the extra board setup. And none of these three Arcana Force cards were played together in any of the decks that used them in competitive play. And the only reason Arcana Force 21 The World was able to see competitive play, even if it was only a single time, was because there was a way to guarantee its gamble effect to have a positive result. A lot of gamble cards don't have these kinds of reassurances, especially some of the cards that are built purely for what I assume Konami thought would be a gamble deck. Let's take a look at the Sand Gambler, Gambler of Legend, and Dice Jar. The Sand Gambler is a level 3 monster with only 300 attack, which has the effect where you toss a coin 3 times, and if all 3 results are heads, you get to destroy all of your opponent's monsters. But if the result is 3 tails, you instead destroy all of your monsters. So it's like a harder to use time wizard, even though it was supposed to be meant as a pure gambling card, it doesn't actually have a better effect than one Time Wizard is able to do for a much easier result that can be somewhat controlled with Second Coin Toss. As Second Coin Toss, what this card allows you to do is once per turn negate the result of one Coin Toss in order to flip it again. If the card requires more than one Coin Toss like Sand Gambler, you can't really use Second Coin Toss, which actually made monsters who only toss a single coin for their effect a lot more valuable than ones who toss multiple, since they also introduced a card called Lucky Chance. Where, once per turn, if a monster activates a coin toss effect, which only tosses one coin, you get to then toss a coin and call heads or tails in order to draw one card after the effect resolves. And it wasn't until way later that they added support for cards that tossed multiple coins, with Proton Blast. 
This card wasn't released until 2018, 14 years after Sand Gambler, and it has the effect that once per turn, if an effect is activated which tosses coins, you can resolve its effects based on the number of heads you get, where you can inflict 500 points of damage to your opponent with one heads result, destroy one card your opponent controls with two, or look at your opponent's hand and discard one card from their hand if you get three or more. And you can accumulate all three of these effects with multiple coin tosses, but you can only try once per turn. And it even has a graveyard effect, where if you activate an effect which tosses two or more coins, you can banish this card from your graveyard in order to treat all of the results as heads. So Proton Blast would have been excellent support for Sand Gambler in the early days of the game. Although, even being able to guarantee three heads results would probably not allow Sand Gambler to see play today, because the effect is just not good enough for all of that setup. Three years after Sand Gambler in 2007, they released the Gambler of Legend, which is an upgraded version that has the effect where you can toss a coin three times and then apply the appropriate effect based on the number of heads, where if you get three heads, you destroy all of your opponent's monsters, just like Sand Gambler. If you only get two heads, you get to discard one random card from your opponent's hand. If you get one head, you have to destroy one of your cards, and if you get three tails, you have to discard your entire hand. So Gambler of Legend is a vast improvement over the original, of being a pure gambling card, as it has two possible positive effects. And then there's Dice Jar, which requires both players to roll a six-sided die, and the player with a lower result takes damage equal to the result times 500. However, if someone wins the result by rolling a six, the loser takes 6,000 damage instead. And if the result on both dice is the same, you just re-roll until you get a different result. So, if we were to take the pure gambled theme cards that are meant to work outside of archetypes and stand on their own, and put them into a deck with a whole bunch of support to allow their effects to go off better, and you were lucky enough to get heads results on pretty much everything, your win condition would be to hope your opponent has no forms of disruptions to stop your plays because they can't really push for game on their own, and they can't really deal enough damage to win unless you're able to resolve Dice Jar's effect twice with the six roll. Part of the problem with gamble cards is that pure gamble cards just do such a bad job of being staples that they can't really be played in a normal deck in order to complement their plays. And they simultaneously don't fit in their own decks of just gamble effects either. So the only way gamble cards have been able to see competitive play is if they fit into a distinction of being a good staple, that happens to interact well with an archetype, if you're able to make use of the negative side effects, or if it's part of an archetype which allows you to circumvent a lot of its effects. And there have been some other cards that fit into all of those other categories. To continue the video on gamble cards and failed mechanics, we're actually going to be going over a lot of successful gamble cards over the game's history, starting off with some of the gamble staples. With these, we have number 85 Crazy Box, Fairy Box, Blowback Dragon, number 7 Lucky Straight, Snipe Hunter, and of course, Six Sense. All of these gamble cards were played as staple cards that happened to fit in with the theme of a particular deck. Let's start with number 85 Crazy Box. This is a generic rank 4 monster with 3000 attack and has the effect where it cannot attack. But it has an effect to detach one of its materials in order to roll a 6 sided die, where you can gain one of 6 effects. The reason Crazy Box saw play was because it was a 3000 attack beat stick which you could just have its effect negated with something like Skill Drain in order to have easy access to a beat stick sometimes, or just a high attack monster on the field for other kinds of effects. It wasn't really played because of its gamble effect at all. Fairy Box is a continuous trap card where each time your opponent declares an attack, you're able to toss a coin and call heads or tails. And if you call it correctly, you get to reduce that monster's attack to zero, which could result in it getting destroyed if it was attacking into one of your monsters. And on a negative result, simply nothing happens. So it was kind of the case of, you constantly got to try for a very positive effect, and didn't really get anything bad if it happened to fail that result. Other than maybe your opponent attacking you directly when you really needed to reduce their attack to zero. And Dark Sanctuary has a similar effect, but without a maintenance cost every turn. Blowback Dragon is a level 6 monster with 2300 attack that has the effect, where once per turn you can target any card your opponent controls, and then toss a coin three times. And if at least two of the results are heads, you get to destroy that card. So, Blowback Dragon was played a lot in early Chaos decks, or just decks that could facilitate a Tribute Summon, because Blowback Dragon had decent stats for a level 6 monster at 2300, and had a chance to destroy back row in addition to monsters, even if it wasn't guaranteed. Plus, it was dark attributes, so it could be useful in the graveyard later, while also having all the other benefits described. Number 7 Lucky Straight is a rank 7 Xyz monster which requires 3 level 7 monsters as materials, which means it's actually kind of hard to bring out. And it has the effect where it can detach one of its materials in order to roll a 6-sided die twice. 
where its attack becomes the larger of the two rolls times 700 until the end of your opponent's next turn, where you then gain an additional effect if both of the dice results happen to add up to exactly 7. So if you rolled a 5 and a 2, a 3 and a 4 for example, etc etc. You then got to choose one of three special effects, where you can either send all other cards in the field to the graveyard, special summon one monster from your hand or either player's graveyards, or draw three cards and discard two. All three of these effects were really good, much better than the effects of Gambler of Legend even, and that's supposed to be a pure gambling card. And it's easier to get a sum of seven when rolling two dice than it is to get three heads. The chance of getting three coin tosses on heads in a row is one in eight, or 12.5%. The chance of getting a sum of seven on two dice rolls is one in six, or 16.67%. So, if it's only slightly higher, why did a super gamble-focused card like Lucky Straight see competitive play, and even a ton of competitive play at that? Well, its effect is not once per turn, and it has three materials, which means when brought out, you could immediately try three times for an exact seven dice result. And also, because it's an extra monster that can be special summoned, you don't have to waste up your normal summon to bring it out or any main deck space, and it's perfect for the type of thing that gamble cards are trying to go for of just maybe having a really good effect if you're lucky, and it just being an option that you can summon. But its materials were really hard to work with, except for the fact that Dragon Rulers were able to spam out level 7 monsters like no other archetype has been able to do since. Dragon Rulers were kind of the king of having too many level 7 monsters in the field that they didn't know what to do with, so a lot of the times Dragon Rulers would play Lucky Straight as just an option for mirror matches, where there were a lot of board states that Dragon Rulers just couldn't deal with, so a way of trying to deal with them was by using Lucky Straight and getting the ability to send all cards in the field to the graveyard. It was basically played because they didn't really have any other options that didn't target, and they could go into it very easily, and at the very least they could try for a high beat stick. Because if they rolled a 6 on one of their results, it would have 4900 attack. So it still wasn't a super successful gamble card, but it came very close. Then we have Snipe Hunter, which absolutely was a successful gamble card probably the most successful gamble card outside of Sixth Sense. Snipe Hunter is a level 4 monster with 1500 attack, which has the effect where you can discard one card, then target one card in the field and roll a six-sided die, where if the result of the dice roll is anything but one or six, you're able to destroy that card. Which means you have a two-thirds chance of getting a positive result, or a one in three chance of losing a discard from your hand with no positive result. And what made Snipe Hunter an absolute unit of a gamble card that saw more competitive success than any other gamble card in the game's history was the fact that its effect was not once per turn and had a higher than a 50% chance to succeed, as a two-thirds chance comes out to around 66.7%. So, you have a higher chance of resolving Snipe Hunter's positive effect than you do of calling a coin toss correctly. And it was this tiny little boost in probability that allowed it to actually be very successful, especially since your opponent didn't actually know the result of the dice roll until the effect resolved. So, if you targeted one of your opponent's back row cards with Snipe Hunter's effect, they would have to choose to activate the effect immediately or risk the effect landing a positive result and getting the card destroyed before they got a chance to chain it. And since Snipe Hunter allowed you to basically use your entire hand to try to destroy your opponent's field, it was great for decks that loved to ditch their cards from their hand to the graveyard in targeted amounts. So Snipe Hunter saw a ton of play in 2007 shortly after it came out, as an unlimited amount of targeted destruction was just unheard of at the time and it was mostly played in decks that wanted cards in the graveyard and was played alongside the Card Trooper, Machine Duplication, Dark Magician to Chaos, into a Metamorphosis, Cyber Twin Dragon, O2K with limited removal combo. Then in 2008 and 2009, it saw a ton of play in Dark Arm Dragon decks, before then seeing another resurgence in 2013 with Dragon Rulers, as a way to ditch all of them into the graveyard while destroying your opponent's cards in the field. So Snipe Hunter saw immediate impact when it first came out in all kinds of decks, then was used as a semi-staple in one of the few Tier 0 decks in the game's history, and then used again in another pseudo-Tier 0 deck with Dragon Rulers. You can't really have a more impressive record than Snipe Hunter, where the only card that could possibly beat it out in terms of playability, and also being a pure gamble card, would definitely have to be Sixth Sense, if it wasn't banned almost immediately after its introduction. So, those are the gamble cards which happen to fit into other decks as staples, we also have gamble cards, which were used because they don't care if their negative effect happens or not. Although that category is incredibly small, to the point where I can only really think of three of them, that being Cup of Ace, Fiend Comedian, and Paths of Destiny. The Paths of Destiny has the effect where both players toss a coin, and if the result is heads, you gain 2,000 life points, but if the result is tails, you take 2,000 points of damage. 
This card was played with Bad Reaction to Samochi decks, where no matter the result of your opponent's coin toss, they would take 2,000 points of damage, which is a ton of damage to take from one card. And with Cup of Ace, it simply has the effect where you toss a coin and heads, you draw two cards, tails, your opponent draws two cards. It was occasionally played in OTK slash FDK decks that were trying to just draw a whole bunch of cards in one turn, because a lot of those decks would try to use cards like Hand Destruction in order to cycle through their deck faster. But Hand Destruction requires your opponent to have two cards in their hand in order to use and resolve the effect. So a lot of players were able to counter these FDK deck strategies by just setting everything in their hand during their turn. So Cup of Ace allowed you to actually give your opponent two cards so that you can continue all of your plays like normal, or if you got a heads, you just draw two cards, which was good as well. And Fiend Comedian has the effect where if you toss a coin and call it, and you get a correct result, you get to banish all cards in your opponent's graveyard. But if you call it wrong, you send a number of cards from the top of your deck to the graveyard, equal to the number of cards in your opponent's graveyard. So on a positive result, you banish all the cards in your opponent's graveyard, which is good. And a negative result, you get to mill a whole bunch of cards, which is also good. So Fiend Comedian actually saw a lot of play in Lightsworn and Inferno decks that love to mill cards. And outside of the examples I listed in these two past sections, that's pretty much it when it comes to cards that saw widespread competitive play while also being a gamble card. Now let's go over a different category of gamble cards, random gamble cards that are part of archetypes that are normally not about gambling. This category is incredibly small and I can only really think of two examples. First are Morphtronics. They have two level one monsters that have effects that are correlated to rolling dice. Morphtronics Smart Fawn has the effect that while it's an attack position, once per turn you can roll a six sided die. Look at that many cards atop your deck, then add one Morphtronic card from your deck to your hand amongst the ones you looked at. And then it has a defense position effect where you can just look and rearrange the top cards of your deck equal to a dice roll. The other level one Morphtronic is Morphtronic Selfon, which is a little bit better as its effect is to roll a six sided die to look at the top cards of your deck equal to the dice result. However, you then get to special summon a level four or lower Morphtronic monster amongst them, ignoring its summoning conditions. And its defense effect is to simply look at the top cards of your deck equal to a dice result, but then just return them to the deck in the same order. So Morphtronic Selfon's attack position effect is the better of the two, because it potentially allows you to special summon a monster from your deck without a cost. So if you get Morphtronic Selfon on the field, successfully resolve its effect by special summoning a single monster, then you just went plus one in card advantage from your deck, which is actually really good. Especially since it can special summon other copies of itself to try the effect again. The gamble nature of its effect is simply to rein in how good that effect actually is by not allowing you to just pick any target from your deck. Although there is a chance you can roll a one and then the top card of your deck is not a Mortronic monster at all and you don't get to special summon any monsters. Mortronic Selfon does see play Mortronic decks as kind of a staple card to get their plays going, but Morphtronics are not a competitive deck probably because one of their best cards has a gamble effect tied to its good effect. Then if you look at the Speedroid archetype, they also randomly have a good card with a gamble effect called Speedroid Wheel. This is a quick play spell card which requires you to discard one card to activate it, then you get to roll a six sided die. Based on the result of that dice roll, you then get to special summon one or two monsters from your hand or deck. Just as long as the levels of those monsters is equal to the result of your dice roll, but their effects are negated. However, if you're not able to summon a monster, you lose life points equal to the result of the roll times 500. So if you roll a six, for example, you can special summon two level three monsters from your deck. And with the discard cost, this is card neutral and card advantage, but being able to discard in order to special summon two monsters from your deck is incredibly good. So the random nature of the dice roll is there in order to rein in that really good effect, just like Morphtronic Selfon. And because of the random nature of the card, it's not super reliable to actually use. And there is the possibility that you'll only be able to summon one monster, or not that at all, if you just happen to roll a result where you don't have cards to special summon. Although with a possible upside to its effect, and with how most of the Speedroid monsters are low level anyway, I'm curious to see if Speedroid Wheel will actually be a staple part of the Speedroid archetype or not, because it is a rather new card that was released in 2021. Konami does still release new gamble-like effects randomly. The fact that Speedroid's got a random dice roll related card is probably because some of their cards have dice in their artwork. But they also just randomly release new gamble-like cards all the time anyway. Some of the more recent examples of modern gamble cards that they've released randomly are Head Judging and Diced Dice. Diced Dice was released at the end of 2020 and is a quick play spell card which has the effect to roll a six sided die. And if you roll a one or six, you get to search any card from your deck that requires a die roll. However, if you fail, which is more than likely since you only have a one in third chance of succeeding, 
Then you get to roll another six-sided die to determine what happens next. Where if you happen to roll a one or six, you get to return this card to your hand. But since the card itself has a hard once per turn, you won't be able to try for its effect again until your next turn. But if you roll a two to five, you place the card on top of your deck instead. Which means you'll probably get to try again on your next turn, but it's taking up your normal draw, which is pretty bad. This card was most likely created in order to interact with that six, to always force a result of one or six on a die roll. Head Judging was released in 2020 and is a continuous trap card which has the effect where if a monster activates its effect on the field, you can choose to make the activating player toss a coin and call it. If they call it correctly, then Head Judging destroys itself. If they call it incorrectly, however, then the activation of the effect is negated and you get to change control of that monster to your opponent. So Head Judging has the potential to both negate the effect of one of your opponent's monsters and then take control of it, and it forces the coin toss on your opponent. However, if they simply call it correctly, then the card immediately goes to the graveyard and you go minus one in card advantage. But if you're successful, you go plus two in card advantage with that steal. And then you'll get to use it again on your next turn since it's a continuous trap card with only a hard once per turn limitation on its effect. Head Judging saw all of no play in the regular TCG, but it is currently semi-limited in Duel Links. In Duel Links, gamble decks have been a lot more successful because they have skills in the game which allow you to force positive results. Like one of the most famous ones, Master of Destiny, for example, which allows the first three coin tosses you make in a duel to always land on heads. So, this skill turns Cup of Ace into a pure pot of greed, without any chance of getting the negative effect. And that skill was very good and kind of overpowered, especially since they also released Desperado Barrel Dragon in the game at around the same time the skill was added, which actually gave Gamble decks a decent boss monster to rally behind. Desperado Barrel Dragon can special summon itself from your hand if a Dark Machine type monster you control is destroyed by battle or card effect. During the battle phase, you can forego its attack in order to toss a coin three times, where you can then destroy a number of face-up monsters in the field up to the number of heads. And you gain an extra effect where if you get three heads, you also get to draw one card. Then, if this card is sent to the graveyard in any way, you get to add a level 7 or lower monster from your deck to your hand that has a coin toss in effect. So, Desperado could bring itself out from your hand with BM4 Blast Spider destroying one of your opponent's cards, it could then destroy all of your opponent's cards during the battle phase, and it could search out another coin toss card from your deck if it was sent to the graveyard from the field or hand, as you could use it as a full cost for something like Machina Fortress in order to bring itself out. And then search out one of your coin toss effects. And not only was this gamble deck good in Duel Links, it was kind of oppressive. To the point where they had to nerf a lot of the cards involved. So there's a couple of gamble cards that are on their ban list purely to reduce the power level of Master of Destiny decks. And this was after they nerfed the skill itself multiple times. Having guaranteed head results is just that powerful. Especially in a low power level version of the game like Duel Links. Which kind of leads into the last point of the video. What could they do if they wanted gamble effects to be more competitive? Duel Links already kind of solved that problem by just allowing you to guarantee the positive result of those gamble effects. In order to play Master of Destiny, your deck needs to have seven or more cards with different names that require a coin toss. And it even skips your first draw phase during the duel, so you start off with a minus one in card advantage. And even with all of those restrictions on the deck building and the direct negative to your card advantage, they still had to limit a whole bunch of the cards to rein in that deck's power level. So, if in the TCG, they created an archetype all about allowing you to force positive results on gamble effects, that would probably elevate them to competitive status. Although, the way they could do that without any skills in the normal game is kind of difficult to think about, because it would require them to pretty much create an entire archetype around this concept, where they wouldn't really need to use the old gamble cards anyway. So, outside of creating a whole new archetype that's kind of like the Master of Destiny skill from Duel Links, what they could do is create gamble cards that have effects more similar to Sixth Sense or Graceful Dice, where you just have varying levels of positive successes, and you don't actually get a negative effect at all for using the card. If we were to take a look at something like Dice Foon as an example of something to fix, Dice Foon has the effect on a quick play spell card that has a chance to destroy spell or trap cards on the field. Since it's a quick play spell card, it has all of the benefits of MST, but it has the terrible downside where, if you roll a 1 or 6, not only does it not destroy a card, but you take 1,000 points of damage. So because the card has a 1 in 3rd chance of being purely detrimental, it doesn't really see competitive play in the TCG. If we were to fix this card in order to make it more playable, what you could do is change that 1 in 6 effect, where instead of having the card having a purely detrimental effect to you, it could have a lesser positive effect instead, of maybe only destroying a face down spell or trap card. That way, all possible effects on its dice roll would have a positive effect and that would probably make the card actually see play and not really be overpowered in any way. 
And in fact, Konami kind of did this when they created the new fusion card for Time Wizard, where its effect is to destroy all monsters in the field and the coin toss simply determines if you or your opponent takes life point damage equal to half the original attack of the destroyed monsters. And also, Desperado Barrow Dragon is a good example of a gamble card because its effect has such a small chance of having a negative effect, as during the battle phase it's able to toss a coin three times and destroy a number of face-up monsters equal to the result of heads. So, you have a 12.5% chance of getting three tails, which would result in no cards getting destroyed and only giving up your attack in order to activate that effect which means nothing if you're using this effect during your opponent's battle phase. So, if they were to make a gamble card suck less, what they could do is just make the effect always do something positive and only have a better positive effect if it fully succeeds. Even Snipe Hunter would be improved if it actually did something useful on its 1 or 6 result, as the reason it stopped seeing play after Dragon Rulers was because the effect is just not good enough in the modern metagame for a main deck monster that requires your normal summon. Because even if the effect has a 100% chance to destroy a targeted card with its cost, it probably wouldn't be good enough to see play today. Just to give an example of how far the game has progressed since 2013. In fact, we can be pretty certain it wouldn't see any play, seeing as they unbanned Tribe Infecting Virus, which can discard one card to potentially destroy all of your opponent's monsters without a gamble, on a non-once-per-turn effect as well, and it doesn't see any competitive play at all. So, in conclusion, the reason gamble cards don't really work in Yu-Gi-Oh! is because a lot of them are bad. And the best gamble cards in the game are ones that were useful for things besides its gamble effect. Had a higher than 50% chance to succeed, that gamble effect will also be useful for other things. Or had a positive effect no matter the outcome of the gamble. And there were almost no exceptions to these rules. There were only three cards in the game that grant an additional battle phase. Those being Last Turn, Weather Report, and An Unfortunate Report. All three of these cards are introduced in early Yu-Gi-Oh! And there haven't been any other cards that grant additional battle phase since these three. There's even a card in the game that exists purely to grant an additional battle phase to the Valkyrie archetype, called Mischief of the Time Goddess. However, instead of just allowing you to perform the battle phase again, they make you skip an entire turn to go back to it on technically a different turn. Now, the reason they do this with Mischief of the Time Goddess is probably because it just fits with the card's allure, because every card in the game is already designed with the intention that multiple battle phases are a thing. If a monster has the ability to attack twice, it will always just mention that it can attack during every battle phase, intending that there might be more than one. I'm pretty sure Konami wishes they could just go back and remove the three cards that mention extra battle phases, specifically so they can stop mentioning battle phases as a plural, when almost no one is actually entering these extra phases. And one can only guess why they've removed extra battle phases from the game and haven't been printing more cards that could actually do this, since they keep balancing cards around the fact that multiple battle phases can exist and it's probably because the battle phase is actually kind of sacred to an extent. Normally, cards that only interact with the battle phase are not as good as cards that interact with the main phases, but it's a different story when you talk about getting an additional battle phase, which can almost guarantee that you'll win in a vast majority of cases, because it essentially gives all of your monsters the ability to attack twice, and the ability to attack twice is actually a very premium effect that is rarely given to cards unless it's slightly nerfed where they can only attack multiple monsters specifically and not directly. So double battle phases isn't actually a failed mechanic because it's bad, quite the contrary. It's a little bit too good to keep printing on usable cards. Toons were one of the earliest monster subtypes to be put in the game, being cartoon versions of other popular monsters which have summoning sickness, but also the ability to attack directly. And in this video we'll be going over how Konami treated what's arguably the first Yu-Gi-Oh archetype, as well as the impact it had on the game throughout the years. In the first main set released in the West, way back in 2002, the Toon Monsters were introduced to the TCG. This initial wave set the tone for the archetype for the rest of the time, being comprised entirely of parodies of other monsters. We got retrains for Blue Eyes White Dragon, Ru Ran, Red Archery Girl, and Summit Skull, as well as the titular Toon World. The monsters all share the same effects, being that they first need to be special summoned from your hand by tributing the amount of monsters they need to be brought out with normal summons. They cannot attack the turn that they're special summoned, and require to pay 500 life points to declare an attack, and can attack your opponent directly unless they control a Toon monster, in which case they must target that for its attacks. And last, if Toon World is destroyed, they get destroyed as well. Despite having such large effects text between each monster, these retrained vanillas were hardly better than their original forms. The only thing they had going for them was being one of the first few ways to special summon monsters from your hand in the game. However, the setup was just too big to ever make it worth it, as you needed both tribute fodder and a specific spell in the field to get them all out, putting it on par with the terrible at the time ritual summons. For all of their restrictions and requirements, all they give you was a decently sized monster that could attack directly, but only a turn after they were summoned. 
making them very likely to die to some form of removal before doing anything. To make matters worse, these monsters all die to both monster and spell trap removal, as if the continuous spell gets removed, they go out with it. Toon World didn't help with their viability at all, as despite being a reality warping tool in the anime, it has literally no effects in its real world form, only a 1000 life point cost to be activated. With all that said, this would still be the only card out of the first wave of Toon supports to see play in the following years. However, it sets out a bad precedent for the archetype, when the card that does literally nothing manages to be more useful than the entire monster lineup. A couple of years later, Konami would once again try their hand at making Toon monsters, this time not limiting themselves for vanillas when it came to retrains. In 2005, we got tunified versions of Cannon Soldier, Goblin Attack Force, Gemini Elf, and Mass Sorcerer. Unlike the first wave of monsters, these have no summon restrictions, allowing them to be normal summoned or special summoned as you wish. They still kept the summoning sickness and the effect to be destroyed when Toon World gets popped, but they didn't need to pay 500 life points to attack anymore. In addition to the ability to attack directly, they also got different monster effects based on their original forms. Toon Cannon Soldier gets the tribute monster to inflict 500 life points of damage to your opponent. The Goblin Attack Force has a huge 2300 attack stat line on level 4 monster, but gets stuck in defense position for a turn if it attacks. Toon Mass Sorcerer lets you draw a card if it inflicts spell damage to your opponent. And lastly, Toon Gemini Elf, being the only one based on an effectless monster, got an effect that matches Mass Sorcerer's, but making your opponent discard a random card when it damages dealt instead. This new wave also gave Toon spells and traps with actual effects to be used, like Toon Defense. A continuous trap which can make your opponent attack directly when they target one of your level 4 lower Toon monsters for attacks. Despite this being such a mediocre inclusion to the archetype, it came alongside the main reason Toon cards saw play at all, Toon Table of Contents, which is a normal spell which reads, add one Toon card from your deck to your hand. The fact that this card doesn't exclude itself from the search, letting you add another Table of Contents off of it, gave this card a niche in multiple decks throughout the years. Being able to deck then and fill the graveyards with three spells is something no other card can do. This unique role has made this card a huge staple in many decks centered around Magical Explosion. A normal trap just does 200 damage to your opponent for each spell card in your graveyard. Toon Cannon Soldier saw play in old OTK slash FDK decks due to being more easy to find than the regular Cannon Soldier, letting you capitalize off of combos that give you infinite fodder, such as Dark Magician of Chaos looping Dimension Fusion. Toon World would go on to see play in similarly degenerate strategies, but which plan to draw through their whole deck to win instead. Royal Magical Library is a monster which gains a spell counter each time a spell card is activated and lets you remove three spell counters to draw a card. This means a single Toon Table of Contents represents four spell counters on Library, as you get your other two copies and then activate a Toon World. Since it's a continuous spell, it'll also combo well with other enablers for Library, because Giant Trunade can bounce them all back to your hand to reuse them to get even more counters. The light point cost was actually a bit of an upside since it helped you reach the light point threshold needed to activate some of the win conditions, such as Life Equalizer for Magical Explosion or Reversal Quiz. Toon World would also see a tiny bit of play in very early builds of Magical Musketeers, as all of the monsters in that archetype let you plus in some way when a spell trap card was activated in the same column as themselves. Since the deck used to rely on Ties of the Brotherin to flood the field with monsters for a power play, the Table of Contents engine enabled you to activate up to four Magical Musketeers effects off of a single card. Toon Table of Contents' power was so high, it even allowed two Gemini Elf to get itself a few tops to its name in Spellbook decks. The strategy's strongest card, Spellbook of Judgment, gives you an extra add off of a Spellbook spell card for each spell card activated that turn, as well as lets you summon a Spellcaster monster from your deck who has a level less than or equal to that number. So, by comboing Judgment with Toon Table of Contents, you get to add three spells in Jaujin the Spiritualist, a really powerful floodgate on your side of the field at the end of the turn. As a bonus, since Toon Gemini Elf is a spellcaster, it can also be used to turn on many of your spellbook cards in a pinch, though hopefully you'd be discarded for hand size at the end of the turn instead of after filling your hand with Spellbook of Judgment. Even Blue Eyes Toon Dragon ended up seeing some play, and that was not due to the Blue Eyes support catapulting the deck into a world's win at the year. Rather, it was because of Monarch FTK. It saw play there as a great way to thin the deck, while also giving you another trade-in on top of the Monarchs to make it even easier to draw through your whole deck. While many of these cards would go on to see play after release, the Toon archetype itself was forgotten for a really long time. The only other monster the archetype got was Toon Dark Magician Girl shortly after, whose effects makes her gain 300 attack for each Dark Magician or Magician of Black Chaos in the graveyards. However, this card was only notable for being the first Toon monster that did not have summoning sickness or a cost to attack. But this is only because, due to the way Konami used to write cards before problem solving card text was a thing, it would be impossible to also fit those restrictions into the text box back in the day. This did make this card into what was probably the best Toon monster of the time, but it still wasn't nearly good enough to make this strategy worth building around. The archetype's playstyle and win condition only got more outdated by the day, and Toons remained forgotten as anything but as Toon Table of Contents enablers. However, around a decade after Toon Dark Magician Girl was introduced to the game, Konami would try their hand once again at making direct Toon support. 
Throughout 2015 and 2016, Toons would be revitalized with many new members, be it for monsters or spells and traps. Toons Cyber Dragon, just like Cyber Dragon, is a 2100 tag beater with the ability to be brought out for free as long as your opponent controls a monster and you don't. This would go on to become the most played 2 monster in Yu-Gi-Oh! history, for reasons entirely unrelated to the main archetype. Early during the Link era, Konami would release some new batches of Cyber Dragon support. This included Chimera Tag Mega Fleet Dragon, a level 10 fusion monster which can contact fuse using one Cyber Dragon monster and one or more monsters in the extra monster zone, and it can use monsters from either side of the field as its materials. Essentially, this allowed you to use Cyber Dragon's body on the field as a way to remove your opponent's monsters from the extra monster zone. This matched incredibly well with the meta at the time, as the top decks all relied on Link monsters for their strategies, and even if they didn't, due to how Master Rule 4 worked, they would still be putting a monster into the extra monster zone as long as they went into the extra deck at all. Mega Fleet was a big reason why Cyber Dragons were a viable rogue deck for multiple formats, and its power was so great they'd sometimes even run Toon Cyber Dragon as more copies of Cyber Dragon, just to make sure you'd consistently be able to deal with your opponent's board before committing to your normal summon. When it comes to splashing Mega Fleet Dragon in other decks as a going second option, most decks opted to run a playset of regular Cyber Dragon. However, Sky Striker decks would often go for Toon Table of Contents plus Toon Cyber Dragon instead, as they would also let you get 3 spell cards in the graveyard, unlocking the full power of their Sky Striker spells without having to play into the board at all. Toon Cyber Dragon ended up as the most useful Toon monster in Yu-Gi-Oh's history, but while it did have its niche, the amount of play it saw was still just a fraction of regular Cyber Dragons. This was the only card from its way of support to actually see play, and the last time a Toon card would be consideration for any deck. Around the time it came out, we also got retrains for Ancient Gear Golem, which inflicts piercing battle damage and disables all spells and traps at the end of the damage step and Buster Blader, which gains 500 attack reach a dragon in your opponent's field and in the graveyard. The original versions of these monsters never really saw any play back in the day, and were only reluctantly put on modern versions of the decks due to being required bricks for certain cards, and so did nothing for Toons themselves. Lastly, there was also Toon Barrel Dragon, with its pretty unimpressive effect to target a card in the field and pop it if you throw two out of three heads, whose only notable trait is that it's retrain once wrecked havoc in dual links. However, even if these three were quite mediocre, the archetype would also go on to receive a plethora of spell and trap card support around the same time. The most important of these cards was Toon Kingdom, the long-awaited retrain for Toon World. This field spell requires you to banish three cards to the top of your deck face down on activation. It becomes Toon World while it's on the field and makes your opponent unable to target two monsters you control with card effects. It also lets you protect two monsters you control from being destroyed by banishing the top card of your deck face down instead. Toon Kingdom was actually a very strong card for the time. It essentially made your whole field unable to be targeted or destroyed by card effects, a kind of protection which is decent even in today's metagame. This card let dedicated Toon strategies stop running the effectless Toon world, and while it didn't fix pretty much all the Toon monsters so far being effectless vanillas, it at least made them hard to remove. Some of the support was mediocre, like Toon Shadow and Toon Rollback being bad OTK enablers, or Toon Briefcase not being much better than a bottomless trap hole most of the time, but there were also some cards with powerful effects enough to match Toon Kingdom. Comic Hand is a snatch deal as long as you control Toon World. Mimikat can either steal a spell trap from your opponent's graveyard or be a monster reborn under similar conditions, and Toon Mass lets you special summon a Toon from your deck with a level equal to or lower than your opponent's monster. While these are all powerful effects on their own, it still didn't help form a cohesive strategy for the archetype. Mimikat and Comic Hand are the best of them because being potentially able to use a card from your opponent's deck is probably going to be better than any card or Toon deck would be running. Unfortunately, Konami also decided to make these cards unsearchable at the time, as they lacked Toon in their name. On the sets that followed this latest wave, a couple more members would be added to the strategy still. Red Eyes Toon Dragon came shortly after, with the same usual Toon restrictions and the ability to once per turn special summon any Toon monster from your hand, ignoring its summon conditions. Afterwards, there was Toon Dark Magician, which lets you discard one Toon card to either add a Toon Spell Trap from your deck to your hand, or special summon a Toon from your deck, ignoring its summoning conditions. Despite having received some cards which would turn any other archetype into a meta threat, Toons remained a strategy too weak to even be rogue. Toon Kingdom was a good card, especially since Terraform was still at 3 at this time, but you needed this card to stick around in your field for your strategy to be even slightly annoying. And around the same time, we had Mystical Space Typhoon being run at 3 of as a staple in almost every deck. Dark Magician Red Eyes had some pretty good effects, but they were still both level 7 monsters with no inherent special summon condition, and an archetype with no good way to get them out. Even with over 20 Toon cards being in the game now, the strategy still had almost nothing when it came to disruption or advantage generation. While there might have been some hope that future support could elevate Toons into a real strategy before, like it happened with the Blue Eyes and Harpies, it was entirely gone by now. At last, in the same year where Master Rule 4 Revisions dropped, Konami would drop the last wave of support for this archetype. This set, appropriately called Toon Chaos, even had Toon Blackluster Soldier as its cover card. 
Toon BLS is a level 8 Earth Warrior monster with 3000 attack. And it must first be special summoned by tributing Toon monsters from your hand or field whose total levels equals 8 or more. If you control Toon World, not only can it attack directly, but it also lets you target and banish a card in the field, but it cannot attack the turn it activates its effect. Blackluster Soldier Envoy of the Beginning, the card which this was based on, ravaged the metagame for many years and was even banned at some point. With all that said, it had long been phased away from the metagame by this time its Toon version dropped. While it finally gives the archetype a decent form of removal, as well as a good monster without summoning sickness, its ritual-like conditions means you will either need to cheat it out with other Toon support, or go heavily minus to bring it out from the hand. The other monster was Toon Harpy Lady. It has the usual Toon effects, but can special summon itself for free as long as you control Toon World, and then if you control another Toon monster, you can pop a card in the field. Despite being way too mediocre for 2020 standards, Toon Harpy Lady is still one of the better monsters of the archetype, if only due to being a free extender from the hand. It took almost 20 years, but the archetype finally got another one after Toon Mermaid way back then. For the spells, there's Toon Bookmark. This is the normal spell which lets you add either Toon World or any card that's specifically listed in its card text from your deck to your hand. Also, it can, more importantly, banish itself from the graveyard to protect Toon World you control from being destroyed. More consistency was always welcome, but its protection was great for an archetype that lives and dies by its field spell. Its search effect is only once per turn, unlike Toon Table of Contents, but it's a wider search pool since it checks for Toon World in the effects text, so it lets it be much more versatile in what is allowed to search out from the archetype. Then there's Toon Page Flip, a quick play spell which lets you, if you control Toon World, reveal three tunes of different names from your deck, then your opponent picks one of them to special summon at random, ignoring its summoning conditions, then the rest are shuffled back into the deck. It's a shame that the best starter and extender for the archetype is still giving you just a 1 in 3 chance of getting the monster you want on the field, but that's still much better than the archetype could hope for otherwise. At least with Toon BLS, there are actually three pretty good reveals for this card, even if you can't rely on getting anything specific out of it. And last, there's Toon Terror, a counter trap which can negate and destroy a spell, trap, or monster as long as you control both Toon World and a Toon Monster. A counter trap Omni Negate may have once been a telltale sign of a great archetype, but it's not nearly enough to carry a deck by itself during the modern era. A good interaction during your opponent's turn has been something Toon decks have missed since their inception, but not only is it worse than just many other archetypal counter traps, it's not even guaranteed to be on when you draw into it due to how inconsistent Toons are. With this being the last wave of support, this is how Toon monsters stand these days. Despite being a fan favorite strategy due to its anime relevance, it was never able to stand on its own as a standalone deck. Toon Cyber Dragon, the last other monster to see competitive play, hasn't been put into a competitive deck in multiple years now, and that's unlikely to change in the future due to the new master rule being a thing. Even with so many ways of support, Toons are still a much worse strategy than many other predominantly casual archetypes such as Dark Magicians. While Blackluster Soldier and Toon Terror did give some slightly threatening tools for them to use, it still wouldn't be enough to make them playable in 2015, and much less now. It still isn't the easiest thing in the world to field out Toon monsters, and even if it was, you still wouldn't be able to leverage all the bodies into an OTK due to their summoning sickness. The core design tendons of Toons are just at complete odds with how the modern game has developed, making sure they will never have a place in the metagame as long as they stick to them. Even in Duel Links, where their skills that put Toon World on the field for free, Toons have had much limited success as a full flood strategy, with this skill mostly seen play in spellcaster decks only using Toon Dark Magician Girl as an OTK enabler. With no more ways of support on the horizon, it is likely this decades old archetype with so many great artworks to its name will remain completely irrelevant until the end of time. It's hard to say what kind of tune support is needed for these cards to see any play now, as the deck fails to compete both as a control or OTK strategy. Be it through broken extra deck support or some crazy new Toon World retrain, it would take a lot to shape this aimless group of cards into an actual strategy. Flip monsters have been an important part of Yu-Gi-Oh's identity going as far back as the game's first set, The Legend of the Blue-Eyes White Dragon. In older formats, their effects were so powerful that they were placed in a lot of different strategies to the point where a ton of flip monsters were considered staples. However, in the modern era, it's fairly rare to see a deck play flip monsters anymore, which is why today we're going to discuss the glory days of flip monsters, their fall from grace, and how their role has changed in the modern game. So, what actually is a flip monster? A flip monster is a specific subtype of monster that has an effect that's highlighted by the keyword flip. The word flip usually means that a particular effect will trigger whenever the card is flipped face up by any means, whether that's being flip summoned, flipped up by battle, or being flipped up by a card effect. Now, there are exceptions to this rule. There's a few flip monsters that don't have trigger effects when they're flipped face up, and instead will only apply a continuous effect like Aroma Jar or Desex Crawler. But these monsters are still treated as flip monsters regardless. Likewise, there are also a ton of monsters that do have trigger effects when they're flip face up, like Girgi Armor and Snowman Eater. These cards might be mechanically some flip monsters, 
but they aren't actually treated as flip monsters themselves. As a result, there's no hard and fast rule for what a flip monster can actually be, with the only real consistent theming being that you'll usually need to flip a monster face up to get access to its effects. In the modern era, however, this is usually a huge downside. The general idea of flip monsters is rooted in how classic Yu-Gi-Oh! used to play out. Instead of summoning out a strong beat stick, you could instead use your single normal summon turn to set a monster with a powerful flip effect that could turn the tides of the duel on a later turn. Because in older Yu-Gi-Oh!, these flip effects were generically powerful, and would act as some of the game's strongest removal and follow-up options available to you at the time. So if your opponent didn't remove them from the field by a card effect, they'd be punished by a potentially game-winning effect when it got to your turn, or when they ran over your set monster by battle. This strength was compounded by the fact that in older formats, removal options were a lot more limited than they are today. And in a lot of cases, your opponent would have no choice but to trigger your flip effects if they wanted to remove your monsters from the field. Counterplay still existed for flip monsters, but in older formats, if you set a monster, there was a strong chance of you being able to use your flip effects to win free advantage in tempo. However, while all of this was true in classic Yu-Gi-Oh!, flip monsters are usually terrible in a more modern context. And the main reason why is unfortunately because of how flip monsters usually function. In modern Yu-Gi-Oh!, most of the game's strongest playmakers usually have effects that provide you with an immediate advantage in some way. Whether that's with Axe's Code's pop effect to wipe your opponent's field, or Alubra's effect to add branded fusion from your deck to your hand, a lot of modern cards are designed for a faster game, so are just as fast, and usually provide you with an effect that you can use instantly. And that's where the problem with flip monsters begins, because on their own, flip monsters don't provide you with any kind of usable advantage on your first turn. So, you have to rely on other cards that let you flip your monsters face up as soon as possible, or just hope your opponent doesn't have any removal or negate options to deal with your set monsters before the battle phase. But this game plan is wholly unreliable, because removal options have become a lot more common and easier to access, especially because of the number of powerful tools that exist in most players' extra decks. As a result, most decks that could play flip monsters usually default to playing cards which are immediately playable instead, in order to keep up with the current speed of the game. This meant that a lot of classic flip monsters that were almost overpowered in old Yu-Gi-Oh!, now, very rarely see play in current competitive decks because of how slow and clunky they are when compared to more modern effect monsters. But the mechanic as a whole isn't entirely dead, and there have been a number of attempts to reinvent and redefine what it means to be a flip monster. A lot of these attempts have resulted in more failures, but some have resulted in some of the strongest flip monsters in the game's history. Let's start off by looking over three classic flip monsters that saw a ton of competitive play in older formats that had fallen off in terms of playability. Magician of Faith, Raikou, Lightsword Hunter, and Gravekeeper's Spy. Magician of Faith is a light spellcaster monster with pretty meager stats. But if it's flipped face up, you get to target any spell card in your graveyard and add it to your hand. The effect is simple, and is representative of the design of a ton of other flip monsters that saw play in older formats, like Dekoichi and Magical Merchant. The idea behind these cards was that they all provided you with a plus one in terms of card advantage, effectively replacing themselves with another card whenever they're flipped face up. What drove Magician of Faith over the top and made it so ban-worthy was the power level of the spell cards that were available in older Yu-Gi-Oh! You see, while classic Yu-Gi-Oh! is definitely a lot slower than the modern game, spell cards were even more insane back then than they are today, with the trinity of Graceful Charity, Deliquent Duo, and Pot of Greed all being legal. And because these cards were so generically powerful, just about every deck would play them. Magician of Faith made it so that you could recycle and reuse some of the strongest spell cards in the game, and provided you with devastatingly strong follow-up allowing you to reuse already game-winning unfair cards like Graceful Charity several times in a duel, which is why it was featured in so many different strategies because if you were going to play these absurdly strong spell cards anyway, it just made sense to play a card that lets you use them again multiple times. On the opposite end of the spectrum were foot monsters that act as removal options for your opponent's cards, like Knight Assailant and Armed Ninja. But by far, the strongest of these kinds of foot monsters was Raikou Lightsworn Hunter, because whenever Raikou was flipped face up, you had to send the top three cards of your deck to the graveyard, and you got a chance to destroy any card in the field. Both of these effects were benefits of the cards. Raikou's meal made it so you could end up triggering a beneficial graveyard effect like a Shadow or Dandelion, but most of Raikou's strength came from it being able to pop any card in the field. In older formats, removal options as a whole were generally less common, so monsters that can act as removal were already fairly strong. And most removal options were usually specific to a particular type of card. Raigeki is only going to be able to pop monsters, and Heavy Storm is only ever going to be able to deal with back row. But cards that could do both were somewhat uncommon and incredibly valuable, because it meant that with Raikou, every deck had a staple option that was capable of either taking down an opponent's boss monster that they overextended into, or it could be used to deal with an opponent's oppressive floodgate, which gave Raikou a ton of versatility as a pop. And last but not least is Gravekeeper Spy, a flip monster that can act as a swarming tool. Because whenever Gravekeeper Spy is flip face up, you can special summon out another Gravekeeper monster from your deck with 1500 or less attack. And this includes another copy of itself, since Spy only has 1200 attack. 
So while Gravekeeper Spy was strong in Gravekeepers as an archetypal tool, the main reason it saw competitive play was that a ton of different strategies would use it as a way to swarm and bring free bodies to the field as quickly as possible. This made Spy a really strong staple that had a ton of versatility, since it could be used as a defensive wall, an offensive threat, or even as material for an even stronger monster. And how Spy was used would change in every different Yu-Gi-Oh generation. In early Yu-Gi-Oh, Spy was a solid advantage generator that also guaranteed you free tribute fodder for a monarch monster. During Teledad format, Spy also gave you a free body that you could use as synchro material, and a dark attribute also made it so it was a lot easier to tear out Dark Arm Dragon. And in early Zexlo formats, Spy was even a solid rank 4 generator. Essentially, swarming as a concept has always been a valuable thing in Yu-Gi-Oh! And Spy was one of the only reliable means of actually flooding the fields in older formats, before we had access to more archetypal tools. In the modern era, the concepts that Magician of Faith, Raiko, and Spy will represent are still really important ideas, potentially even more so than back then. But despite how good these cards are conceptually, they never see any play in the current competitive format. This is because every one of these three monsters has the inherent downside of being a flip monster, which makes them far too slow and clunky for how fast the game has gotten. And with the constant evolution of the game's card pool throughout the years, there are now just better cards which do what these three cards try to do, but better. There's no point in waiting a turn for Gravekeeper Spy when Buzzsaw Shark can give you an instant rank 4 instead. And why would you wait to flip your Raikou face up with Book of Taiyu for one pop when you have Lightning Storm and Evenly Match to wipe your opponent's entire field? And why would you need Magician of Faith for follow-up when most archetypes already have strong archetypal tools that allow them to access their best spell cards anyway? These options are just stronger, better, and faster than most utility-based flip monsters in the game. And because of how vulnerable and slow flip monsters are, there's just never any reason to go out of your way to use them. In fact, there are even more modern variations of Magician of Faith, Gravekeeper Spy, and Raikou that all don't see any competitive play, because being a flip monster is just inherently a downside to the card, especially when compared to regular on summon trigger effects. But even though flip monsters don't see any more generic play, they haven't been power corrupt out of the game entirely. It's just that their role in the game has changed. Instead of being the powerful staples they once were, the flip monsters that usually see the most amount of competitive play are ones that are centered to a particular archetype, with the most iconic being Shadows. The Shadow monsters are an archetype of flip monsters that use their incredibly strong spell and trap card lineup to access their powerful fusion boss monsters. But unlike most other flip monsters, the Shadow monsters have effects whenever they're sent to the graveyard by a card effect in a similar way to a card like Night Assailant. This actually solves one of the key issues that flip monsters have. Most of the time, your opponent can just remove them from the field before you have an opportunity to flip them face up, leaving you with nothing. However, the Shadow Monsters don't have this weakness, because whenever your opponent tries to pop your set Shadow Monster, you get the chance to punish them by triggering your Shadow Monster's graveyard effects. So if your opponent tried to remove your face down Shadow Beast to stop you from drawing, you still get to draw a card when it's sent. Or if your opponent tried to stop you from using the bounce effect of Shadow Dragon, you still get to pop a spell or trap card they control. But that was just the worst case scenario, because with their strong trap based support cards, you could easily flip up your Shadow Monsters on your opponent's turn to get access to their powerful flip effects, like Hedgehog's Surge or Squamata's Pop. These factors combined made it so that Shadows, a deck comprised almost entirely of flip monsters, was capable of dominating early pendulum formats, and could contend against the likes of Cleefort and Burning Abyss. And even to this day, the strategy still remains evergreen as more modern strategies like Invoked and Tulaments will often choose to incorporate Shadow cards into their arsenal. However, while Shadows made these flip effects playable, they were never the main reason to actually play the strategy. Because even back in 2014, the best cards in the deck were never the flip effects themselves. Most of the deck's power was concentrated in their fusion spells and fusion monsters. El Shadow Construct and Shadow Fusion were such big threats that in 2014, it was actually a detriment to have a monster summoned from the extra deck as part of your end board. As it meant that if your opponent had a Shadow Fusion, they got to summon a free construct and send any Shadow monster from the deck to the graveyard, allowing them to trigger whatever Shadow graveyard effect they wanted and drown an advantage. Similarly, in 2023, the Shadow monsters don't see play because they're flip monsters, they see play because they're a necessary requirement for summoning out El Shadow Winda. And as a result, the Shadow Flip monsters that see the most amount of competitive success aren't those with the best flip effects. It's those with the most beneficial graveyard effects that gain you some advantage if you happen to mill them or use them as material. Which makes it so that, for most strategies, the Shadow Flip monsters are bricks. So in reality, while Shadow monsters had their time in the competitive metagame, they're more of an example of the success of fusion summoning and floating effects rather than being an example of successful flip effects. Still, they're a notable part of the game's history, and whatever you attribute the deck's success to, the deck is still mainly composed of flip monsters that manage to see a lot of competitive play. However, there are still some strategies out there that have managed to see modern competitive success while specifically relying on their flip effects. Guru Control is one such deck that's reliant on a specific flip monster, Subterra Guru. Guru has two hard ones per turn effects. Its flip effect lets you add any Subterra card, except Guru, from your deck to your hand. 
And while it's face up, you can target another monster in the field and flip both Guru and that target monster to face down defense position, with this being a quick effect if you control any other sub terror card. With Guru, you have a lot of interesting search targets, with your two strongest options being sub terror final battle, an archetypal trap card with a variety of beneficial effects, or sub terror fiendness, an omni negate while you control face up sub terror monster. This forms a really compact but powerful engine that, when used with other strong control tools such as floodgates, manages to form a really competent and meta viable strategy that relies on a flip monster as a win condition. And the best part is, unlike most other flip monsters, you have an opportunity to use Guru's flip effect on your very first turn. You see, when you activate Hidden City, the archetypal field spell for Subterror, you can add any Subterror monster from your deck to your hand. If you choose to add a Guru, you can then set that Guru to your field and then use the on-field effect of Hidden City to flip it face up so you can trigger its search effect. And even in hands where you don't draw Hidden City, you can rely on your Floodgates to slow the game down enough to the point where Guru's effect is virtually guaranteed to be useful. Now, if Hidden City didn't exist at all, Guru would be a lot less strong of a card since, like most flip monsters, it's not immediately useful by itself and would likely have seen way less competitive play. But because of the archetypal tools that exist around it, it's been elevated to meta viability that makes it a fairly unique game plan. Guru being a flip monster is actually even advantageous for the strategy, as it makes us you can easily play under your own floodgates. And you can even use the effect of Red Eyes Fusion while still going through your full combo, since you never normal summon with a deck and only set. As a result, Guru is always on the fringe of meta contention. Never quite being one of the best strategies you can play, but it's always a solid anti-meta strategy. And a huge part of that is because of how its archetypal tools make it immediately usable, and provide it with solid payoffs that can actually be used to win games rather than just generic card advantage. In terms of meta viable flip monsters though, there really aren't that many, with the Shadows and Guru being the only real exceptions for modern Yu-Gi-Oh. Monsters are just inherently worse if you have to flip them face up, rather than being normal or special summoned, no matter how strong their effects may be, because in order to get access to these effects, you have to go through extra hurdles to actually flip them face up, which usually requires other cards or resources. Some flip monsters even have insanely powerful effects that are capable of shutting down your opponent completely, like Death's X Crawler, a one-sided skill drain, and Guard Dog, which locks your opponent out of special summoning entirely. But there's no reason to ever use these cards when you can instead rely on easier-to-use floodgates to do similar things. However, there are ways of making flip monsters more viable, as flip-based mechanics and monsters do occasionally have their place in the meta, and a lot of that has to do with the card quality that exists around these monsters. Even right now, one of the strongest rogue decks of the current format is Ninja, a deck that doesn't play any flip monsters, but relies on setting and flipping up their own monsters to generate advantage and disrupt your opponent. And a lot of that strength has to do with the strength of the archetypal cards that exist around the ninja monsters, which allow them to easily swarm the field and flip themselves face up to activate their effects more often. Unfortunately, however, even though ninja monsters use flipping to win games, most of the ninjas aren't actually flip monsters. And this is a huge benefit for the deck, as it means their effects don't just trigger when they're flipped face up, they can also trigger on the normal or special summon. This allows the deck to reach a much faster pace that can keep with the likes of Kashtira and Branded that it wouldn't otherwise have if it was a deck based entirely around flip monsters that could only use these effects when flip face up. Good flip monsters do still exist though, and despite how fast the game has gotten, there are still three flip monsters in the Forbidden and Limited list. And these are Morphine Jar, Cyber Jar, and Fiber Jar. However, Fiber Jar is only banned because it creates long and tedious game states that can hold up an event, making it similar to Self-Destruct Button rather than an actual ban-worthy threat. Morphine and Cyber Jar were extremely strong staples back when they were first released, since they could both be used to instantly refill your hand or field whenever they flip face up, making them really great follow-up and swarming tools. So strong, in fact, they even became the centerpiece of their own FDK-centric strategy, Empty Jar, a deck based around milling out your opponent as quickly as possible by abusing non-once-per-turn flip effects of the Jar cards. You could even play the strategy of this day thanks to cards like Gallant Granite and A&D Changer, although, like most flip-based strategies, it's no longer an actual meta threat. As a whole though, it's really unfortunate how far flip monsters have managed to fall from grace. They were once powerhouses of early Yu-Gi-Oh that were integral to the game's early identity, and provided a ton of different strategies with advantage, swarming, and removal tools that you wouldn't otherwise have. But Yu-Gi-Oh has moved on a lot since its early days and has morphed into a much faster game with an environment that's almost inhospitable to most flip monsters. In almost every situation, you'd want a card that you could immediately use to combo or try to control the game, rather than a flip monster that you either need to wait to use or that you need other cards to use on your first turn. So because of the lack of support and their clunky nature, it's pretty fair to call flip monsters failed cards. It's usually only a detriment to be a flip monster in the modern era that need to be flip face up unlike something like a ninja monster where there's a lot more flexibility in how their effects are triggered. There are examples of successful flip-based strategies that appear in the metagame that you can call successful. 
Shadal is still a competent threat, and Guru has even taught recent YCSs. So if you define a successful mechanic as one that has seen competitive play, then no, flip monsters aren't a failed mechanic. But if you think about how difficult the mechanic is to use, its lack of support, and how few flip monsters even actually see competitive play, it's definitely more of a failed mechanic than a successful one. So, how could they be improved? The mechanic isn't completely dead though, and there are a number of ways that flip monsters could be improved to see more widespread play. There are a number of different solutions that you can take from other flip decks that have seen success. Future flip monsters could benefit from having alternative effects like the shadow monsters, or could instead have more archetypal cards designed around allowing them to be used instantly like how Hidden City makes Guru playable. The mechanic could even be revamped entirely, it made to play in a similar way to modern ninjas by allowing their effects to also be used on the normal or special summon. However, what the mechanic needs more than anything else is more generic support. Some of the weakest subtypes in the game, such as normal monsters, have been made competitively viable thanks to support that exists around them. If flip monsters received similar such support, then there's a solid chance that even in the state they're in right now, flip monsters could become a viable threat. But as it stands right now, it's unlikely they'll ever reach the stable status that they once had. In the set Labyrinth of Nightmare, they introduce three cards which have the effects that allow the card to attribute themselves in order to recover a monster or spell card from the graveyard. In particular, Lady Panther and the Forgiving Maiden have effects where you can tribute them in order to add back a monster from your graveyard to your hand, which was destroyed by battle this turn. Now, these cards are actually kind of terrible, because we only get one normal summon per turn, and generally you don't enter the battle phase with an expectation that your monsters are going to die by battle. So you wouldn't have the resources to have this card laid on the field to recover one by mistake. And also, you're not really going to lose monsters during your battle phase by mistake. If these effects were quick effects that can be activated during your opponent's turn, then maybe they would make some sense. But with the game mechanics of Yu-Gi-Oh, they are just complete garbage. However, I think I might know why these cards exist the way they do. You see, in Magic the Gathering, which Yu-Gi-Oh was originally just a copy of in its early days, there is no limit on how many creatures you can summon in one turn. In addition to that, the way the battle phase works is just inherently different as well. When you declare an attack in Magic, your opponent gets to choose the targets of your attacks not the player who declares the attack. So declaring an attack in magic is very dangerous, and often results in your creatures dying unintentionally if your opponent has any creatures on their side of the board. So if Lady Panther and the Forgiving Maiden existed in Magic the Gathering, then their effects would make a lot more sense, because magic also has a main phase too. So during the battle phase, when you attack with a bunch of your monsters and one of them unintentionally dies because your opponent makes an unfavorable block or uses a battle trick to save one of their monsters, then, during the main phase 2, you'd be able to use these cards to get those monsters back, and then you could just summon them again. And Yu-Gi-Oh! was basically still an MTG clone in the early days of its history. So, in Yu-Gi-Oh!, where you get to choose the targets of your attacks, your monsters are not unintentionally dying, unless your opponent happens to use the battle trick themselves. Battle tricks were pretty prevalent in early Yu-Gi-Oh!, so this wasn't the most out there thing to expect. But there's still also the resource cost of actually getting these cards on the field, and the fact that you only get to bring them back to your hand, so you have to use even more resources to get them out of your hand and back onto the field. The cards just don't really work with how Yu-Gi-Oh! functions, without them being a special summon themselves from your hand, or being usable on your opponent's turn. And Fairy Guardian is even worse, since it tributes itself to only return a spell card that was destroyed this turn, and only returns it to your deck instead of back to your hand. In today's video, we'll cover the Metaphys archetype that appeared in the Yu-Gi-Oh! TCG set Duelist Alliance. Their first debut card ever was a level 7 vanilla Metaphys Armed Dragon, a 2700 attack slash 1800 defense light attribute worm monster. Either than aesthetics and name, this card wouldn't carry any relevance in the archetype, and would sit amongst stacks of bulk cards. So, with no sight of this card seeing any action, it was written off as just a pack filler. Then, the next set, Secrets of Eternity, would reveal another Metaphys card, Metaphys Horus a level 6 synchro monster that had the effects that activate on summon based on what types of monsters were used for its synchro materials. If a normal monster is used, it is unaffected by other card effects. If effect monsters, target one other face of card in the field and negate its effects. And if you used a pendulum monster, your opponent chose a monster on the side of the field and you gain control of it. This card saw a bit of play being a generic synchro monster with a simple requirement, but it had no synergy with Metaphys Arm Dragon. However, it did give the community a sign that maybe more Metaphys monsters were to come. We just didn't know it would take almost four years later. With the release of Circuit Breaker in 2017, we were introduced to the first wave of the Metaphys archetype. With eight new Metaphys cards, Metaphys Dedulus, Metaphys Neftis, and Metaphys Tyrant Dragon, all had the same clause of getting effects off when their special summoned by Metaphys monsters effect, and have additional effects if they're banished during the next standby phase. 
Metaphys Dedulous banishes all other face-up special summon monsters on the field if it's special summoned by Metaphys Monster. And if it's banished, during the standby phase of the next turn, you return it to the deck to banish another Metaphys card from your deck. Metaphys Nephthys Effects lets him banish set spells and trap cards when it's special summoned, and when banished during the next standby phase, return it to the deck to add a Metaphys card from your deck to your hand. Finally, Metaphys Tyrant Dragon is unaffected by trap cards if special summoned by Metaphys Monster. And if attacking, it can attack once again in a row. And if banished, during the next standby phase, return to the deck to special summon a Metaphys monster from your hand. Metaphys even had its engine starter in Metaphys Ragnarok, a level 4 light attribute worm type when normal or special summoned lets you banish the top 3 cards of your deck. And for every Metaphys monster banished by this effect, it gained 300 attack. It even special summons a Metaphys monster when it inflicts battle damage. Metaphys Executor was the boss monster, needing you to banish 5 Metaphys cards in the field or graveyard to special summon it. It had a whopping 3000 attack, couldn't be destroyed or targeted by card effects, and allowed you to special summon a Metaphys monster if your opponent had more cards than you once per turn. As cool as these effects are, you can already see the major problem with these cards. The card effects were just too passive. As cool as an archetype the Metaphys were, having to wait till your next standby phase to activate effects limited your plays only to the standby phase leaving you with no way to interact with your opponent for the rest of their turn. Even if you were able to use effects like Metaphys Dedulous' effects to banish their monsters, you have no ways of stopping them from establishing a new board. The archetype was also unfortunate to only have one engine starter in their first wave of monsters with Metaphys Ragnarok. This meant negates, like a well-timed effect veiler, would most likely end your turn as it was crucial for this card to activate. Also, it needed to inflict battle damage to let you special summon a monster which means opponents would snuff it out before even entering the battle phase. This deck relied heavily on seeing this card or else it would stall. To make things even more discouraging, Metaphys Executor's summoning conditions were abysmal, as it requires you to banish 5 Metaphys cards in the field or in the graveyard, making it costly to summon. These requirements made it unfulfilling to bring out a card that would only benefit if you had fewer cards than your opponent, and literally did nothing else than be a big beat stick. Executor was a poor boss monster that was more of a setback than an actual support. Konami tried to offload the pressure by making a few spells and traps to help. Metaphys Factor was a field spell card that lets you play a level 5 or heart Metaphys monster, but banished it during the next end phase. It also prevented your opponent from responding to your Metaphys monster's activated cards or effects. While this helped unclog your hand from bricking and guaranteed your effects wouldn't be stopped, it still ate up your normal summon. With literally no monsters capable of being special summoned outside of Metaphys Executor, Metaphys Ragnarok, and the effects of Metaphys Tyrant Dragon, your turn is essentially over as your options to play first turn at this time in Metaphys lifespan were slim to nothing. Ace of Metaphys was a continuous spell that lets you banish a Metaphys card to draw one. If Metaphys card in its owner's possession was banished, you would either apply an effect that made non-Metaphys monsters lose 500 attack and defense if it was your turn, or change the battle position of all non-Metaphys monsters if it was your opponent's turn. This card was one of the best cards in the deck. It helps you banish your Metaphys cards, and it wasn't a hard once per turn. Unfortunately, its other secondary effects were mandatory so you wouldn't have the option of when you wanted to activate them. Lastly, Metaphys Dimension was a continuous trap card that allowed you to special summon a Metaphys monster that was banished to your side of the field, but banish it during the next end phase. And if a Metaphys card is banished in its owner's possession while this card is phased up on the field, you can target one card in the field and banish it. This card wasn't bad, but it wasn't anything to write home about either. Being able to special summon any Metaphys monster back from being banished is nice, but it doesn't activate Metaphys trigger effects as they weren't summoned by a Metaphys monster. The only banishing these cards did was banish players from playing this archetype, as many considered it a casual deck. It would be two more sets until they got more support in Cybernetic Horizon in the form of the trap card Metaphys Ascension, and a Pendulum monster in Metaphys Decoy Dragon. Metaphys Ascension lets you discard a Metaphys card to draw a card and banish a Metaphys monster from your deck. And if this card is banished, add a Metaphys card to your hand. Metaphys Decoy Dragon is a level 2 Metaphys Pendulum monster whose pendulum effect lets you target a Metaphys monster that is banished or in your graveyard when your monster is targeted for an attack and banish this card and special summon the target Metaphys monster. Its monster effect was also the same as the pendulum effect and with the added clause a special summon itself if it's banished during the next standby phase. These cards had everything needed to make Metaphys relevant. More ways to special summon Metaphys cards and easy ways to get them banished. Yet, once again, the cards were hindered due to their conditions. As good as Metaphys Ascension was, it was a hard once per turn, meaning you could only activate its effect once and only once. Having multiple copies of this card banished reaped no reward and made the card a waste. As for Metaphys Decoy Dragon, the ability to special summon Metaphys monsters that are banished from the graveyard was amazing, as Metaphys monsters needed to be special summoned by another Metaphys monster to use their triggered effects. However, the condition to make it work was terrible. In a game where card removal is more prominent than ever, it was easy to get around monsters besides attacking them, 
leaving this card to be nothing more than material for Metaphys Horus, another level 6 generic synchro or link material. Outside of being an easy summon and an attack, well, decoy, this card ended up being rather useless. Metaphys didn't improve at all with these new additions, as by now, the deck was power crept and couldn't keep up. The meta in 2018 was overrun by decks that had way better consistency, like Sky Striker, Goki, and Altergeist, who had better win conditions and styles of play. However, with the deck built around cards at Banish, players were incorporating staple cards that revolved around Banish cards, like Necroface, Aloof Lupine, Gold Sarcophagus, Dimension Shifter, Dimensional Fissure, and Macrocosmos were heavily played in almost every build of this deck. Dimension Shifter was a fantastic card to put into Metaphys, as the card doubled as both a Floodgate and a great first turn option to use. By sending it to the graveyard, any cards sent to the graveyard were banished instead. This helps slow the game down for Metaphys, as your opponent's forced to play around it, while you can successfully banish your Metaphys cards. Dimension Shifter was probably the best card out of all the other banishing options at the time, as Yu-Gi-Oh was cracking down on Floodgates used for banishing. Cards like Dimensional Fissure and Macrocosmos were limited to 1, as both had continuous effects that banished cards instead of sending them to the graveyard. Necroface was at 2, and Gold Sarcophagus started off at 3 during the release of Metaphys, but was limited to 1 in January 1st of 2019. It became clear that this deck just couldn't run on its own support. This led to the Yu-Gi-Oh! community finding other ways to incorporate better engines to make the deck playable. People would start to combine the archetypes with the Nemesis archetype, introducing the TCG set Eternity Code. The archetype had the ability to special summon themselves by targeting one monster that was banished, special summon themselves, and return the banished card to the deck. Each Nemesis monster also had secondary effects that they could use once per turn. Nemesis Flag added Nemesis cards from your deck to your hand during the main phase. Nemesis Corridor lets you target one banished Nemesis card and add it back to your hand. Nemesis Umbrella added a Nemesis card from your graveyard to your hand. And finally, Nemesis Keystone, who joins the group in the next set, Rise of the Duelist, lets you add it back to your hand if it was banished in the same turn during the end phase. The Nemesis cards also had Boss Monsters and Arch Nemesis Protoss and Arch Nemesis Eschatos. Both had easy summoning conditions due to their requirements, with Arch Nemesis Protoss needing you to banish three monsters with different attributes to special summon it from the hand while Arch Nemesis Eschatos needed three monsters with different types. All these requirements were easy to meet because Nemesis cards all had different types and attributes. They also couldn't be destroyed by card effects, and Protoss had an effect that lets you declare an attribute to destroy all monsters sharing that attribute, and then prevented all players from spelling so many monsters with that same attribute. And Arch Nemesis Eschatos did the same but with types. Add in the fact that you could use your Metaphys monsters for the Arch Nemesis requirements, and you have an effective way to get your Metaphys monster effects off, and a way to recycle your monsters. The capability to play multiple boss monsters, a great banished engine, were all within the palms of Metaphys's hands. Sadly, Arch Nemesis Protoss would see its unfortunate ending, as it was placed on the February 2022 ban list. Players would try attacking cards like Left Arm Offering, a normal spell card from the Millennium Pack. If you had two or more cards in your hand, you could banish your entire hand. Then you can add one spell card from your deck to your hand, but you couldn't set any spells or trap cards in the turn you activated this card, but that didn't really hinder the deck. The deck only had a limited set of spells or traps they set, with most of the cards being continuous spells like Metaphys Factor and Asa Metaphys. There was also Summoning Curse from Duelist Revolution. This continuous spell had the effect that stated, if a monster is special summoned, the current controller banishes one card from their hand. Also, it required you to pay 500 life points during your end phase for its maintenance costs. This card would prove to be a great addition to the deck, as it punishes your opponent for special summoning and rewards you for successful special summoning monsters by allowing you to plus off your plays and banish your Metaphys monsters. However, the meta of the time was too strong and fast, and Metaphys couldn't keep up with the format. Their effects were simply not quick enough for the likes of Emancipator and Eldritch, as those were decks that could push through multiple negates, play through hand traps and negations, and could splash multiple card engines in their decks given the variety of ways to be built. Gone were the simple days of Metaphys Dedulous being impactful in the game. By the time it would be summoned to the field, it was negated by the plethora of options your opponent had at the time to destroy it. The deck still suffered from the need of having a normal summon. As bleak as Metaphys time was, they had a solid run in the Master Duel format where they've seen some relative success. They are a great complementary engine in Sword Soul since they share the Worm attribute, and your Metaphys can be used as materials for Sword Soul synchros that banish Worm-type monsters for their effects, like Sword Soul Supreme Sovereign Changing and Sword Soul Supreme Sovereign Chizou. They also saw some success in the Nemesis package, as Dimensional Fissure, Necroface, and Macrocosmos were all at 3. Master Duel also had Thunder Dragon Colossus playable at 1 copy, allowing you to combo it off with Nemesis Corridor, who was a Thunder-type monster that Special Summon's condition activated from your hand. This allowed you to Special Summon Thunder Dragon Colossus, as one of the ways you can summon it from your extra deck was by tributing a non-fusion Thunder-type monster on your turn when a Thunder-type monster's effect was activated from the hand. Metaphys now had access to a strong Floodgate monster that prevented your opponent from adding cards from their main deck to their hand except by drawing them. Another card that also saw play from Metaphys was Crossout Designator. 
Prasa Designator was a quick play spell card that allowed you to declare a card name, banish one card with a declared name, and for the rest of the turn, negate that card's effects and the activations of cards with the same original name until the end of the turn. So why was this play with Metaphys? Because it allowed you to set up your Metaphys plays for the next standby phase, making it a free banish. It was also impactful against your opponent's hand traps as you could simply banish a generally ran hand trap such as Ash Blossom or Cyframe Gamma, banish it with Cross Out Designator, and then continue your plays without being interrupted. Metaphys slowly climbed the Master Duel format with these options at hand. With how much slower the game is in the Master Duel format, and the ability to have almost every Floodgate that can banish at 3, Metaphys finally found its place in the Yu-Gi-Oh world. Metaphys has since then quietly settled down as a wonderful option to pick up at Master Duel, and is currently still seen play as of today. So, let's recap why Metaphys failed. One reason was their mechanic only worked in the standby phase and barely had any interaction outside of it. This made their playstyle linear and very easy for your opponent to operate around. Metaphys is an example of a deck that is hampered by poor support and an awkward, outdated style of play. It didn't have the power to stop you from getting OTK'd, nor did it have any strong way of controlling the board. Having to wait until the next standby phase to activate effects, having to inflict battle damage to special summon monsters, or having to wait for your card to get targeted for an attack aren't effects able to last in the current state of the game. Sure, they had engines to combine with like Sword Soul and Nemesis, but it didn't cover the fact that the archetype was subpar by the time the support was received. Without other archetypes being splashed in it, this deck would only be able to crank out one summon per turn. The boss monster never saw play, and the spawn trap cards don't make up for any deficiencies the deck has. Only time will tell if our Konami overlords seed to make more support for this intriguing archetype. As for now, it'll be recognized as one of Yu-Gi-Oh's many failed cards and mechanics. If any archetype has gone through constant pain of having potential but not quite being good, then Red Eyes has taken first place. Being a fan favorite since its debut in the Yu-Gi-Oh! TCG set Legend of Blue Eyes White Dragon, and being the ace monster of Joey Wheeler in the Yu-Gi-Oh! animated series, Red Eyes Black Dragon was rewarded with its own archetype. Even though certain cards involved Red Eyes Black Dragon before the set's release, like Red Eyes Black Chick, Inferno Fire Blast, Red Eyes Wavering, and Red Eyes Darkness Metal Dragon, none of these cards were helpful to the 2400 attack Dark Dragon. The only cards that consistently saw play were Red Eyes Darkness Metal Dragon and Red Eyes Wavering due to Red Eyes Darkness Metal Dragon's ability to special summon any dragon from the Hand on Graveyard, and Red Eye Wavering's ability to banish itself to special summon Red Eyes Darkness Metal Dragon if it was in the graveyard. However, the first wave of support of Recede was supposed to rectify Red Eyes' problems, and didn't quite do that. So today, we'll take a look at the Red Eyes archetype and why it failed in the Yu-Gi-Oh! TCG. The first group of Red Eyes support was shown in the Yu-Gi-Oh! TCG set, Dragon of Legends 2, with 7 new cards. The first was Red Eyes Black Dragon Sword, a level 7 fusion monster. Even though it's stated to be a Red Eyes monster, this card was more of a novelty as it required Claw of Hermos to special summon it. It was irrelevant to the archetype outside of being seen in the anime series. Unlike Black Dragon Sword, the other cards did see some testing if not played. Four of these cards were ritual cards. Lord of Red was a level 8 Dark Dragon ritual monster. It could be ritual summoned through Red Eyes Transmigration, had 2000 attack, and once per turn allowed you to target and pop a monster in the field if a monster effect was activated except for itself, and pop or spell a trap once per turn if a spell a trap card was activated. Its ritual spell, Red Eyes Transmigration, requires you to tribute monsters who combines levels equals 8 or higher to summon it out. The next ritual monster was Paladin the Dark Dragon, a level 4 Dark Dragon ritual monster with all the same effects as Paladin of White Dragon. It could destroy a defense position monster during the damage step. However, unlike Paladin of White Dragon, this card allowed you to tribute to summon any Red Eyes monster from your hand or deck, not just Red Eyes Black Dragon. Such cards like Red Eyes Darkness Metal Dragon or Red Eyes Wavering could also be sewn off this card's effect, leading to a wider variety of plays. Dark Dragon Ritual was also similar to Paladin of White Dragon's ritual spell, White Dragon Ritual, except you ritual summon Paladin of Dark Dragon, and get the bonus of being able to banish it from the graveyard to get a Red Eyes Spell or Trap card from your deck, except during the turn it was sent to the graveyard. This first wave of monster support was very unique. The ritual monsters all had decent and powerful effects. Unfortunately, the deck lacked ways to search for Lord of Red. As cards like Preparation of Rites were the best way to get to level 7 or lower ritual monsters, but couldn't get Lord of Red who was level 8. Advanced Ritual Art was an option to play since Red Eyes Black Dragon wasn't a real monster, but you'd have to play a level 1 monster, which made the deck more inconsistent and bricky. To further make it more awkward to play Lord of the Red, None of them had Red Eyes in their name, which made them see less play with more Red Eyes support needing cards with Red Eyes specifically in their name. Paladin of Dark Dragon also went through the same issues as it didn't have Red Eyes in its name. It also didn't have many cards to search for since the only cards in Red Eyes that saw play was the original Red Eyes Black Dragon, Red Eyes Wavering, and Red Eyes Darkness Metal Dragon. The next set phased out these cards and they became binder food for the rest of the Yu-Gi-Oh careers. Dragon of Legends 2 also gave two new traps for the archetype. Red Eyes Spirit was a normal trap that could special summon a Red Eyes monster from your graveyard. 
Red Eyes Burn allows you to target one Red Eyes monster destroyed by battle or card effects and inflict damage to both you and your opponent's life points equal to the monster's original attack. Both cards were underwhelming as support, as Red Eyes Burn required your monster to be destroyed as a condition to activate it. It was even more off-putting to run as it damaged your life points, making it risky if your life points were lower than your opponent's. Red Eyes Spirit saw some plays of one-off at the time because it was a free revival for your monsters with no restrictions. However, it being a trap card and having to wait a turn to revive a monster made many consider the card too slow. But funny enough, the card was released early on in Yu-Gi-Oh! Duel Links and was actually hit on their ban list, specifically because there just wasn't easy ways to cheat out monsters with over 2,000 attack yet. In the TCG, better options would be available to Red Eyes that would trump playing the card later along the line. To say the first line of support didn't do well was an understatement. The monster's support was hindered by being ritual-based, not having Red Eyes in their name, and having no new Red Eyes monsters outside of Red Eyes Black Dragon Sword. Even with new support on its way, the support from Dragon Legends 2 didn't have any impact on the archetype, and was seen more as casual support for people who just liked to play it for fun. It wouldn't be until the next set, Clash of Rebellions, that Red Eyes would get new support and six new monsters, two new spells, and one new trap card, with two of them being Gemini monsters. Red Eyes Black Flare Dragon is a level 7 Dark Dragon Gemini, who on normal summon gains the effect that if damage calculation performed with this card, at the end of the battle phase, you can inflict damage to your opponent equal to this card's original attack. Red Eyes Arc Fiend of Lightning was a level 6 Dark Fiend Gemini. That Gemini effect lets you destroy all monsters whose defense is less than this card's attack. The deck also gained a great starter in Blackstone of Legend, a level 1 Dark Dragon monster that you can tribute to special summon a level 7 or lower Red Eyes monster from your deck. If it's in your graveyard, you can return a level 7 or lower Red Eyes monster from your graveyard to your deck to add this card back to your hand. Finally, to round out the main deck, Black Metal Dragon was a level 1 Dark Dragon that allows you to equip it to a Red Eyes monster to give it 500 attack. And when it's sent to the graveyard, you get to add any Red Eyes card from your deck to your hand. Two new extra deck monsters rounded off the monster lineup. Red Eyes Flare Metal Dragon was a rank 7 Dark Xyz monster. Card effects can't destroy it while it had Xyz material, and as long as it had materials, it burned your opponent for 500 damage every time your opponent activated a card or effect. It also had a quick effect that allowed you to special summon a Red Eyes normal monster from your graveyard. This card was the strongest from the Red Eyes archetype, as it continued to see play outside of the archetype due to its generic level 7 requirement. Red Eyes Flare Metal Dragon couldn't be easily removed from the field and punish your opponent for playing the game. It was a staple for any deck that can make rank 7 Xyz monsters. This card remained the dominant and go-to boss monster for the deck. The second boss monster introduced in Clash of Rebellions was Arcfiend Black Skull Dragon, a retrain of the original Black Skull Dragon. Its fusion requirements were a level 6 normal Arcfiend monster, plus a Red Eyes normal monster. It came out at a whopping 3200 attack. Your opponent couldn't activate any cards and effects until the end of the damage that when it battled, and when damage calculation was performed with it, during the end of the battle phase, you could target one Red Eyes normal monster in your graveyard, inflict damage upon equal to the target monster's original attack, then shovel that monster back into your deck. The primary way you would bring out this card was with a very well-known card called Red Eyes Fusion, a spell card that allows you to fusion some with materials from your hand field or deck. The monster fusion summoned by this card is treated as a Red Eyes Black Dragon. However, when using Red Eyes Fusion, you couldn't normal summon or special summon the turn you activated this card, making it hard to establish any other monsters outside of Arcfiend Black Skull Dragon. Black Skull Dragon also came with its own issues, as its fusion requirements weren't as easy as shown. Though Red Eyes Arcfiend of Lightning fit the bill of being a level 6 Arcfiend monster, it was a Gemini monster. Though it can be treated as a normal monster, it can only be treated as one in the field or in the graveyard, making it a problem to play Red Eyes Fusion, since it couldn't be dropped from the deck as a normal monster. So your turn would be spent getting Red Eyes Arcfiend of Lightning to the field and not being able to use Red Eyes Fusion due to the restriction of Red Eyes Fusion. In some cases, Arcfiend of Lightning would be dropped entirely for just the original Summon Skull, as it was a normal level 6 Arcfiend monster. But even that was a brick, as it didn't have any relation to the archetype and wasn't a Red Eyes monster. Needless to say, the fusion aspect of Red Eyes was dropped from the more reasonable Xyz build at the time, as Red Eyes Flare Metal Dragon was the better of the two. The main deck monsters also had slight problems. Blackstone of Legends' effects were solid, but it had the clause of you only being able to use its effect once per turn, and only once. So either you can recover it from the graveyard, or use it to special summon a Red Eyes monster from your deck. People would try to make up for this flaw by using cards that bring out level 1 monsters for free and prevent them from sporadically using Blackstone of Legends' effect such as the effects of Kin Kabyo or One for One. The archetype did get some draw support to help filter. Cards of Red Stone allowed you to send a Red Eyes monster to the graveyard to draw two cards, then send a level 7 Red Eyes to the graveyard. However, the card was a hard once per turn. It was decent to draw support, as you wanted to get Red Eyes cards to the graveyard to bring them out later via Red Eyes Flare Metal Dragon. They even got their own version of Call of the Haunted in Return of the Red Eyes. It continues trap card that you special summon one normal monster from your graveyard if you control a Red Eyes monster per turn. If this card is destroyed in your possession by your opponent and sent to the graveyard, you can then special summon a Red Eyes monster from your graveyard. 
Combined with Flare Metal Dragon, this card could give you two Red Eyes monsters to work with for your next turn, whether for XCs or Fusion Plays. This series of support for Red Eyes had potential. Its XC monster was a legit threat in the meta, and most of the support was dark, so cards like Allure Darkness and Dark Arm Dragon were viable options to splash in the deck. Also, Dragon Ravine and Silver's Cry played a part in the deck, as Dragon Ravine helps set up your graveyard and Silver's Cry can get your Red Eyes Black Dragon or Red Eyes Flare Dragon quicker than cards like Red Eyes Spirit or Return of the Red Eyes. Even most of the monsters being level 7 helped the deck, as the game had powerful rank 7 XCs you could play, like Mecha Phantom Beast Draco Sack and number 11 Big Eye. However, as stated before, the fusion aspect of the deck was just too slow. Red Eyes Fusion's restriction gave you no advantage outside of making a monster with high attack, and the fusion was barely makeable due to how Red Eyes archetype was built. The deck mostly saw casual play, but didn't impact the meta like its counterpart, the Blue Eyes, did. There would be no new support for Red Eyes until the release of the TCG set, Breakers of Shadow. And there, Red Eyes got a new support card in Red Eyes Retro Dragon. If a level 7 or lower Red Eyes monster is destroyed by your opponent via battle or card effect, you could special summon this card and special summon as many of those destroyed Red Eyes monsters as possible. It could also be tributed to give you another normal summon for Red Eyes monster in addition to your normal summoner set. As great as this card's upside was, it was restricted to only bringing back level 7 or lower Red Eyes monsters. You couldn't apply to use with cards like Red Eyes Darkness Metal Dragon or most of the Red Eyes Fusion monsters. Other methods would also easily work around it, as cards like can banish or bounce cards to the hand would not trigger Red Eyes Retro Dragon. The card gave mixed results and would see on and off play. The next arrival support came in Invasion of Vengeance. Meteor Black Comet Dragon was a level 8 Dark Dragon Fusion, needing level 7 Dragon Monster and a level 6 Dragon Monster. It has 3500 attack and has the effect that on being Fusion Summon, you get to send a Red Eyes Monster from your hand deck to the graveyard, and then burn your opponent for half that monster's attack. It also lets you special summon a normal monster from your graveyard when it's sent to the monster zone to the graveyard. If you're wondering where to get that level 6 dragon from, look no further as Konami had that in mind and printed Meteor Dragon Red Eyes Impact, a level 6 dragon Gemini that a normal summon prevents all of your other Red Eyes monsters from being destroyed by battle or card effects. Both these cards were pleasant additions at the time, as Meteor Black Comet Dragon had an easier summon condition than Arcfiend Black Skull Dragon. It did immediate burn damage and floated into a normal monster when it left the field. The release of this card made it easier for people to play Red Eyes Fusion, as now they had fusions that would benefit them if they went first and had no other plays. This card helped the deck until the new Master Rule 4 completely made it impossible to play this card in the Monster Zone due to the introduction of Lynx, and reduced the impact of the card's burn effect. One more card in this set attempted to improve that. Red Eyes Insight is a normal spell that lets you send a Red Eyes monster from your hand or deck to the graveyard to grab a Red Eyes Spell or Trap from your deck to your hand. Having a card that can get Red Eyes Spell and Trap cards to your hand and dumping Red Eyes to the graveyard was a great addition to the deck. The issue was that the options of spells and traps available outside of Red Eyes Fusion were lackluster. Red Eyes Insight didn't have great targets to pick, as only Red Eyes Fusion saw consistent play outside of the bulk of spell and trap cards. The support for the archetype was not done, as more was brought out during the release of the TCG pack, Legendary Duelist. Three new monsters and one new trap were introduced. Red Eyes Baby Dragon was a level 3 dark dragon that, when it's destroyed by battle, you can special summon a level 7 or lower Red Eyes monster and equip with this card. When it's sent to the graveyard while equipped, you can add a level 1 dragon monster from your deck to your hand. The card had many good features and had so much search power, but the underlying issue was that it needed to be destroyed by battle. And in 2017, there were so many other ways to destroy monsters besides battling. So either you'd have to ram this card into one of your opponent's monsters to get its effect off, or watch it be removed by a spell, trap, or monster effect and get nothing in return. Gearfreed the Red Eyes Iron Knight was a level 4 Dark Warrior monster that, once per turn, when any player would place an equip card to this monster, you can destroy the equip card to destroy one spell, trap card your opponent controls. You can also send an equip card to the graveyard to target and special summon a level 7 or lower Red Eyes monster from your graveyard. As impressive as this effect was, the card wasn't utilized for its effect, but more so for the archetype's newest boss monster. Red Eyes Slash Dragon was a level 7 Dark Dragon Fusion monster. It had 200 attack, and whenever a Red Eyes monster declares an attack, you can target a warrior type monster in your graveyard and equip it to this card as an equipped spell card that gives it 200 attack. If your opponent activates a card or effect that targets a card you control, you can send an equip card to the graveyard to negate the effect and destroy it. If this card was destroyed, you could dispel summon as many monsters as possible from your graveyard that we equip to this card. This card gave Red Eyes a negation and a card that established board control. Another card would help this new board control version of Red Eyes, as Red Eyes with Chain was also introduced in Legendary Duelist. It was a trap card you could equip to your Red Eyes monster. It allowed you to make up to two attacks on monsters, and you could send this card to the graveyard, target one effect monster, and equip that monster to this monster that the card was equipped to. The monster that had the card equipped by this effect had its attack and defense equal to the monsters equipped. These cards were superb support for the deck. Red Eyes Slash Dragon made it slightly less horrible running fusions in the deck. Red Eyes with Chain gave Red Eyes Insight another card to search out outside of Red Eyes Fusion and helped both give Red Eyes the menacing board control it needed. Red Eyes gained another card in 2019, and Red Eyes Alternative Black Dragon. 
This card could be special summoned by tributing a Red Eyes monster on the field or hand, and also lets you bring back a level 7 or lower Red Eyes monster from your graveyard when destroyed by a battle or an opponent's card effect. This card was supposed to be what Blue Eyes' alternative dragon is to Blue Eyes, yet the card's upside was abysmal compared to, well, alternative. Blue Eyes' alternative could be treated as Blue Eyes' white dragon on the field or in the graveyard, while Red Eyes' alternative dragon wasn't treated as a Red Eyes' black dragon. Also, Blue Eyes' alternative would destroy monster opponent controls on their field, while Red Eyes' alternative had to be destroyed to get the upside. The only benefit of Red Eyes' alternative was being an extender for your rank 7 plays or link gimmicks. Regardless, Red Eyes had plenty of steam at this time. Dragon support was plentiful, with Return of the Dragon Lords and Dragon Ravine at their disposal, and was versatile as it could either be an FDK deck with Meteor Black Comet Dragon combined with Infernal Fire Blast, or become a link deck due to the axis of number 42 Galaxy Tomahawk, which could produce tokens for you to be able to make a link monsters. However, both still had inconsistencies. The FTK variant was too gimmicky, and you would need to see Infernal Fire Blast having no way to search it, while the Link variant still couldn't establish its board quickly like other decks and was still plagued by the haunting undertone of your board just ending on a fusion between Meteor Black Comet Dragon or Red Eye Slash Dragon. The deck would then need to be phased out due to number 42 seeing the ban list, ultimately ending the Red Eye's Link variant, and the deck struggled throughout the Master Rule 4 era. When Master Rule 5 came out, the deck was in the same place. It did become a splashable engine in most Dragon Link decks with the release of the archetypes like Guard Dragon and Rockets. Dragon Link, however, utilized just Red Eyes Darkness Metal Dragon and Black Metal Dragon, as Darkness Metal was one of the best extenders in the game. Black Metal could be easily linked off for a Link 1 monster and search for Darkness Metal Dragon. However, in July of 2020, Red Eyes Darkness Metal Dragon would get an errata, making it a hard once per turn instead of a soft once per turn due to how good the card had been since its creation and the countless loops Dragon based decks could abuse with it. At this point, the archetype was bound to be written off as nostalgia bait until a particular release from 2020's Tin of Lost Memories gave Red Eyes the most powerful card in its archetype, and one of the most powerful cards in the game. That card would be Red Eyes Dark Dragoon, a level 8 dark spellcaster fusion that needed one Dark Magician and one Red Eyes Black Dragon or Dragon Effect Monsters and Materials. The card was dominant. Card effects couldn't destroy it, it popped monsters in the field and burned your opponent, you could also use the effect multiple times based on how many normal monsters used for its fusion summon, and it could negate your opponent's cards or effects once per turn by discarding a card. Then it would gain 1000 attack permanently. This card was everything Red Eyes needed to be a contender. It had all the aspects of what Red Eyes decks needed in one card. Red Eyes Dragoon was all it took to make Red Eyes relevant, except it didn't. You see, Red Eyes Dark Dragoon was such a great card with easy requirements that any deck that could splash it as an engine could make it. There were even cases of this card having a deck specifically built just for making this card. Dex would splash in Red Eyes Fusion to play the card and would use it by using Predaplant Verte Anaconda. This Link monster could send any fusion spell card or polymerization normal or quick play spell card from your deck to the graveyard to make its effect become the sent spell card. This card allowed you to bypass Red Eyes Fusion restrictions of being unable to normal or special summon for the rest of the turn. Players could establish a board, then go into Verte Anaconda to play Red Eyes Dark Dragoon. There was no need to play a Red Eyes deck when you could just play this card alone. Red Eyes was once again relegated back to being redundant. So ends the story of Red Eyes Black Dragon. Then 2023 happened, and we randomly got more Red Eyes support in Maze of Memories. Red Eyes Soul was a level 7 Dark Dragon. Unlike Red Eyes Alternative Dragon, it could be treated as Red Eyes Black Dragon on the field or in the graveyard. Whenever your opponent spells summons a monster, you can send this card from your field or hand to the graveyard to spell summon a Red Eyes monster from your hand or deck. It also lets you target Red Eyes Black Dragon and inflict burn damage equal to the Red Eyes Black Dragon's original attack once per duel. Though it's new Red Eyes support, it wasn't good support as the card special summons monsters on your opponent's turn, which gives no value to main deck Red Eyes monsters due to them not having any effects that happen during your opponent's turn. The burn damage occurred once per duel isn't game changing either. This card barely warrants any copies being run in the deck. So far, the final support piece was Red Eyes Black Meteor Dragon, which was revealed in Duelist Nexus. This level 6 Dark Dragon monster lets you drop a Red Eyes monster from your hand or graveyard to special summon it. And if you do, you increase its level by 1. During your turn, except the turn this card was sent to the graveyard, you can banish it to add a Red Eyes Fusion from your deck to your hand. Another solid extender in Surge of a Red Eyes that hasn't been said about the rest. These two cards finally round out the Red Eyes archetype on what has become the story of Red Eyes Black Dragon via lore and in real life. This deck is stuck on potentially being good. The Red Eyes cards are often clunky, and the execution of their combos leads to pitiful boards, or if anything, just a fusion monster. The best cards, Red Eyes Dragoon, Red Eyes Insight, Red Eyes Darkest Metal Dragon, and Red Eyes Fusion, all see better play outside of their respective decks, being splashable engines and extenders. This fan favorite archetype has seen better days. It may be fun for people who love nostalgia, but one thing is certain. This deck was made around a card whose lore was based on its potential. It lived by its sword and died by it, and joins many other archetypes of what could have been a successful deck.